Introduction to Revolt in the Desert This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence Introduction Arabs could be swung on an idea as on a cord, for the unpledged allegiance of their minds made them obedient servants. None of them would escape the bond till success had come, and with it responsibility and duty and engagements. Then the idea was gone and the work ended in ruins. Without a creed, they could be taken to the four corners of the world, but not to heaven, by being shown the riches of earth and the pleasures of it. But if on the road, led in this fashion, they met the prophet of an idea, who had nowhere to lay his head and who depended for his food on charity or birds, then they would all leave their wealth for his inspiration. They were incorrigibly children of the idea, feckless and colorblind, to whom body and spirit were forever and inevitably opposed. Their mind was strange and dark, full of depressions and exaltations, lacking in rule, but with more of ardor and more fertile in belief than any other in the world. They were a people of starts, for whom the abstract was the strongest motive, the process of infinite courage and variety, and the end nothing. They were as unstable as water, and like water would perhaps finally prevail, since the dawn of life, in successive waves they had been dashing themselves against the coasts of flesh. Each wave was broken, but like the sea wore away ever so little of the granite on which it failed, and some day, ages yet, might roll unchecked over the place where the material world had been, and God would move upon the face of those waters. One such wave, and not the least, I raised and rolled before the breath of an idea, till it reached its crest and toppled over and fell at Damascus. The wash of that wave, thrown back by the resistance of vested things, will provide the matter of the following wave, when in fullness of time the sea shall be raised once more. The strange and still mysterious figure of T. E. Lawrence has become, if not the best known, certainly one of the most famous in all the small gallery of true heroes of the war. An unimpressive, rather studious young man of twenty-six, he was rejected in the opening days of the war as physically unfit for military service. The authorities who rejected him can be forgiven, for not even Lawrence himself had guessed that he added to the unusual combination of archaeologist, philosopher, diplomat, and student of military affairs the genius of a surpassing leader of irregular cavalry. After his failure to enlist, his knowledge of Arabic and the Arabian peoples brought him a commission as a subaltern in the intelligence service of the British command at Cairo. For his subsequent single-handed organization and leadership of the Arab revolt, through two years of bitter and weird adventure, in an atmosphere of incredible romance and under a veil of profound secrecy, the authorities were not to blame. It was his own masterpiece, and it was one of the miracles of the war. In 1914, T. E. Lawrence was serving as a more or less unnoticed assistant in the British Museum's excavation of Karakamesh on the Euphrates. Under the appearance of a brilliant and somewhat eccentric student of archaeology, he concealed a lively initiative, a sympathetic understanding of the country, and a relationship to more than one soldier prominent in British history, including, it is supposed, a Sir Robert Lawrence, who fought as a crusader under Richard Coeur de Lyon. Casual travelers found him unobtrusively digging Hittite remains out of the banks of the Euphrates. He left them reassured by his tactfulness with the Arab laborers as to the future of the British Empire. He knew the Near East intimately. His first direct knowledge of the complicated peoples of Arabia had been gained while he was still an undergraduate at Oxford, when he is said to have undertaken alone and in native dress a two-year expedition among the tribes behind Syria in order to gather material for his thesis on the military history of the Crusades. Such experience placed him obviously in the direct line of those remarkable British Orientalists like Doughty and Burton, who have done so much to enrich British letters. It could hardly have been anticipated 
that it was preparing him for the very different and more romantic achievements in reckless leadership and masterful strategy, which are described in these pages. Lawrence was not the author of the revolt. His was the more difficult and also more dangerous task of being its inspiration. A subaltern officer with no respect for his superiors, with a sensitive and vigorous mind, undisturbed either by military regulations or a desire for glory, and with a scholarly taste in reading. He was clearly an unexpected figure among the soldiery and camp followers at Cairo. Since then, he has allowed very little to be known of himself. After his triumph in Syria, the famous guerrilla leader, who nevertheless remained an ethnological expert, served in the British peace delegation at Versailles, and was later a member of a special commission on Near Eastern affairs headed by the colonial secretary. But an almost passionate dislike of notoriety and a seemingly deliberate eccentricity have continued to conceal his character, and he is now, February 1927, actually serving as a private soldier in the British Army, while the mists of a gathering legend have cloaked him in the obscurity of an almost mythological hero. However, in 1919, he wrote out in a 400,000-word book the whole bitter account of his adventure and of his disappointment over the conclusion which the peace conference seemed to put to it. He left the book, together with some of his notes and many photographs, in a handbag in the Reading Railway Station. A few minutes later, it had disappeared. There was a flurry of rumor to the effect that it had been stolen by high authorities. Subsequently, it has seemed more likely that the bag was taken by a casual sneak thief. But Lawrence, at any rate, sat down with an heroic effort of memory to rewrite the account. He never intended it, however, for publication. He had it printed on a newspaper press in Oxford, in an edition limited characteristically to eight copies, of which three, in what seems almost an excess of reticence, were afterward destroyed. Of all the honors that an astonished government tried to force upon him, the wartime rank of lieutenant colonel was the only one which he accepted, and that largely because of the necessity for maintaining his status with the Arabs. The latter called him simply al Orens, or else by the more picturesque title of Wrecker of Engines. The titles which the newspapers afterwards invented only annoyed him, and not long ago, the astonishing discovery was made that he had enlisted under an assumed name in the Royal Air Force, presumably to avoid attention. There was, of course, another wave of notoriety, and it is understood that he is now occupying the even less explicable position of a private in the tank corps. The rewritten book, with which Lawrence himself was never quite satisfied, was a purely personal record. His impregnable reticence was, however, broken down to the extent of allowing a lengthy abridgment for publication by a friendly man of letters. The book in its present form opens abruptly with Lawrence's arrival with the Arabian armies. Long after he had taken up, along with others of the more brilliant younger men in the intelligence service at Cairo, the enthusiastic advocacy of the Arabian revolt. At the very outset of the war, British diplomacy had remembered the unrest among the Arab-speaking populations of Turkey and its possible value in the defense of the Suez Canal. A revolutionary movement, fostered both by powerful secret societies and the repressive measures of the Turks, had been growing ever since the Young Turk Revolution of 1908. It included many high civil and military officers of the Turkish government, while a third of the Turkish army was Arabic-speaking and consequently disaffected. Even before Turkey declared war, Sir Henry McMahon, the representative of British civil power in Egypt, had written to Hussein, the Grand Sharif of Mecca, to promise British support for the independence of the Arabs. The secret societies did not agree that the Allies' cause against the Central Powers was identical with the Arabs' cause against Turkey. Many of their members were still loyally commanding Turkish troops at the end of the war, and a doubt among the Arabs as to the disinterestedness of the British explains many of Lawrence's later difficulties. The Arabs, however, did plan a revolution on their own account, under the banner of Hussein and his four sons, but it came to nothing. Meanwhile, Lawrence had taken up his modest duties in the intelligence service at Cairo. I had been many years, he has said, going up and down the Semitic East before the war, learning the manners of the villagers and tribesmen and citizens of Syria and Mesopotamia. My poverty had constrained me to mix with the humbler classes, though seldom met by European travelers, 
and thus my experiences gave me an unusual angle of view, which enabled me to understand and think for the ignorant many as well as for the more enlightened whose rare opinions mattered, not so much for the day as for the morrow. In addition, I had seen something of the political forces working in the minds of the Middle East, and especially had noted everywhere sure signs of the decay of imperial Turkey. There were other archaeologists, orientalists, and younger experts of the political service, who, although wearing the unfamiliar uniforms of the army and navy, believed in the Arabian revolt as much for the sake of the Arabs as for the sake of the Allies. Lawrence was united with them in their interest in Sir Henry McMahon's correspondence with Hussein, although the more orthodox minds among the military found it difficult to understand such unconventional methods of warfare. As Lawrence adds, We called ourselves intrusive as a band, for we meant to break into the accepted halls of English foreign policy and build a new people in the East, despite the rails laid down for us by our ancestors. Therefore, from our hybrid intelligence office in Cairo, a jangling place, which for its incessant bells and bustle and running to and fro was likened by Aubrey Herbert to an oriental railway station, we began to work upon all our chiefs, far and near. It is a process of which chiefs seldom approve, but Sir Henry continued both his correspondence and his promises. The long agony of the Dardanelles was played out and ended. The British came to disaster at Kut el Amara, and the Turks were as close across the Suez Canal as ever. But in the summer of 1916, Sir Henry triumphed, and at the beginning of June, Hussein proclaimed the revolt of the Arab people, with British money and support. Both Jeddah and Mecca fell in the first rush of the Sharifian armies. But Faisal's attack upon Medina, the Turkish strong point at the end of the Hejaz railway, failed, and the revolt began to go rather precariously astray amid the simplicities of Arab patriotism and the complex departmental and international jealousies at Cairo. The military authorities still seemed incapable of grasping the value of a war started by the civilians, and a staff perturbed by the eccentric brilliancy of an intelligence service made up of experts began to show tendencies towards suppressing them. Sir Henry was recalled to England, and the Sharifian forces, led by Hussein's son Faisal and his three brothers, Ali, Abdullah, and Zaid got neither the supplies nor the advice which they needed. Lawrence, he was only 28 years old, had never regarded himself as a soldier. He liked his work of making maps and running a secret Arab newspaper, and he felt it meanness in him to pretend to be a man of action. Yet his Arab revolt was in serious difficulties. The Turks had sent out a formal attacking column from Medina, and the Arab levies were in danger of being jammed by the inapplicable principles of orthodox war, into the area around Mecca, instead of using their dash and mobility in the irregular combat for which they were supremely fitted. Meanwhile, Lawrence found himself in danger of being politely eliminated as an upstart, while other men ruined the plans for which he was largely responsible. His reply was first to make himself as obnoxious as possible to his military superiors, and then to ask for leave. It was granted with alacrity, in the hope that he could be gently put out of the way on his return. But he did not intend to be put out of the way. He boarded a naval vessel on the way down the Red Sea, ostensibly as a joyride with Sir Ronald Storrs, another of the intrusives who was making an official trip to Jeddah. He was without authority or passes, and Faisal, the principal commander, was in the interior from which as a Christian he was debarred by order but it was his precocious intention to see what he, a staff captain on leave, could do for the confused armies of Arabia. Storrs and I then marched off together happily. In the east, they swore that by three sides was the decent way across a square, and my trick to escape was in this sense oriental. But I justified myself by my confidence in the final success of the Arab revolt, if properly advised. I had been a mover in its beginning. My hopes lay in it. The fatalistic subordination of a professional soldier, intrigue being unknown in the British Army, would have made a proper officer sit down and watch his plan of campaign wrecked by men who thought nothing of it, and to whose spirit it made no appeal. Non novus domini. Forward. This book, written in 1919, was printed on a newspaper press in Oxford shortly after, not for publication, 
but as a convenience to myself and friends. Some of them asked for copies of their own, and from that demand gradually grew the idea of a richly produced edition, with many portrait drawings, to be published by subscription at a stiff price. The stiff price, though it covered the cost of printing, was not stiff enough to pay the artist adequately. Some of the richer artists agreed to work for nominal fees, and I raised money to pay the others by selling to Jonathan Cape the right to bring out this abridgment. It amounts to less than half of the original text, which occupied the reading hours of my friends for months. But half a calamity is better than a whole one, and this fairly represents all sides of the story. If I am asked why I have abridged an unsatisfactory book, instead of recasting it as a history. I must plead that to do so nice a job in the barracks which have been my home since 1922 would need a degree of concentration amounting in an airman to moroseness and an interest in the subject which was exhausted long ago in the actual experience of it. T.E.L. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 1 Stores Goes to Jidda. When at last we anchored in Jidda's outer harbor, off the white town hung between the blazing sky and its reflection in the mirage which swept and rolled over the wide lagoon. Then the heat of Arabia came out like a drawn sword and struck us speechless. It was a midday of October of 1916, and the noon sun had like moonlight put to sleep the colors. There were only lights and shadows, the white houses and black gaps of streets. In front, the pallid luster of the haze shimmering upon the inner harbor Behind, the dazzle of league after league of featureless sand, running up to an edge of low hills, faintly suggested in the faraway mist of heat. Just north of Jidda was a second group of black-white buildings, moving up and down like pistons in the mirage, as the ship rolled at anchor and the intermittent wind shifted the heat waves in the air. Colonel Wilson, British representative with the new Arab state, had sent his launch to meet us, and we had to go ashore to learn the reality of the men levitating in that mirage. We walked past the white masonry of the still-building water gate and through the oppressive alley of the food market on our way to the consulate. In the air, from the men to the dates and back to the meat, squadrons of flies like particles of dust danced up and down the sun shafts which stabbed into the darkest corners of the booths, through torn places in the wood and sackcloth awnings overhead. The atmosphere was like a bath. We reached the consulate, and there in a shaded room with an open lattice behind him sat Wilson, prepared to welcome the sea breeze, which had lagged these last few days. He told us that Sharif Abdullah, second son of Hussein, Grand Sharif of Mecca, was just then entering the town. Ronald Storrs and myself had come down the Red Sea from Cairo to meet Abdullah, it was auspicious that we had arrived together. For Mecca, the Sharifian capital, was inaccessible to Christians, and such business as stores could not well be transacted by telephone. My presence must be put down to joyriding. But stores, Oriental secretary to the residency in Cairo, was the confidential assistant of Sir Henry McMahon in all the delicate negotiations with the Sharif of Mecca. The happy union of his local knowledge with the experience and acumen of Sir Henry, and the sympathy of Clayton, so impressed the Sharif that that very difficult person accepted their guarded undertakings as sufficient assurance for beginning his revolt against Turkey, and kept faith with the British authorities throughout a war history which teemed with doubtful and hazardous situations. Sir Henry was England's right-hand man in the Middle East till the Arab revolt was an established event. Sir Mark Sykes was the left hand, and if the Foreign Office had kept itself and its hands mutually informed, our reputation for honesty would not have suffered as it did. Abdullah, on a white mare, came to us softly, with a bevy of richly armed slaves on foot about him, 
through the silent, respectful salutes of the town. He was flushed with his success at Taif and happy. I was seeing him for the first time, while Storrs was an old friend and on the best of terms. Yet before long, as they spoke together, I began to suspect him of a constant cheerfulness. His eyes had a confirmed twinkle, and though only thirty-five, he was putting on flesh. It might be due to too much laughter. He jested with all comers in most easy fashion. Yet when we fell into serious talk, the veil of humor seemed to fade away as he chose his words and argued shrewdly. Of course, he was in discussion with stores who demanded a high standard from his opponent. I was playing for effect, watching, criticizing him. The Sharif's rebellion had been unsatisfactory for the last few months. Standing still, which, with an irregular war, was the prelude to disaster. And my suspicion was that its lack was leadership. Not intellect, nor judgment, nor political wisdom, but the flame of enthusiasm that would set the desert on fire. My visit was mainly to find the yet unknown master spirit of the affair, and measure his capacity to carry the revolt to the goal I had conceived for it. As our conversation continued, I became more and more sure that Abdullah was too balanced, too cool, too humorous to be a prophet, especially the armed prophet who, if history be true, succeeded in revolutions. His value would come perhaps in the peace after success. Storrs brought me into the discussion by asking his views on the state of the campaign. Abdullah at once grew serious and said that he wanted to urge upon the British their immediate and very personal concern in the matter, which he tabulated so. By our neglect to cut the Hejaz railway, the Turks had been able to collect transport and supplies for the reinforcement of Medina. Faisal had been driven back from the town, and the enemy was preparing a mobile column of all arms for an advance on Rabeg. The Arabs in the hills across their road were by our neglect too weak in supplies, machine guns, and artillery to defend them long. Hussein Mabereg, chief of the Rabeg Harb, had joined the Turks. If the Medina column advanced, the Harb would join it. It would only remain for his father to put himself at the head of his own people of Mecca and to die fighting before the holy city. At this moment the telephone rang. The Grand Sharif wanted to speak to Abdullah. He was told of the point our conversation had reached, and at once confirmed that he would so act in the extremity. The Turks would enter Mecca over his dead body. The telephone rang off, and Abdullah, smiling a little, asked, to prevent such a disaster, that a British brigade, if possible of Muslim troops, be kept at Suez, with transport to Russia to Rabeg as soon as the Turks debouched from Medina in their attack. What did we think of the proposal? I said that I would represent his views to Egypt, but that the British were reluctant to spare troops from the vital defense of Egypt, though he was not to imagine that the canal was in any danger from the Turks. And still more, to send Christians to defend the people of the holy city against their enemies. As some Muslims in India, who considered the Turkish government had an imprescriptible right to the Haramean, would misrepresent our motives and action. I thought that I might perhaps urge his opinions more powerfully, if I was able to report on the Rabeg question in the light of my own knowledge of the position and local feeling. I would also like to see Faisal, and to talk over with him his needs and the prospects of a prolonged defense of his hills by the tribesmen, if we strengthen them materially. I would like to ride from Rabeg up the Sultani Road toward Medina as far as Faisal's camp. Stores then came in and supported me with all his might, urging the vital importance of full and early information from a trained observer for the British commander-in-chief in Egypt. Abdullah went to the telephone and tried to get his father's consent to my going up country. The Sharif viewed the proposal with grave distrust. Abdullah argued the point, made some advantage, and transferred the mouthpiece to Storrs, who turned all his diplomacy on the old man. Storrs in full blast was a delight to listen to in the mere matter of Arabic speech, and also a lesson to every Englishman alive of how to deal with suspicious or unwilling Orientals. It was nearly impossible to resist him for more than a few minutes, and in this case also he had his way. The Sharif asked again for Abdullah, and authorized him to write to Ali, and suggest that if he thought fit, and if conditions were normal, I might be allowed to visit Faisal. 
and Abdullah, under Storr's influence, transformed this guarded message into direct written instructions to Ali to mount me as well and as quickly as possible, and convey me by sure hand to Faisal's camp. This being all I wanted and half what Storr's wanted, we adjourned for lunch. Jeddah had pleased us on our way to the consulate. So after lunch, when it was a little cooler, or at least when the sun was not so high, we wandered out to see the sights under the guidance of Young, Wilson's assistant, a man who found good in many old things, but little good in things now being made. It was indeed a remarkable town. The streets were alleys, wood-roofed in the main bazaar, but elsewhere open to the sky in the little gap between the tops of the lofty white-walled houses. These were built four or five stories high, of coral rag tied with square beams and decorated by wide bow windows running from ground to roof in grey wooden panels. There was no glass in Jeddah, but a profusion of good lattices and some very delicate shallow chiseling on the panels of window casings. The doors were heavy two-leaf slabs of teak wood, deeply carved, often with wickets in them, and they had rich hinges and ring knockers of hammered iron. There was much molded or cut plastering, and on the older houses, fine stone heads and jams to the windows looking on the inner courts. The style of architecture was like crazy Elizabethan half-timber work, in the elaborate Cheshire fashion, but gone gimcrack to an incredible degree. House fronts were fretted, pierced, and pargeted till they looked as though cut out of cardboard for romantic stage setting. Every story jutted, every window leaned one way or other, often the very walls sloped. It was like a dead city, so clean underfoot and so quiet. Its winding, even streets were floored with damp sand solidified by time and as silent to the tread as any carpet. The lattices and wall returns deadened all reverberation of voice. There were no carts, nor any streets wide enough for carts, no shod animals, no bustle anywhere. Everything was hushed, strained, even furtive. The doors of houses shut softly as we passed. There were no loud dogs, no crying children. Indeed, except in the bazaar, still half asleep, there were few wayfarers of any kind. And the rare people we did meet, all thin and as it were wasted by disease, with scarred, hairless faces and screwed up eyes, slipped past us quickly and cautiously, not looking at us. Their skimp white robes, shaven poles with little skull caps, red cotton shoulder shawls and bare feet were so same as to be almost a uniform. The atmosphere was oppressive, deadly. There seemed no life in it. It was not burning hot, but held a moisture and sense of great age and exhaustion, such as seemed to belong to no other place. Not a passion of smells like Smyrna, Naples, or Marseille, but a feeling of long use, of the exhalations of many people, of continued bath heat and sweat. One would say that for years Jidda had not been swept through by a firm breeze, that its streets kept their air from year's end to year's end, from the day they were built for so long as the houses should endure. There was nothing in the bazaars to buy. In the evening, the telephone rang, and the Sharif called stores to the instrument. He asked if we would not like to listen to his band. Stores, in astonishment, asked what band, and congratulated His Holiness on having advanced so far towards urbanity. The Sharif explained that the headquarters of the Hejaz command under the Turks had had a brass band, which played each night to the governor-general. And when the governor-general was captured by Abdullah at Taif, his band was captured with him. The other prisoners were sent to Egypt for internment, but the band was accepted. It was held in Mecca to give music to the victors. Sharif Hussein laid his receiver on the table of his reception hall, and we called solemnly one by one to the telephone, heard the band in the palace of Mecca, 45 miles away. Stores expressed the general gratification, and the Sharif, increasing his bounty, replied that the band should be sent down by forced march to Jeddah to play in our courtyard also. And, said he, you may then do me the pleasure of ringing me up from your end, that I may share your satisfaction. Next day, Stores visited Abdullah in his tent out by Eve's tomb and together they inspected the hospital, the barracks, the town offices, 
and partook of the hospitality of the mayor and the governor. In the intervals of duty they talked about money, and the Sharif's title, and his relations with the other princes of Arabia, and the general course of the war. All the commonplaces that should pass between envoys of two governments. It was tedious, and for the most part I held myself excused, as I had made up my mind that Abdullah was not the necessary leader. The company of Sharif Shakir, Abdullah's cousin and best friend, proved more exciting. Shakir, a grandee of Taif, had been playmate from boyhood of the Sharif's sons, and he played yet, publicly and privately, in the enormous fashion which his wealth and courage and self-confidence united to make possible. Never before had I met so sudden a man, passing instantly from a frozen dignity to a whirlwind of jesting life, strident, intense, athletic, magnificent. His face, eaten away by smallpox so that hardly a hair root remained, mirrored like the window of a speeding car at once what passed without and within it. Abdullah had commanded at the siege of Taif, but it was Shakir who led the troops with a headlong dash that defeated his own purpose by excess of danger. The Arabs dared not support him into the very breach of the wall, and Shakir had to return, alone and unscathed, cursing his fellows, laughing at them, and jeering wildly at the discomfited enemy, whose revenge was to pour petrol over his great house and burn it, with its famous library of Arabic manuscripts. That evening, Abdullah came to dine with Colonel Wilson. We received him in the courtyard on the house steps. Behind him were his brilliant household servants and slaves, and behind them a pale crew of bearded, emaciated men with woebegone faces, wearing tatters of military uniform and carrying tarnished brass instruments of music. Abdullah waved his hand towards them and crowed with delight, My band! We sat them on benches in the forecourt, and Wilson sent them cigarettes while we went up to the dining room where the shuttered balcony was open right out, hungrily for a sea breeze. As we sat down, the band under the guns and swords of Abdullah's retainers began, each instrument apart, to play heartbroken Turkish airs. Our ears ached with noise, but Abdullah beamed. We got tired of Turkish music and asked for German. An aide-de-camp stepped out on the balcony and called down to the bandsmen in Turkish to play us something foreign. They struck shakily into Deutschland über alles, just as the Sharif came to his telephone in Mecca to listen to the music of our feast. We asked for more German music, and they played Ein Festeburg. Then, in the midst, they died away into flabby discords of drums. The parchment had stretched in the damp air of Jidda. They cried for fire, and Wilson's servants and Abdullah's bodyguard brought them piles of straw and packing cases. They warmed the drums, turning them round and round before the blaze, and then broke into what they said was the hymn of hate, though no one could recognize a European progression in it all. Someone turned to Abdullah and said, It is a death march. Abdullah's eyes widened, but stores who spoke in quickly to the rescue turned the moment to laughter, and we sent out rewards with the leavings of the feast to the sorrowful musicians, who could take no pleasure in our praises, but begged to be sent home. End of Chapter 1Chapter 2 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 2 Riding Up to Faisal. Next morning, I left Jidda by ship for Rabig, the headquarters of Sharif Ali, Abdullah's elder brother. When Ali received his father's order to send me at once up to Faisal, he was staggered, but could not help himself. So he prepared for me his own splendid riding camel, saddled with his own saddle, and hung with luxurious housings and cushions of nejid leatherwork, pieced and inlaid in various colors, with plated fringes and nets embroidered with metal tissues. As a trustworthy man, he chose out Tafas, a Hawizimharb tribesman, with his son, 
to guide me to Faisal's camp. Ali would not let me start till after sunset, lest any of his followers see me leave the camp. He kept my journey a secret even from his slaves, and gave me an Arab cloak and headcloth to wrap round myself and my uniform, that I might present a proper silhouette in the dark upon my camel. I had no food with me, so he instructed Tafes to get something to eat at Bir al Sheikh, the first settlement, some sixty miles out, and charged him most stringently to keep me from questioning and curiosity on the way, and to avoid all camps and encounters. We marched through the palm groves, which lay like a girdle about the scattered houses of Rabig village, and then out under the stars along the Tehema, the sandy and featureless strip of desert bordering the western coast of Arabia, between sea beach and littoral hills, for hundreds of monotonous miles. In daytime, this low plain was insufferably hot, and its waterless character made it a forbidding road. Yet it was inevitable, since the more fruitful hills were too rugged to afford passage north and south for loaded animals. The cool of the night was pleasant after the day of checks and discussions which had so dragged at Rabig. Tafas led on without speaking, and the camels went silently over the soft flat sand. My thoughts as we went were how this was the pilgrim road, down which for uncounted generations the people of the north had come to visit the holy city, bearing with them gifts of faith for the shrine. And it seemed that the Arab revolt might be in a sense a return pilgrimage, to take back to the north, to Syria, an ideal for an ideal, a belief in liberty for their past belief in a revelation. We endured for some hours, without variety except at times when the camels plunged and strained a little, and the saddles creaked. Indications that the soft plain had merged into beds of drift sand, dotted with tiny scrub, and therefore uneven going, since the plants collected little mounds about their roots, and the eddies of the sea winds scooped hollows in the intervening spaces. Camels appeared not sure-footed in the dark, and the starlit sand carried little shadow, so that hummocks and holes were difficult to see. Before midnight we halted, and I rolled myself tighter in my cloak, and chose a hollow of my own size and shape, and slept well in it till nearly dawn. As soon as he felt the air growing chill with the coming change, Tafis got up, and two minutes later we were swinging forward again. An hour after, and it grew bright, as we climbed a low neck of lava drowned nearly to the top with blown sand. This joined a small flow near the shore to the main Hejaz lava field, whose western edge ran up upon our right hand and caused the coast road to lie where it did. The neck was stony but brief. On each side the blue lava humped itself into low shoulders, from which, so Tafis said, it was possible to see ships sailing on the sea. Pilgrims had built cairns here by the road. Sometimes they were individual piles, of just three stones set up one above the other. Sometimes they were common heaps, to which any disposed passer-by might add his stone, not reasonably, nor with known motive, but because others did, and perhaps they knew. Beyond the ridge, the path descended into a broad open place, the Mastura, or plain by which Wadi Fiora flowed into the sea. Seeming its surface with innumerable interwoven channels of loose stone, a few inches deep, were the beds of the flood water, on those rare occasions when there was rain in the Tarif and the courses raged like rivers to the sea. The delta here was about six miles wide. Down some part of it, water flowed for an hour or two, or even for a day or two, every so many years. Underground there was plenty of moisture, protected by the overlying sand from the sun heat, and thorn trees and loose scrub profited by it and flourished. Some of the trunks were a foot through, their height might be twenty feet. The trees and bushes stood somewhat apart in clusters, their lower branches cropped by the hungry camels. So they looked cared for and had a premeditated air, which felt strange in the wilderness, more especially as the Tehama hitherto had been a sober bareness. In the early sunlight... We lifted our camels to a steady trot across the good going of these shingle beds among the trees, making for Mastura Well, the first stage out from Rabeg on the pilgrim road. 
There we would water and halt a little. My camel was a delight to me, for I had not been on such an animal before. There were no good camels in Egypt, and those of the Sinai Desert, while hardy and strong, were not taught to pace fair and softly and swiftly, like these rich mounts of the Arabian princes. Yet her accomplishments were today largely wasted, since they were reserved for riders who had the knack and asked for them, and not for me who expected to be carried and had no sense of how to ride. It was easy to sit on a camel's back without falling off, but very difficult to understand and get the best out of her so as to do long journeys without fatiguing either rider or beast. Taphus gave me hints as we went. Indeed, it was one of the few subjects on which he would speak. His orders to preserve me from contact with the world seemed to have closed even his mouth. A pity, for his dialect interested me. Quite close to the north bank of the Mastura, we found the well. Beside it were some decayed stone walls which had been a hut, and opposite it some little shelters of branches and palm leaves, under which a few Bedouin were sitting. We did not greet them. Instead, Taphis turned across to the ruinous walls and dismounted, and I sat in their shade while he and Abdullah watered the animals and drew a drink for themselves and for me. The well was old and broad, with good stone stenning and a strong coping round the top. It was about twenty feet deep, and for the convenience of travellers without ropes, like ourselves, a square chimney had been contrived in the masonry, with foot and handholds in the corners, so that a man might descend to the water and fill his goatskin. Idle hands had flung so many stones down the shaft, that half the bottom of the well was choked, and the water not abundant. Abdullah tied his flowing sleeves about his shoulders, tucked his gown under his cartridge belt, and clambered nimbly down and up, bringing each time four or five gallons which he poured for our camels into a stone trough beside the well. They drank about five gallons each, for they had been watered at Rabeg a day back. Then we let them moon about a little while we sat in peace breathing the light wind coming off the sea. Abdullah smoked a cigarette as reward for his exertions. Some herb came up, driving a large herd of brood camels, and began to water them, having sent one man down the well to fill their large leather bucket, which the others drew up hand over hand with a loud staccato chant. As we watched them, two riders, trotting light and fast on thoroughbred camels, drew towards us from the north. Both were young. One was dressed in rich cashmere robes and heavy silk embroidered headcloth. The other was plainer, in white cotton, with a red cotton headdress. They halted beside the well, and the more splendid one slipped gracefully to the ground without kneeling his camel, and threw his halter to his companion, saying carelessly, "'Water them while I go over there and rest.' Then he strolled across and sat down under our wall, after glancing at us with affected unconcern. He offered a cigarette, just rolled and licked, saying, Your presence is from Syria? I parried politely, suggesting that he was from Mecca, to which he likewise made no direct reply. We spoke a little of the war and of the leanness of the Harb she-camels. Meanwhile, the other rider stood by, vacantly holding the halters, waiting perhaps for the harb to finish watering their herd before taking his turn. The young lord cried, What is it, Mustafa? Water them at once. The servant came up to say dismally, They will not let me. God's mercy, shouted his master furiously, as he scrambled to his feet and hit the unfortunate Mustafa three or four sharp blows about the head and shoulders with his riding stick. Go and ask them. Mustafa looked hurt astonished and angry as though he would hit back but thought better of it and ran to the well the harb shocked in pity made a place for him and let his two camels drink from their water trough they whispered who is he and mustafa said our lord's cousin from mecca at once they ran and untied a bundle from one of their saddles and spread from it before the two riding camels fodder of the green leaves and buds of the thorn trees they were used to gather this by striking the low bushes with a heavy staff, till the broken tips of the branches rained down on a cloth stretched over the ground beneath. 
The young Sharif watched them contentedly. When his camel had fed, he climbed slowly and without apparent effort up its neck and into the saddle, where he settled himself leisurely and took an unctuous farewell of us, asking God to requite the Arabs bountifully. They wished him a good journey, and he started southward, while Abdullah brought our camels and we went off northward. Ten minutes later I heard a chuckle from old Tafas and saw wrinkles of delight between his grizzled beard and moustache. "'What is upon you, Tafas?' said I. "'My lord, you saw those two riders at the well. "'The Sharif and his servant? "'Yes, but they were Sharif Ali ibn al Hussein of Modig "'and his cousin Sharif Mosin, lords of the Harith, "'who were blood enemies of the Masra. "'They feared that they would be delayed or driven off the water "'if the Arabs knew them, "'so they pretended to be master and servant from Mecca. "'Did you see how Mosin raged when Ali beat him? "'Ali is a devil.' While only eleven years old, he escaped from his father's house to his uncle, a robber of pilgrims by trade, and with him he lived by his hands for many months till his father caught him. He was with our Lord Faisal from the first day's battle in Medina, and led the Atiba in the plains round Ar and Birder Wish. It was all camel fighting, and Ali would have no man with him who could not do as he did, run beside his camel and leap with one hand into the saddle carrying his rifle. The children of Harith are children of battle. For the first time, the old man's mouth was full of words. While he spoke, we scoured along the dazzling plain, now nearly bare of trees, and turning slowly softer underfoot. At first it had been gray shingle, packed like gravel. Then the sand increased and the stones grew rarer, till we could distinguish the colors of the separate flakes. Porphyry, green schist, basalt. At last it was nearly pure white sand, under which lay a harder stratum. Such going was like a pile carpet for a camel's running. The particles of sand were clean and polished, and caught the blaze of sun like little diamonds in a reflection so fierce that after a while I could not endure it. I frowned hard and pulled the headcloth forward in a peak over my eyes, and beneath them too like a beaver trying to shut out the heat which rose in glassy waves off the ground and beat up against my face. Eighty miles in front of us, the huge peak of Rudwa behind Yembo was looming and fading in the dazzle of vapor which hid its foot. Quite near in, the plain little shapeless hills seemed to block the way. To our right, the steep ridge of Beni Ayub, toothed and narrow like a saw blade, fell away on the north into a blue series of smaller hills, soft in character, behind which lofty range after range in a jagged stairway. Red now the sun grew low, climbed up to the towering central mass of Jebel Sub with its fantastic granite spires. A little later, we turned to the right off the Pilgrim Road and took a shortcut across gradually rising ground of flat basalt ridges, buried in sand till only their topmost pile showed above the surface. Along this we held our way till sunset, when we came into sight of the hamlet of Bir al-Sheikh. In the first dark, as the supper fires were lighted, we rode down its wide open street and halted. Tafes went into one of the twenty miserable huts, and in a few whispered words and long silences bought flour, of which with water he needed a dough cake two inches thick and eight inches across. This he buried in the ashes of a brushwood fire, provided for him by a soub woman whom he seemed to know. When the cake was warmed, he drew it out of the fire and clapped it to shake off the dust. Then we shared it together while Abdullah went away to buy himself tobacco. They told me the place had two stone-lined wells at the bottom of the southward slope, but I felt disinclined to go and look at them, for the long ride that day had tired my unaccustomed muscles and the heat of the plain had been painful. My skin was blistered by it, and my eyes ached with the glare of light striking up at a sharp angle from the silver sand and from the shining pebbles. The last two years I had spent in Cairo, at a desk all day, or thinking hard in a little overcrowded office full of distracting noises, with a hundred rushing things to say, but no bodily need except to come and go each day between office and hotel. In consequence, the novelty of this change was severe, 
since time had not been given me gradually to accustom myself to the pestilent beating of the Arabian sun and the long monotony of camel pacing. There was to be another stage tonight and a long day tomorrow before Faisal's camp would be reached. So I was grateful for the cooking and the marketing, which spent one hour, and for the second hour of rest after it, which we took by common consent. And sorry when it ended, and we remounted and rode in pitch darkness up valleys and down valleys, passing in and out of bands of air which were hot in the confined hollows, but fresh and stirring in the open places. The ground underfoot must have been sandy, because the silence of our passage hurt my straining ears, and smooth, for I was always falling asleep in the saddle, to wake a few seconds later suddenly and sickeningly, as I clutched by instinct at the saddle post to recover my balance, which had been thrown out by some irregular stride of the animal. It was too dark, and the forms of the country were too neutral to hold my heavy-lashed, peering eyes. At length, we stopped for good, long after midnight, and I was rolled up in my cloak and asleep in a most comfortable little sand grave before Taffas had done knee-haltering my camel. Three hours later, we were on the move again, helped now by the last shining of the moon. We marched down Wadi Mared, the night of it dead, hot, silent, and on each side sharp-pointed hills standing up black and white in the exhausted air. There were many trees. Dawn finally came to us as we passed out of the narrows into a broad place, over whose flat floor an uneasy wind spanned circles capriciously in the dust. The day strengthened always, and now showed Bir ibn Hassani just to our right. The trim settlement of absurd little houses, brown and white, holding together for security's sake, looked doll-like and more lonely than the desert, in the immense shadow of the dark precipice of Sub behind. While we watched it, hoping to see life at its doors, the sun was rushing up and the fretted cliffs, those thousands of feet above our heads, became outlined in hard refracted shafts of white light against a sky still sallow with the transient dawn. We rode across the great valley. A camel rider, garrulous and old, came out from the houses and jogged over to join us. He named himself Caliph, too friendly-like. His salutation came after a pause in a trite stream of chat, and when it was returned he tried to force us into conversation. However, Tafis grudged his company and gave him short answers. Caliph persisted, and finally, to improve his footing, bent down and burrowed in his saddle pouch till he found a small covered pot of enameled iron, containing a liberal portion of the staple of travel in the Hejaz. This was the unleavened dough cake of yesterday, but crumbled between the fingers while still warm, and moistened with liquid butter till its particles would fall apart only reluctantly. It was then sweetened for eating with ground sugar, and scooped up like damp sawdust and pressed pellets with the fingers. I ate a little, on this my first attempt, while Tafis and Abdullah played at it vigorously. So for his bounty, Caliph went half hungry. Deservedly, for it was thought effeminate by the Arabs to carry a provision of food for a little journey of one hundred miles. We were now fellows and the chat began again while Caliph told us about the last fighting, and a reverse Faisal had had the day before. It seemed he had been beaten out of the head of Wadi Safra, and was now at Hamra, only a little way in front of us. Or at least Caliph thought he was there. We might learn for sure in the next village on our road. The fighting had not been severe, but the few casualties were all among the tribesmen of Tafis and Caliph, and the names and hurts of each were told in order. We rode seven miles to a low watershed, crossed by a wall of granite slivers, now little more than a shapeless heap, but once no doubt a barrier. It ran from cliff to cliff, and even far up the hillsides, wherever the slopes were not too steep to climb. In the center, where the road passed, had been two small enclosures like pounds, I asked Caliph the purpose of the wall. He replied that he had been in Damascus and Constantinople and Cairo, and had many friends among the great men of Egypt. Did I know any of the English there? 
Kala seemed curious about my intentions and my history. He tried to trip me in Egyptian phrases. When I answered in the dialect of Aleppo, he spoke of prominent Syrians of his acquaintance. I knew them too, and he switched off into local politics, asking careful questions delicately and indirectly about the Sharif and his sons and what I thought Faisal was going to do. I understood less of this than he, and parried inconsequentially. Tafis came to my rescue and changed the subject. Afterwards, we knew that Caliph was in Turkish pay, and used to send frequent reports of what came past Bir ibn Hassani for the Arab forces. We turned to the right, across another saddle, and then downhill for a few miles to a corner of tall cliffs. We rounded this and found ourselves suddenly in Wadi Safra, the valley of our seeking, and in the midst of Wasta, its largest village. Wasta seemed to be many nests of houses, clinging to the hillsides, each side the torrent bed on banks of alluvial soil, or standing on detritus islands between the various deep-swept channels whose sum made up the parent valley. Riding between two or three of these built-up islands, we made for the far bank of the valley. On our way was the main bed of the winter floods, a sweep of white shingle and boulders, quite flat. Down its middle, from palm grove on the one side to palm grove on the other, lay a reach of clear water, perhaps two hundred yards long and twelve feet wide, sand-bottomed and bordered on each brink by a ten-foot lawn of thick grass and flowers. On it, we halted a moment to let our camels put their heads down and drink their fill, and the relief of the grass to our eyes after the day-long hard glitter of the pebbles was so sudden that involuntarily I glanced up to see if a cloud had not covered the face of the sun. We rode up the stream to the garden, from which it ran sparkling in a stone-lined channel, and then we turned along the mud wall of the garden in the shadow of its palms to another of the detached hamlets, Tafas led the way up its little street. The houses were so low that from our saddles we looked down upon their clay roofs. And near one of the larger houses stopped and beat upon the door of an uncovered court. A slave opened to us, and we dismounted in privacy. Tafas haltered the camels, loosed their girths, and strewed before them green fodder from a fragrant pile beside the gate. Then he led me into the guest room of the house, a dark, clean little mud-brick place, roofed with half-palm logs under hammered earth. We sat down on the palm-leaf mat which ran along the dais. The day in the stifling valley had grown very hot, and gradually we lay back side by side. Then the hum of the bees in the gardens without, and of the flies hovering over our veiled faces within, lulled us into sleep. Before we awoke, a meal of bread and dates had been prepared for us by the people of the house. The dates were new, meltingly sweet and good, like none I had ever tasted. Afterwards we mounted again and rode up the clear slow rivulet till it was hidden within the palm gardens, behind their low boundary walls of sun-dried clay. In and out between the tree roots were dug little canals a foot or two deep, so contrived that the stream might be led into them from the stone channel and each tree watered in its turn. The head of water was owned by the community, and shared out among the landowners for so many minutes or hours daily or weekly, according to the traditional use. The water was a little brackish, as was needful for the best palms, but it was sweet enough in the wells of private water in the groves. These wells were very frequent, and found water three or four feet below the surface. Our way took us through the central village and its market street. There was little in the shops, and all the place felt decayed. A generation ago, Wasta was populous, they said by a thousand houses. But one day, there rolled a huge wall of water down Wadi Safra. The embankments of many palm gardens were breached, and the palm trees swept away. Some of the islands on which houses had stood for centuries were submerged and the mud houses melted again back into mud, killing or drowning the unfortunate slaves within. The men could have been replaced, and the trees had the soil remained, but the gardens had been built up of earth carefully won from the normal freshets by years of labor, and this wave of water, eight feet deep, 
running in a race for three days, reduced the plots in its track to their primordial banks of stones. A little above Wasta, the valley widened somewhat to an average of perhaps four hundred yards, with a bed of fine shingle and sand, laid very smooth by the winter rains. The walls were of bare red and black rock, whose edges and ridges were sharp as knife blades and reflected the sun like metal. They made the freshness of the trees and grass seem luxurious. We now saw parties of Faisal soldiers and grazing herds of their saddle camels. Before we reached Hamra, every nook in the rocks or clump of trees was a bivouac. They cried cheery greetings to Tafas, who came to life again, waving back and calling to them, while he pressed on quickly to end his duty towards me. Hamra opened on our left. It seemed a village of about one hundred houses, buried in gardens among mounds of earth some twenty feet in height. We forded a little stream and went up a walled path between trees to the top of one of these mounds, where we made our camels kneel by the yard gate of a long, low house. Tafa said something to a slave who stood there with a silver-hilted sword in hand. He led me to an inner court, on whose further side, framed between the uprights of a black doorway, stood a white figure waiting tensely for me. I felt at first glance that this was the man I had come to Arabia to seek, the leader who would bring the Arab revolt to full glory. Faisal looked very tall and pillar-like, very slender in his long white silk robes and his brown headcloth bound with a brilliant scarlet and gold cord. His eyelids were dropped, and his black beard and colorless face were like a mask against the strange still watchfulness of his body. His hands were crossed in front of him on his dagger. I greeted him. He made way for me into the room and sat down on his carpet near the door. As my eyes grew accustomed to the shade, they saw that the little room held many silent figures, looking at me or at Faisal steadily. He remained staring down at his hands, which were twisting slowly about his dagger. At last, he inquired softly how I had found the journey. I spoke of the heat, and he asked how long from Rabig, commenting that I had ridden fast for the season. And do you like our place here in Wadi Safra? Well, but it is far from Damascus. The word had fallen like a sword into their midst. There was a quiver. Then everybody present stiffened where he sat and held his breath for a silent minute. Some, perhaps, were dreaming of far-off success. Others may have thought it a reflection on their late defeat. Faisal at length lifted his eyes, smiling at me, and said, Praise be to God, there are Turks nearer us than that. We all smiled with him, and I rose and excused myself for the moment. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter Three Faisal and His Levies. Under tall arcades of palms with ribbed and groined branches, in a soft meadow, I found the trim camp of Egyptian army soldiers with Nafi Bey, their Egyptian major, sent lately from the Sudan by Sir Reginald Wingate to help the Arab rebellion. They comprised a mountain battery and some machine guns. Nafi himself was an amiable fellow, kind and hospitable to me. Faisal was announced with Maloud al Muklis the Arab zealot of Tekrit, who for rampant nationalism had been twice degraded in the Turkish army and had spent an exile of two years in the Nejed as a secretary with Ibn Rashid. He had commanded the Turkish cavalry before Shaiba and had been taken by us there. As soon as he heard of the rebellion of the Sharif, he had volunteered for him and had been the first regular officer to join Faisal. He was now nominally his ADC. Bitterly, he complained that they were in every way ill-equipped. This was the main cause of their present plight. 
They got 30,000 pounds a month from the Sharif, but little flour and rice, little barley, few rifles, insufficient ammunition, no machine guns, no mountain guns, no technical help, no information. I stopped Maulud there and said my coming was expressly to learn what they lacked and to report it, but that I could work with them only if they would explain to me their general situation. Faisal agreed and began to sketch to me the history of their revolt from its absolute beginning. The first rush on Medina had been a desperate business. The Arabs were ill-armed and short of ammunition, the Turks in great force. At the height of the crisis, the Beni Ali broke, and the Arabs were thrust out beyond the walls. The Turks then opened fire on them with their artillery, and the Arabs, unused to this new arm, became terrified. The Agail and Atiba got into safety, and refused to move out again. Sections of Beni Ali tribesmen approached the Turkish command with an offer to surrender, if their villages were spared. Fakri played with them, and in the ensuing lull of hostilities surrounded the Awali suburb with his troops, whom suddenly he ordered to carry it by assault and to massacre every living thing within its walls. Hundreds of the inhabitants were raped and butchered, the houses fired, and living and dead alike thrown back into the flames. Fakri and his men had served together and had learned the arts of both the slow and the fast kill upon the Armenians in the north. This bitter taste of the Turkish mode of war sent a shock across Arabia, for the first rule of Arab war was that women were inviolable, the second that the lives and honor of children too young to fight with men were to be spared, the third that property impossible to carry off should be left undamaged. The Arabs with Faisal perceived that they were opposed to new customs and fell back out of touch to gain time to readjust themselves. There could no longer be any question of submission. The sack of Awali had opened blood feud upon blood feud and put on them the duty of fighting to the end of their force. But it was plain now that it would be a long affair and that with muzzle-loading guns for soul weapons, they could hardly expect to win. So they fell back from their level plains about Medina into the hills where they rested, while Ali and Faisal sent messenger after messenger down to Rabig, their sea base, to learn when fresh stores and money and arms might be expected. The revolt had begun haphazard on their father's explicit orders, and the old man, too independent to take his sons into his full confidence, had not worked out with them any arrangements for prolonging it. So the reply was only a little food. Later, some Japanese rifles, most of them broken, were received. Such barrels as were still whole were so foul that the two eager Arabs burst them on the first trial. No money was sent up at all. To take its place, Faisal filled a decent chest with stones, had it locked and corded carefully, guarded on each daily march by his own slaves, and introduced meticulously into his tent each night. By such theatricals, the brothers tried to hold a melting force. At last Ali went down to Rabig to inquire what was wrong with the organization. He found that Hussein Maberig, the local chief, had made up his mind that the Turks would be victorious. He had tried conclusions with them twice himself and had the worst of it and accordingly decided theirs was the best cause to follow. As the stores for the Sharif were landed by the British, he appropriated them and stored them away secretly in his own houses. Ali made a demonstration and sent urgent messages for his half-brother Zaid to join him from Jeddah with reinforcements. Hussein, in fear, slipped off to the hills and outlaw. The two Sharifs took possession of his villages, in them, they found great stores of arms and food enough for their armies for a month. The temptation of a spell of leisured ease was too much for them. They settled down in Rabig. This left Faisal alone up country, and he soon found himself isolated in a hollow situation, driven to depend upon his native resources. He bore it for a time, but in August took advantage of the visit of Colonel Wilson to the newly conquered Yembo, to come down and give a full explanation of his urgent needs. Wilson was impressed with him and his story, and at once promised him a battery of mountain guns and some maxims, to be handled by men and officers of the Egyptian army garrison in the Sudan. 
This explained the presence of Nafi Bey and his units. The Arabs rejoiced when they came, and believed they were now equals of the Turk. But the four guns were twenty-year-old Krupps with a range of only three thousand yards, and their crews were not eager enough in brain and spirit for irregular fighting. However, they went forward with the mob and drove in the Turkish outposts and then their supports, until Fakhri, becoming seriously alarmed, came down himself, inspected the front, and at once reinforced the threatened detachment at Bir Abbas to some three thousand strong. The Turks had field guns and howitzers with them, and the added advantage of high ground for observation. They began to worry the Arabs by indirect fire, and nearly dropped a shell on Faisal's tent while all the headmen were conferring within. The Egyptian gunners were asked to return the fire and smother the enemy guns. They had to plead that their weapons were useless, since they could not carry the 9,000 yards. They were derided, and the Arabs ran back again into the defiles. Faisal was deeply discouraged. His men were tired. He had lost many of them. His only effective tactics against the enemy had been to chase in suddenly upon their rear by fast-mounted charges, and many camels had been killed, or wounded, or worn out in these expensive measures. He demurred to carrying the whole war upon his own neck, while Abdullah delayed in Mecca, and Ali and Zaid at Rabeg. Finally he withdrew the bulk of his forces, leaving the Harb sub-tribes to keep up pressure on the Turkish supply columns and communications by a repeated series of such raids as those which he himself found impossible to maintain. Yet he had no fear that the Turks would again come forward against him suddenly. His failure to make any impression on them had not imbued him with the smallest respect for them. His late retirement to Hamra was not forced. It was a gesture of disgust, because he was bored by his obvious impotence and was determined for a little while to have the dignity of rest. I asked Faisal what his plans were now. He said that till Medina fell, they were inevitably tied down there in Hejaz, dancing to Fakhri's tune. In his opinion, the Turks were aiming at the recapture of Mecca. The bulk of their strength was now in a mobile column, which they could move towards Rabig by a choice of routes which kept the Arabs in constant alarm. A passive defense of the Sub hills had shown that the Arabs did not shine as passive resistors. When the enemy moved, they must be countered by an offensive. Maulud, who had sat fidgeting through our long, slow talk, could no longer restrain himself and cried out, Don't write a history of us. The needful thing is to fight and fight and kill them. Give me a battery of Schneider mountain guns and machine guns, and I will finish this off for you. We talk and talk and do nothing. I replied as warmly, and Maulud, a magnificent fighter, who regarded a battle won as a battle wasted if he did not show some wound to prove his part in it, took me up. We wrangled while Faisal sat by and grinned delightedly at us. This talk had been for him a holiday. He was encouraged even by the trifle of my coming, for he was a man of moods, flickering between glory and despair, and just now dead tired. He looked years older than thirty-one, and his dark, appealing eyes sat a little sloping in his face, were bloodshot, and his hollow cheeks deeply lined and puckered with reflection. His nature grudged thinking, for it crippled his speed in action. The labor of it shriveled his features into swift lines of pain. In appearance he was tall, graceful, and vigorous, with the most beautiful gait and a royal dignity of head and shoulders. Of course he knew it, and a great part of his public expression was by sign and gesture. His movements were impetuous. He showed himself hot-tempered and sensitive, even unreasonable, and he ran off soon on tangents. Appetite and physical weakness were mated in him with a spur of courage. His personal charm, his imprudence, the pathetic hint of frailty as the sole reserve of this proud character made him the idol of his followers. One never asked if he were scrupulous, but later he showed that he could return trust for trust, suspicion for suspicion. He was fuller of wit than of humor. His training in Abdul Hamid's entourage had made him pass master in diplomacy. 
His military service with the Turks had given him a working knowledge of tactics. His life in Constantinople and in the Turkish parliament had made him familiar with European questions and manners. He was a careful judge of men. If he had the strength to realize his dreams, he would go very far, for he was wrapped up in his work and lived for nothing else. But the fear was that he would wear himself out by trying to seem to aim always a little higher than the truth, or that he would die of too much action. His men told me how, after a long spell of fighting, in which he had to guard himself and lead the charges and control and encourage them, he had collapsed physically and was carried away from his victory, unconscious, with the foam flecking his lips. Meanwhile, here, as it seemed, was offered to our hand, which had only to be big enough to take it, a prophet who, if veiled, would give cogent form to the idea behind the activity of the Arab revolt. It was all and more than we had hoped for, much more than our halting course deserved. The aim of my trip was fulfilled. My duty was now to take the shortest road to Egypt with the news, and the knowledge gained that evening in the palm wood grew and blossomed in my mind into a thousand branches, laden with fruit and shady leaves, beneath which I sat and half listened and saw visions while the twilight deepened and the night until a line of slaves with lamps came down the winding paths between the palm trunks, and with Faisal and Maloud we walked back through the gardens to the little house, with its courts still full of waiting people, and to the hot inner room in which the familiars were assembled. And there we sat down together to the smoking bowl of rice and meat set upon the food carpet for our supper by the slaves. Next morning, I was up early and out among Faisal's troops toward the side of Keef, by myself, trying to feel the pulse of their opinions in a moment. Time was of the essence of my effort, for it was necessary to gain in ten days the impressions which would ordinarily have been the fruit of weeks of observing in my crab fashion, that sideways slipping affair of the senses. Normally I would go along all day, with the sounds immediate, but blind to every detail, only generally aware that there were things red or things gray, or clear things about me. Today, my eyes had to be switched straight to my brain, that I might note a thing or two the more clearly by contrast with the former mistiness. Such things were nearly always shapes, rocks and trees, or men's bodies in repose or movement, not small things like flowers, nor qualities like color. Yet here was strong need of a lively reporter. In this drab war, the least irregularity was a joy to all, and McMahon's strongest course was to exploit the latent imagination of the general staff. I believed in the Arab movement, and was confident before ever I came that in it was the idea to tear Turkey into pieces. But others in Egypt lacked faith, and had been taught nothing intelligent of the Arabs in the field. By noting down something of the spirit of these romantics in the hills about the holy cities, I might gain the sympathy of Cairo for the further measures necessary to help them. The men received me cheerfully. Beneath every great rock or bush they sprawled like lazy scorpions, resting from the heat, and refreshing their brown limbs with the early coolness of the shaded stone. Because of my khaki, they took me for a Turk-trained officer who had deserted to them, and were profuse and good-humored but ghastly suggestions of how they should treat me. They were in wild spirits, shouting that the war might last ten years. It was the fattest time the hills had ever known. The Sharif was feeding not only the fighting men, but their families, and paying two pounds a month for a man, four for a camel. Nothing else would have performed the miracle of keeping a tribal army in the field for five months on end. The actual contingents were continually shifting, in obedience to the rule of flesh. A family would own a rifle, and the sons serve in turn for a few days each. Married men alternated between camp and wife, and sometimes a whole clan would become bored and take a rest. Faisal's 8,000 men were one in ten camel corps, and the rest hillmen. They served only under their tribal sheiks and near home, arranging their own food and transport. Blood feuds were nominally healed and really suspended in the Sharifian area. Billy and Juhaina, Atiba and Agil, living and fighting side by side in Faisal's army. All the same, 
the members of one tribe were shy of those of another, and within the tribe no man would quite trust his neighbor. Each might be, usually was, wholehearted against the Turk, but perhaps not quite to the point of failing to work off a family grudge upon a family enemy in the field. Their acquisitive recklessness made them keen on booty, and wedded them to tear up railways, plunder caravans, and steal camels. But they were too free-minded to endure command, or to fight in team. A man who could fight well by himself made generally a bad soldier, and these champions seemed to me no material for our drilling. But if we strengthened them by light automatic guns of the Lewis type, to be handled by themselves, they might be capable of holding their hills. The Hejaz War was the fight of a rocky, mountainous, barren country, reinforced by a wild horde of mountaineers, against an enemy so enriched in equipment by the Germans as almost to have lost virtue for rough-and-tumble war. The hill belt was a paradise for snipers. The valleys, which were the only practicable roads, for miles and miles were not so much valleys as chasms or gorges, sometimes two hundred yard across, but sometimes only twenty, full of twists and turns, one thousand or four thousand feet deep, barren of cover and flanked each side by pitiless granite, basalt, and porphyry, not in polished slopes, but serrated and split and piled up in thousands of jagged heaps of fragments as hard as metal and nearly as sharp. It seemed to my unaccustomed eyes impossible that without treachery on the part of the mountain tribes, the Turks could dare to break their way through. The sole disquieting feature was the very real success of the Turks in frightening the Arabs by artillery. The sound of a fired cannon sent every man within earshot behind cover. They thought weapons destructive in proportion to their noise. They were not afraid of bullets, nor indeed overmuch of dying. Just the manner of death by shell-fire was unendurable. It seemed to me that their moral confidence was to be restored only by having guns, useful or useless, but noisy, on their side. From the magnificent Faisal down to the most naked stripling in the army, the theme was artillery, artillery, artillery. At these close quarters, the bigness of the revolt impressed me. This well-peopled province had suddenly changed its character from a rout of casual nomad pilferers to an eruption against Turkey. Fighting her, not certainly in our manner, but fiercely enough, in spite of the religion which was to raise the East against us in a holy war. There was among the tribes in the fighting zone a nervous enthusiasm, common, I suppose, to all national risings, but strangely disquieting to one from a land so long delivered that national freedom had become like the water in our mouths tasteless. Later, I saw Faisal again and promised to do my best for him. My chiefs would arrange a base at Yembo, where the stores and supplies he needed would be put ashore for his exclusive use. We would try to get him officer volunteers from among the prisoners of war captured in Mesopotamia or on the canal. We would form gun crews and machine gun crews from the rank and file in the internment camps and provide them with such mountain guns and light machine guns as were obtainable in Egypt. Lastly, I would advise that British Army officers, professionals, be sent down to act as advisers and liaison officers with him in the field. This time, our talk was of the pleasantest, and ended in warm thanks from him and an invitation to return as soon as might be. I explained that my duties in Cairo excluded field work, but perhaps my chiefs would let me pay a second visit later on. When his present wants were filled, and his movement was going forward prosperously. Meanwhile, I would ask him for facilities to return to the coast, for Egypt. Faisal's care gave me an escort of local sheriffs, who guided me to Yembo, through other miles of stark hills, with their hairlines of irrigated valleys threading their barrenness. Yembo, a village Jeddah, proved hospitable. Its governor, a Javanese from Mecca, fed me and lodged me for many days till the Suva, Captain Boyle, put into harbour and granted me passage down the coast. Granted me, for I was in a very soiled condition after days of riding light, 
and I had a native headcloth on my head. And to the Royal Navy, all native things seemed crapulous. Boyle, as the senior naval officer in the Red Sea, should have been the exemplar of his type, but he sat on the shadow side of his bridge, reading Bryce's American Constitution too intently to spare me more than fourteen words a day. In Jeddah was the Uralis, with Admiral Weymouth, bound for Port Sudan that he might visit Sir Reginald Wingate at Khartoum. Sir Reginald, as Sirdar of the Egyptian army, had been put in command of the British military side of the Arab adventure, and it was necessary for me to impart my impressions to him. So I begged the Admiral for a passage over sea and a place in his train to Khartoum. This he readily granted after cross-questioning me himself at length. I found that his active mind and broad intelligence had engaged his interest in the Arab revolt from the beginning. He had come down again and again in his flagship to lend a hand when things were critical, and had gone out of his way twenty times to help the shore, which properly was army business. He had given the Arabs guns and machine guns, landing parties and technical help, with unlimited transport and naval cooperation, always making a real pleasure of requests and fulfilling them in overflowing measure. Khartoum felt cool after Arabia, and nerved me to show Sir Reginald Wingate my long reports, in which I urged that the situation seemed full of promise. The main need was skilled assistance, and the campaign should go prosperously if some regular British officers, professionally competent and speaking Arabic, were attached to the Arab leaders as technical advisers to keep us in proper touch. Wingate was glad to hear a hopeful view. The Arab revolt had been his dream for years. So after two or three days in Khartoum, I went down towards Cairo, feeling that the responsible person had accepted all my news. The Nile trip became a holiday. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter Four Checks Around Yembo. After I had been a few days in Cairo, my chief, General Clayton, told me to return to Arabia and Faisal. This being much against my grain, I urged my complete unfitness for the job, said I hated responsibility. Obviously, the position of a conscientious advisor would be responsible, and that in all my life, objects had been gladder to me than persons, and ideas than objects. So the duty of succeeding with men of disposing them to any purpose, would be doubly hard to me. I was unlike a soldier, hated soldiering, whereas the Sirdar had telegraphed to London for certain regular officers, competent to direct the Arab war. Clayton replied that they might be months arriving, and meanwhile, Faisal must be linked to us and his needs promptly notified to Egypt. So I had to go, leaving to others the Arab bulletin I had founded, the maps I wished to draw, and the file of the war changes of the Turkish army, all fascinating activities in which my training helped me, to take up a role for which I felt no inclination. As our revolt succeeded, onlookers appraised its leadership, but behind the scenes lay all the vices of amateur control, experimental councils, divisions, whimsicality. My journey was to Yembo, now the special base of Faisal's army, as I was starting thence up country to visit Faisal again, news came in of a Turkish repulse. A reconnaissance of their cavalry and camel corps had been pushed too far into the hills, and the Arabs had caught it and scattered it. So I made a happy start with my sponsor for the journey, Sharif Abid al Karim. With him were three or four of his men, all well mounted, and we had a rapid journey, for Abid al Karim was a famous rider who took pride in covering his stages at three times the normal speed. It was not my camel, and the weather was cool and clouded with a taste of rain, so I had no objection. After starting, 
We cantered for three unbroken hours. That had shaken down our bellies far enough for us to hold more food, and we stopped and ate bread and drank coffee till sunset, while Abd al Karim rolled about his carpet in a dog fight with one of the men. When he was exhausted, he sat up, and they told stories and japed till they were breathed enough to get up and dance. Everything was very free, very good tempered, and not at all dignified. When we restarted, an hour's mad race in the dusk brought us to the foot of a low range. We crossed it, going up a narrow, winding, sandy valley. Because this had run in flood a few days earlier, the going was firm for our panting camels. But the ascent was steep, and we had to take it at walking pace. This pleased me, but so angered Abd al Karim that when, in a short hour, we reached the watershed, he thrust his mount forward again and led us at breakneck speed downhill in the yielding night. A fair road, fortunately, with sand and pebbles underfoot. For half an hour, when the land flattened out and we came to the outlying plantations of Nakal Mubarak, chief date gardens of the southern Juhena. As we got near, we saw through the palm trees flame and the flame-lit smoke of many fires, while the hollow ground re-echoed with the roaring of thousands of excited camels and volleying of shots or shoutings in the darkness of lost men who sought through the crowd to rejoin their friends. As we had heard in Yenbo that the Nekel were deserted, this tumult meant something strange, perhaps hostile, we crept quietly past an end of the grove and along a narrow street between man-high mud walls to a silent group of houses. Abd al Karim forced the courtyard door of the first on our left, led the camels within and hobbled them down by the walls that they might remain unseen. Then he slipped a cartridge into the breech of his rifle and stole off on tiptoe down the street towards the noise to find out what was happening. We waited for him, the sweat of the ride slowly drying in our clothes as we sat there in the chill night, watching. He came back after half an hour to say that Faisal with his camel corps had just arrived, and we were to go down and join him. So we led the camels out and mounted, and rode in file down another lane on a bank between houses, with the sunk garden of palms on our right. Its end was filled with a solid crowd of Arabs and camels, mixed together in the wildest confusion and all crying aloud. We pressed through them and down a ramp suddenly into the bed of the Wadi Embo, a broad open space. How broad could only be guessed from the irregular lines of watchfires glimmering over it to a great distance. Also, it was very damp, with slime, the relic of a shallow flood two days before, yet covering its stones. Our camels found it slippery underfoot, and began to move timidly. We had no opportunity to notice this, or indeed anything just now, except the mass of Faisal's army, filling the valley from side to side. There were hundreds of fires of thornwood, and round them were Arabs making coffee, or eating, or sleeping muffled like dead men in their cloaks, packed together closely in the confusion of camels. So many camels in company made a mess indescribable, couched as they were or tied down all over the camping ground, with more ever coming in, and the old ones leaping up on three legs to join them, roaring with hunger and agitation. Patrols were going out, caravans being unloaded, and dozens of Egyptian mules bucking angrily over the middle of the scene. We ploughed our way through this din, and in an island of calm at the very center of the valley bed found Sharif Faisal, we halted our camels by his side. On his carpet, spread barely over the stones, he was sitting between Sharif Sharaf, the Kaim Makam both of the Emirate and of Taif, his cousin, and Maloud, the rugged, slashing old Mesopotamian patriot now acting as his ADC. In front of him knelt a secretary, taking down an order, and beyond him, another reading reports aloud by the light of a silvered lamp which a slave was holding. The night was windless, the air heavy, and the unshielded flame poised there stiff and straight. Faisal, quiet as ever, welcomed me with a smile until he could finish his dictation. After it, he apologized for my disorderly reception and waved the slaves back to give us privacy. As they retired with the onlookers, a wild camel leaped into the open space in front of us, plunging and trumpeting. 
Maulud dashed at its head to drag it away, but it dragged him instead. And its load of grass ropes for camel fodder coming untied, there poured down over the taciturn sheriff, the lamp, and myself, an avalanche of hay. God be praised, said Faisal gravely, that it was neither batter nor bags of gold. Then he explained to me what unexpected things had happened in the last twenty-four hours on the battlefront. The Turks had slipped round the head of the Arab barrier forces in Wadi Safra by a side road in the hills, and had cut their retreat. The Harb, in a panic, had melted into the ravines on each side and escaped through them in parties of twos and threes. The Turkish mounted men poured down the empty valley and over the different pass to Bir Said, where Amir Zaid, Faisal's young half-brother, was camped with a Harb contingent. The Turks took Zaid by surprise and routed him. His force melted into a loose mob of fugitives riding wildly through the night towards Yembo. Thereby the road to Yembo was laid open to the Turks, and Faisal had rushed down here only an hour before our arrival, with 5,000 men to protect his base until something properly defensive could be arranged. The situation was serious, but Faisal's presence here might attract the enemy, and caused them to lose more days trying to catch his field army while we strengthened Yembo. Meanwhile, he was doing all he could, quite cheerfully. So I sat down and listened to the news, or to the petitions, complaints, and difficulties being brought in and settled by him summarily. This lasted till half-past four in the morning. It grew very cold as the damp of the valley rose through the carpet and soaked our clothes. The camp gradually stilled as the tired men and animals went one by one to sleep. A white mist collected softly over them, and in it the fires became slow pillars of smoke. Faisal at last finished the urgent work. We ate a half-dozen dates, a frigid comfort, and curled up on the wet carpet. As I lay there in a shiver, I saw the Biasha guards creep up and spread their cloaks gently over Faisal when they were sure that he was sleeping. An hour later, we got up stiffly in the false dawn, too cold to go on pretending and lying down, and the slaves lit a fire of palm ribs to warm us, while Sharaf and myself searched for food and fuel enough for the moment. Messengers were still coming in from all sides with evil rumors of an immediate attack, and the camp was not far off panic. So Faisal decided to move to another position, partly because we should be washed out of this one if it rained anywhere in the hills, and partly to occupy his men's minds. When his drums began to beat, the camels were loaded hurriedly. After the second signal, everyone leaped into the saddle and drew off to left or right, leaving a broad lane up which Faisal rode on his mare, with Sharaf a pace behind him, and then Ali. The standard-bearer, a splendid wild man from Nejed, with his hawk's face framed in long plates of jet-black hair falling downward from his temples. Ali was dressed garishly and rode a tall camel. Behind him were all the mob of sharifs and sheikhs and slaves, and myself, pell-mell. There were eight hundred in the bodyguard that morning. The next two days I spent in Faisal's company, and so got a deeper experience of his method of command, at an interesting season when the morale of his men was suffering heavily from the scare reports brought in and from the defection of the northern harb. Faisal, fighting to make up their lost spirits, did it most surely by lending of his own to every one within reach. He was accessible to all who stood outside his tent and waited for notice, and he never cut short petitions, even when men came in chorus with their grief in a song of many verses and sang them around us in the dark. He listened always, and if he did not settle the case himself, called Sharaf or Fayez to arrange it for him. This extreme patience was a further lesson to me of what native headship in Arabia meant. His self-control seemed equally great. When Mirzuk el Tikhami, his guest master, came in from Zaid to explain the shameful story of their rout, Faisal just laughed at him in public, and sent him aside to wait while he saw the sheikhs of the Harb and the Agil, whose carelessness had been mainly responsible for the disaster. These he rallied gently, chafing them for having done this or that, 
for having inflicted such losses or lost so much. Then he called back Mirzuk and lowered the tent flap, a sign that there was private business to be done. I thought of the meaning of Faisal's name, the sword flashing downward in the stroke, and feared a scene. But he made room for Mirzuk on his carpet and said, Come, tell us more of your knights and marvels of the battle. Amuse us. Faisal, in speaking, had a rich musical voice and used it carefully upon his men. To them, he talked in tribal dialect, but with a curious hesitant manner, as though faltering painfully among phrases, looking inward for the just word. His thought, perhaps, moved only by a little in front of his speech, for the phrases at last chosen were usually the simplest, which gave an effect emotional and sincere. It seemed possible, so thin was the screen of words, to see the pure and very brave spirit shining out. The routine of our life in camp was simple. Just before daybreak, the army imam used to utter an astounding call to prayer. His voice was harsh and very powerful, and we were effectually roused, whether we prayed or cursed. As soon as he ended, Faisal's imam cried gently and musically from just outside the tent. In a minute, one of Faisal's five slaves came round with sweetened coffee. Sugar for the first cup in the chill of dawn was considered fit. An hour or so later, the flap of Faisal's sleeping tent would be thrown back, his invitation to callers from the household. There would be four or five present, and after the morning's news, a tray of breakfast would be carried in. The staple of this was dates, but sometimes Hedris, the body slave, would give us odd biscuits and cereals of his own trying. After breakfast, we would play with bitter coffee and sweet tea in alternation, while Faisal's correspondence was dealt with by dictation to his secretaries. One of these was Faiz, the adventurous. Another was the imam, a sad-faced person made conspicuous in the army by the baggy umbrella hanging from his saddle bow. Occasionally, a man was given private audience at this hour, but seldom, as the sleeping tent was strictly for the Sharif's own use. It was an ordinary bell tent, furnished with cigarettes, a camp bed, a fairly good curd rug, a poor Shirazi, and the delightful old Baluch prayer carpet on which he prayed. At about eight o'clock in the morning, Faisal would buckle on his ceremonial dagger and walk across to the reception tent. He would sit down at the end of the tent facing the open side, and we with our backs against the wall, in a semicircle out from him, the slaves brought up the rear and clustered round the open wall of the tent to control the besetting supplicants who lay on the sand in the tent mouth or beyond, waiting their turn. If possible, business was got through by noon when the emir liked to rise. We of the household and any guests then reassembled in the living tent, and Hedris and Salem carried in the luncheon tray, on which were as many dishes as circumstances permitted. Faisal was an inordinate smoker, but a very light eater, and he used to make believe with his fingers or a spoon among the beans, lentils, spinach, rice, and sweet cakes, till he judged that we had had enough, when at a wave of his hand the tray would disappear as other slaves walked forward to pour water for our fingers at the tent door. Fat men, like Muhammad ibn Shafia made a comic grievance of the emir's quick and delicate meals, and would have food of their own prepared for them when they came away. After lunch, we would talk a little, while sucking up two cups of coffee and savoring two glasses full of syrup-like green tea. Then till two in the afternoon, the curtain of the living tent was down, signifying that Faisal was sleeping, or reading, or doing private business. Afterwards, he would sit again in the reception tent till he had finished with all who wanted him. I never saw an Arab leave him dissatisfied or hurt, a tribute to his tact and to his memory, for he seemed never to halt for loss of a fact, nor to stumble over a relationship. If there were time after second audience, he would walk with his friends. Between six and seven there was brought in the evening meal, to which all present in headquarters were called by the slaves. It resembled the lunch. This meal ended our day, 
save for the stealthy offering by a barefooted slave of a tray of tea glasses at protracted intervals. Faisal did not sleep till very late, and never betrayed a wish to hasten our going. In the evening, he relaxed as far as possible and avoided avoidable work. Very rarely he would play chess with the unthinking directness of a fencer and brilliantly. Sometimes, perhaps for my benefit, he told stories of what he had seen in Syria and scraps of Turkish secret history or family affairs. I learned much of the men and parties in the Hejaz from his lips. Suddenly, Faisal asked me if I would wear Arab clothes like his own while in the camp. I should find it better for my own part, since it was a comfortable dress in which to live Arab fashion, as we must do. Besides, the tribesmen would then understand how to take me. The only wearers of khaki in their experience had been Turkish officers, before whom they took up an instinctive defense. If I wore Meccan clothes, they would behave to me as though I were really one of the leaders, and I might slip in and out of Faisal's tent without making a sensation, which he had to explain away each time to strangers. I agreed at once, very gladly. Hedris was pleased too, and exercised his fancy in fitting me out in splendid white silk and gold-embroidered wedding garments, which had been sent to Faisal lately, was it a hint, by his great-aunt in Mecca. I took a stroll in the new looseness of them round the palm gardens to accustom myself to their feel. Faisal's stand in Nakal Mubarak could in the nature of things only be a pause, and I felt that I had better get back to Yembo to think seriously about our amphibious defense of this port, the navy having promised its every help. We settled that I should consult Zaid and act with him as seemed best. Faisal gave me a magnificent bay camel for the trip back. We marched through the Yagida Hills by a new road, Wadi Masari, because of a scare of Turkish patrols on the more direct line. Better Ibn Shafia was with me, and we did the distance gently in a single stage of six hours, getting to Yembo before dawn. Being tired after three strenuous days of little sleep among constant alarms and excitements, I went straight to Garland's empty house. He was living on board ship in the harbor and fell asleep on a bench. But afterwards I was called out again by the news that Sharif Zaid was coming and went down to the walls to see the beaten force ride in. There were about 800 of them, quiet, but in no other way mortified by their shame. Zaid himself seemed finally indifferent. As he entered the town, he turned and cried to Abd al-Qadir, the governor, riding behind him, Why, your town is ruinous! I must telegraph to my father for forty masons to repair the public buildings. And this he actually did. I had telegraphed to Captain Boyle, the British senior naval officer in the Red Sea, that Yembo was gravely threatened, and Boyle at once replied that his fleet would be there in time. This readiness was an opportune consolation. Worse news came along next day. The Turks by throwing a strong force forward from Bir Said against Nakal Mubarak, had closed with Faisal's levies while they were yet unsteady. After a short fight, Faisal had broken off, yielded his ground, and was retreating here. Our war seemed entering its last act. I took my camera, and from the parapet of the Medina Gate got a fine photograph of the brothers coming in. Faisal had nearly 2,000 men with him, but none of the Juhayna tribesmen. It looked like treachery and a real defection of the tribes, things which both of us had ruled out of court as impossible. I called at once at his house, and he told me the history. The Turks had come on with three battalions and a number of mule-mounted infantry and camelry. They got across Wadi Yembo to the groves in their first onset, and thus threatened the Arab communications with Yembo. They were also able to shell Nakal Mubarak freely with their seven guns. Faisal was not a whit dismayed, but threw out the Johanna on his left to work down the great valley. His center and right he kept in Nakal Mubarak, and he sent the Egyptian artillery to deny the Yembo road to the Turks. Then he opened fire with his own two fifteen-pounders. Rasim, a Syrian officer, formerly a battery commander in the Turkish army, 
was fighting these two guns, and he made a great demonstration with them. They had been sent down as a gift from Egypt anyhow, old rubbish thought serviceable for the wild Arabs. So Racim had no sights, nor range finder, no range tables, no high explosive. His distance might have been 6,000 yards, but the fuses of his shrapnel were Boer War antiquities, full of green mold, and if they burst it was sometimes short in the air and sometimes grazing. However, he had no means of getting his ammunition away if things went wrong, so he blazed off at speed, shouting with laughter at this fashion of making war. And the tribesmen, seeing the commander so merry, took heart of grace themselves. By God, said one, those are the real guns, the importance of their noise. Racim swore that the Turks were dying in heaps, and the Arabs charged forward warmly at his word. Things were going well, and Faisal had the hope of a decisive success when suddenly his left wing in the valley wavered, halted. Finally it turned its back on the enemy and retired tumultuously to the camping ground. Faisal, in the center, galloped to Racim and cried that the Juhena had broken and he was to save the guns. Racim yoked up the teams and trotted away. After him streamed the levies. Faisal and his household composed the rear, and in deliberate procession they moved down toward Jembo, leaving the Juhena under their leader, Sharif Abed al-Karim, my old guide, with the Turks on the battlefield. As I was still hearing of this sad end, and cursing with him the traitor Bedawi brothers, there was a stir about the door, and Abed al-Karim broke through the slaves, swung up to the dais, kissed Faisal's head rope in salutation, and sat down beside us. Faisal, with a gasping stare at him, said, How? And Abd al Karim explained their dismay at the sudden flight of Faisal, and how he with his brother and their gallant men had fought the Turks for the whole night, alone, without artillery, till the palm groves became untenable and they too had been driven back. His brother, with half the manhood of the tribe, was just entering the gate. The others had vanished up Wadi Yembo for water. And why did you retire to the campground behind us during the battle? asked Faisal. Only to make ourselves a cup of coffee, said Abd al Karim. We had fought from sunrise, and it was dusk. We were very tired and thirsty. Faisal and I lay back and laughed. Then we went to see what could be done to save the town. Yenbo, on the top of its flat reef of coral, rose perhaps twenty feet above the sea and was compassed by water on two sides. The other two sides looked over flat stretches of sand, soft in places, destitute of cover for miles, and with no fresh water upon them anywhere. In daylight, if defended by artillery and machine-gun fire, the place should be impregnable. The artillery was arriving every minute, for Boyle, as usual better than his word, had concentrated five ships on us in less than twenty-four hours. He put the monitor... M31, whose shallow draft fitted her for the job, in the end of the southeastern creek of the harbor, whence she could rake the probable direction of a Turkish advance with her six-inch guns. Crocker, her captain, was very anxious to let off those itching guns. The larger ships were moored to fire over the town at longer range, or to take the other flank from the northern harbor. The searchlights of Dufferin and M31 crossed on the plain beyond the town. The Arabs, delighted to count up the quantity of vessels in the harbor, were prepared to contribute their part to the night's entertainment. They gave us good hope there would be no further panic. But to reassure them fully, they needed some sort of rampart to defend, medieval fashion. So we took the crumbling, salt-riddled wall of the place, doubled it with a second, packed earth between the two, and raised them till our 16th-century bastions were rifle-proof at least, and probably proof against the Turkish mountain guns. Outside the bastions we put barbed wire, festooned between cisterns on the rain catchments beyond the walls. We dug in machine-gun nests in the best angles, and manned them with Faisal's regular gunners. The Egyptians, like everyone else given a place in the scheme, were gratifyingly happy. Garland, an ordnance officer lent us by the Sirdar, was engineer-in-chief and chief adviser. After sundown, the town quivered with suppressed excitement. So long as the day lasted, there had been shouts and joy shots and wild bursts of frenzy among the workmen. But when dark came, they went back to feed and a hush fell. 
Nearly everyone sat up that night. There was one alarm about 11 o'clock. Our outpost had met the enemy only three miles outside the town. Garland, with a crier, went through the few streets and called the garrison. They tumbled straight out and went to their places in dead silence, without a shot or a loose shout. The seamen on the minaret sent warning to the ships, whose combined searchlights began slowly to traverse the plain in complex intersections, drawing pencils of wheeling light across the flats which the attacking force must cross. However, no sign was made and no cause given us to open fire. Afterwards, we heard the Turks' hearts had failed them at the silence and the blaze of lighted ships from end to end of the harbour, with the eerie beams of the searchlights revealing the bleakness of the glasses they would have to cross. So they turned back, and that night, I believe, they lost their war. Personally, I was on the Suva, to be undisturbed, and sleeping splendidly at last. So I was grateful to the prudence of the enemy, as though we might perhaps have won a glorious victory, I was ready to give much more for just that eight hours on broken rest. End of chapter four. Chapter five of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 5. Faisal Strikes North. Colonel Wilson came up to Yembo to persuade us of the necessity of an immediate operation against Wej, the next port after Yembo going northward, and the point from which the Turks were threatening Faisal's rear. If we swung round at it suddenly the initiative would pass to us. Faisal was a fine, hot workman, wholeheartedly doing a thing when he had agreed to it. He pledged his word that he would go at once. So he and I sat down together on New Year's Day for consideration of what this move meant to us and to the Turks. Faisal suggested taking nearly all the Johanna to Wej with him and adding to them enough of the Harb and Billy, Atiba and Agail, to give the mass a many-tribe character. We wanted this march, which would be in its way a closing act of the war in northern Hejaz, to send a rumor through the length and breadth of western Arabia. Faisal was nervous over abandoning Yambo, hitherto his indispensable base in the second seaport of Hejaz, and when casting about for further expedients to distract the Turks from its occupation, we suddenly remembered Sidi Abdullah, he had some 5,000 irregulars, and a few guns, and machine guns. Faisal suggested that he move to Wadi Ais, a historic valley of springs which lay just 100 kilometers north of Medina, a direct threat on Fakhri's railway communications with Damascus. The proposal was obviously an inspiration, and we sent off Raja al Kalui at once to put it to Abdullah. So sure were we of his adopting it, that we urged Faisal to move away from Wadi Yambo, northward on the first stage to Wej, without waiting a reply. He agreed, and on January 3, 1917, we took the wide upper road through Wadi Masari for Owais, a group of wells about 15 miles to the north of Yambo. The hills were beautiful today. The rains of December had been abundant, and the warm sun after them had deceived the earth into believing it was spring so a thin grass had come up in all the hollows and flat places. The blades, single, straight, and very slender, shot up between the stones. If a man bent over from his saddle and looked downward, he would see no new color in the ground, but by looking forward and getting a distant slope at a flat angle with his eye, he could feel a lively mist of pale green here and there over the surface of slate blue and brown red rock. In places, the growth was strong, and our painstaking camels had become prosperous grazing on it. The starting signal went, but only for us in the Agil. The other units of the army, standing each man by his couched camel, lined up beside our road, and as Faisal came near, 
saluted him in silence. He called back cheerfully, Peace upon you, and each head shake returned the phrase. When we had passed, they mounted, taking the time from their chiefs, and so the forces behind us swelled, till there was a line of men and camels winding along the narrow pass towards the watershed, for as far back as the eye reached. Faisal's greetings had been the only sounds before we reached the crest of the rise, where the valley opened out and became a gentle forward slope of soft shingle and flint bedded in sand. But there, Ibn Dakil, the keen sheikh of Rus, who had raised this contingent of Agil two years before to aid Turkey, and had brought it over with him intact to the Sharif when the revolt came, dropped back a pace or two, marshaled our following into a broad column of ordered ranks, and made the drums strike up. Everyone burst out singing a full-throated song in honor of Amir Faisal and his family. The march became rather splendid and barbaric. First rode Faisal in white, then Sharaf at his right in red headcloth and henna-dyed tunic and cloak, myself on his left in white and scarlet, behind us three banners of faded crimson silk with gilt spikes, behind them the drummers playing a march, and behind them again the wild mass of twelve hundred bouncing camels of the bodyguard, packed as closely as they could move, the men in every variety of colored clothes and the camels nearly as brilliant in their trappings. We filled the valley to its banks with our flashing stream. The risk of the fall of Yembo while we hunted Wej was great, and it would be wise to empty it of stores. Boyle gave me an opportunity by signaling that Harding would be made available for transport. She was an Indian troop ship, and her lowest troop deck had great square ports along the water level. Captain Linbury opened these for us, and we stuffed straight in 8,000 rifles, 3 million rounds of ammunition, thousands of shells, quantities of rice and flour, a shed full of uniforms, two tons of high explosive, and all our petrol, pell-mell. It was like posting letters in a box. In no time, she had taken a 1,000 tons of stuff. Boyle came in, eager for news, he promised the Harding as depot ship throughout, to land food and water whenever needed, and this solved the main difficulty. The Navy were already collecting. Half the Red Sea fleet would be present. The Admiral was expected, and landing parties were being drilled on every ship. Everyone was dying white duck, khaki-colored, or sharpening bayonets, or practicing with rifles. I hoped silently, in their despite, that there would be no fighting. Faisal had nearly 10,000 men, enough to fill the whole Billy country with armed parties and carry off everything not too heavy or too hot. It was sure that we would take Wej. The fear was lest numbers of Faisal's hosts die of hunger or thirst on the way. However, the country to Umlej, halfway, was friendly. Nothing tragic could happen so far as that. Therefore, Faisal started on the very day that Abdullah replied welcoming the Ayas plan. The same day came news of my relief. Newcomb, the regular colonel being sent to Hejaz as chief of our military mission, had arrived in Egypt, and his two staff officers, Cox and Vickery, were actually on their way down the Red Sea to join this expedition. Boyle took me to Umlej in the Suva, and we went ashore to get the news. The sheikh told us that Faisal would arrive today at Bir al-Wahedi, the water supply, four miles inland. We sent up a message for him and then walked over to the fort which Boyle had shelled some months before from the fox. It was just a rubble barrack, and Boyle looked at the ruins and said, I'm rather ashamed of myself for smashing such a potty place. He was a very professional officer, alert, businesslike, and official sometimes a little intolerant of easygoing things and people. Red-haired men are seldom patient. Ginger Boyle, as they called him, was warm. While we were looking over the ruins, four grey ragged elders of the village came up and asked leave to speak. They said that some months before, a sudden two-funneled ship had come up and destroyed their fort. 
they were now required to rebuild it for the police of the Arab government. Might they ask the generous captain of this peaceable one-funneled ship for a little timber, or for other material help toward the restoration? Boyle was restless at their long speech and snapped at me. What is it? What do they want? I said, nothing. They were describing the terrible effect of the fox's bombardment. Boyle looked round him for a moment and smiled grimly. It's a fair mess. Next day, Vickery arrived. He was a gunner, and in his ten years' service in the Sudan had learned Arabic, both literary and colloquial, so well that he would quit us of all need of an interpreter. We arranged to go up with Boyle to Faisal's camp, to make the timetable for the attack, and after lunch, Englishmen and Arabs got to work and discussed the remaining march to Wedge. We decided to break the army into sections, and that these should proceed independently to our concentration place of Abu Zarabet in Hamd, after which there was no water before Wej. But Boyle agreed that the Harding should take station for a single night in Sherm Haban, supposed to be a possible harbour, and land twenty tons of water for us on the beach, so that was settled. For the attack on Wej, we offered Boyle an Arab landing party of several hundred Harb and Juhaina peasantry. He decided to put them on another deck of the many-stomached Harding. They, with the naval party, would land north of the town, where the Turks had no post to block a landing, and whence Wej and its harbour were best turned. Boyle would have at least six ships, with fifty guns to occupy the Turks' mines, and a seaplane ship to direct the guns. We would be at Abu Zarabet on the 20th of the month, at Haban for the Harding's water on the 22nd, and the landing party should go ashore at dawn on the 23rd, by which time our mounted men would have closed all roads of escape from the town. The news from Rabig was good, and the Turks had made no attempt to profit by the nakedness of Yembo. These were our hazards, and when Boyle's wireless set them at rest, we were mightily encouraged. Abdullah was almost in ice. We were halfway to Wej. The initiative had passed to the Arabs. I was so joyous that for a moment I forgot my self-control and said exultingly that in a year we would be tapping on the gates of Damascus. A chill came over the feeling in the tent and my hopefulness died. But it was not an impossible dream, for five months later I was in Damascus, and a year after that I was its de facto governor. The army at Bir el Waheda amounted to 5,100 camel riders and 5,300 men on foot, with four Krupp mountain guns and ten machine guns. And for transport, we had 380 baggage camels. Our start was set for January the 18th, just after noon, and punctually by lunchtime, Faisal's work was finished. After lunch, the tent was struck. We went to our camels, where they were couched in a circle, saddled and loaded, each held short by the slave, standing on its double foreleg. The kettle drummer, waiting beside Ibn Dakhil, who commanded the bodyguard, rolled his drum seven or eight times, and everything became still. We watched Faisal. He got up from his rug, on which he had been saying a last word to Abd al-Karim, caught the saddle pommels in his hands, put his knee on the side and said aloud, Make God your agent. The slave released the camel, which sprang up. When it was on its feet, Faisal passed his other leg across its back, swept his skirts and his cloak under him by a wave of the arm, and settled himself in the saddle. As his camel moved, we jumped for hours, and the whole mob rose together, some of the beasts roaring but the most quiet, as trained she-camels should be. They took their first abrupt steps, and we riders had quickly to hook our legs round the front cantles and pick up the head stalls to check the pace. We then looked where Faisal was and tapped our mounts' heads gently round and pressed them on the shoulders with our bare feet till they were in line beside him. Ibn Dakil came up, and after a glance at the country in the direction of march, passed a short order for the Agil to arrange themselves in wings out to right and left of us. There came a warning patter from the drums, 
and the poet of the right wing burst into strident song, a single invented couplet, a Faisal and the pleasures he would afford us at Wedge. The right wing listened to the verse intently, took it up and sang it together once, twice, and three times, with pride and self-satisfaction and derision. However, before they could brandish it a fourth time, the poet of the left wing broke out in extempore reply, in the same meter, in answering rhyme, and capping the sentiment. The left wing cheered it in a roar of triumph. The drums tapped again. The standard bearers threw out their great crimson banners, and the whole guard, right, left, and center, broke together into the rousing regimental chorus. I've lost Britain and I've lost Gaul. I've lost Rome and, worst of all, I've lost Lalligay. Only it was Nejed they had lost, and the women of the Ma'abda, and their future lay from Jidda towards Suez. Yet it was a good song, with a rhythmical beat which the camels loved. So they put down their heads, stretched their necks out far, and with lengthened pace shuffled forward musingly while it lasted. Our road today was easy for them, since it was over firm sand slopes, long, slowly rising waves of dunes, bareback but for scrub in the folds, or barren palm trees solitary in the moist depressions. Afterwards, in a broad flat, two horsemen came cantering across from the left to greet Faisal. I knew the first one, dirty old blear-eyed Muhammad Ali al-Bidawi, emir of the Juhayna. But the second looked strange. When he came nearer, I saw he was in khaki uniform, with a cloak to cover it and a silk headcloth and head rope much awry. He looked up, and there was Newcomb's red and peeling face, with straining eyes and vehement mouth, a strong, humorous grin between the jaws. He had arrived at Umlej this morning, and hearing we were only just off, had seized Sheikh Yusuf's fastest horse and galloped after us. I offered him my spare camel and an introduction to Faisal, whom he greeted like an old school friend, and at once they plunged into the midst of things, suggesting, debating, planning at lightning speed. Newcomb's initial velocity was enormous, and the freshness of the day and the life and happiness of the army gave inspiration to the march and brought the future bubbling out of us without pain. The route was not easy to decide with the poor help of the Musa Juhena, our informants. They seemed to have no unit of time smaller than the half-day, or of distance between the span and the stage, and the stage might be from six to sixteen hours, according to the man's will and camel. Intercommunication between our units was hindered, because often there was no one who could read or write in either. Delay, confusion, hunger, and thirst marred this expedition. These might have been avoided had time let us examine the route beforehand. The animals were without food for nearly three days, and the men marched the last fifty miles on half a gallon of water with nothing to eat. It did not in any way dim their spirit, and they trotted into Wedge gaily enough, hoarsely singing and executing mock charges. But Faisal said that another hot and barren midday would have broken both their speed and their energy. When business ended, Newcomb and I went off to sleep in the tent Faisal had lent us as a special luxury. Baggage conditions were so hard and important for us that we rich took pride in faring like the men who could not transport unnecessary things. And never before had I had a tent of my own. We pitched it at the very edge of a bluff of the foothills, a bluff no wider than the tent and rounded, so that the slope went straight down from the pegs of the door flap. There we found sitting and waiting for us Abd al Karim, the young Bedawi Sharif, wrapped up to the eyes in his headcloth and cloak, since the evening was chill and threatened rain. He had come to ask me for a mule with saddle and bridle. The smart appearance of our M.I. company in breeches and puttees and their fine new animals had roused his desire. I played with his eagerness and put him off, advancing a condition that he should ask me after our successful arrival at Wege, and with this he was content. We hungered for sleep 
and at last he rose to go. But chancing to look across the valley, saw the hollows beneath and about us, winking with the faint campfires of the scattered contingents. He called me out to look, and swept his arm round, saying, half sadly, We are no longer Arabs, but a people. During the morning, it rained persistently, and we were glad to see more water coming to us, and so comfortable in the tents at Semna that we delayed our start till the sun shone again in the early afternoon. Then we rode westward down the valley in the fresh light. First behind us came the Agil. After them, Abd al-Karim led his Gufa men, about seven hundred of them mounted, with more than that number following afoot. They were dressed in white, with large head shawls of red and black striped cotton, and they waved green palm branches instead of banners. Next to them rode Sharif Muhammad Ali Abu Sharain, an old patriarch with a long curling grey beard and an upright carriage of himself. His three hundred riders were Ashraf of the Ayaishi Juhaina stock, known Sharifs but only acknowledged in the mass, since they had not inscribed pedigrees. They wore rusty red tunics, henna dyed, under black cloaks, and carried swords. Each had a slave crouched behind him on the crupper to help him with rifle and dagger in the fight, and to watch his camel and cook for him on the road. The slaves, as befitted slaves of poor masters, were very little dressed. Their strong black legs gripped the camel's woolly sides as in a vice, to lessen the shocks inevitable on their bony perches while they had knotted up their rags of shirts into the plaited tong about their loins, to save them from the fouling of the camels and their staling on the march. Semna water was medicinal, and our animals' dung flowed like green soup down their hawks that day. Behind the Ashraf came the crimson banner of our last tribal detachment, the Rifa'a under Audi ibn Zuwaid, the old wheedling sea pirate who had robbed the Stutzingen mission and thrown their wireless and their Indian servants into the sea at Yembo. The sharks presumably refused the wireless, but we had spent fruitless hours dragging for it in the harbor. Audi still wore a long, rich, fur-lined German officer's greatcoat, a garment little suited to the climate, but as he insisted, magnificent booty. He had about a thousand men, three-quarters of them on foot, and next him marched Racim, the gunner commandant, with his four old crook guns on the pack mules, just as we had lifted them from the Egyptian army. Rasim was a sardonic Damascene, who rose laughing to every crisis and slunk about sore-headed with grievances when things went well. On this day, there were dreadful murmurings, for alongside him rode Abdullah al Dalemi, in charge of machine guns, a quick, clever, superficial but attractive officer, much of the professional type, whose great joy was to develop some rankling sorrow in Racim, till it discharged full blast on Faisal or myself. Today, I helped him by smiling to Racim that we were moving at intervals of a quarter day, in echelon of sub-tribes. Racim looked over the new-washed underwood, where raindrops glistened in the light of the sun setting redly across the waves below a ceiling of clouds, and looked too at the wild mob of Bedouins, racing here and there on foot after birds, and rabbits, and giant lizards, and jerboas, and one another, and assented sourly, saying that he too would shortly become a sub-tribe and echelon himself half a day to one side or other, and be quit of flies. At first starting... A man in the crowd had shot a hare from the saddle, but because of the risk of wild shooting, Faisal had then forbidden it, and those later put up by our camel's feet were chased with sticks. We laughed at the sudden commotion in the marching companies, cries and camels swerving violently, their riders leaping off and laying out wildly with their canes to kill, or be pickers up of a kill. Faisal was happy to see the army win so much meat, but disgusted at the shameless Johanna appetite for lizards and jerboas. We rode over the flat sand among the thorn trees, which here were plentiful and large, till we came out on the sea beach and turned northward along a broad, well-beaten track, the Egyptian pilgrim road. 
It ran within 50 yards of the sea, and we could go up at 30 or 40 singing files abreast. An old lava bed, half buried in sand, jutted out from the hills four or five miles inland and made a promontory. The road cut across this, but at the near side were some mud flats, on which shallow reaches of water burned in the last light of the west. This was our expected stage, and Faisal signaled the halt. We got off our camels and stretched ourselves, sat down or walked before supper to the sea and bathed by hundreds, a splashing, screaming mob of fish-like naked men of all earth's colors. Supper was to look forward to, as a Juhani that afternoon had shot a gazelle for Faisal. Gazelle meat was found better than any other in the desert, because this beast, however barren the land and dry the water holes, seemed to own always a fat, juicy body. Next day, we rode easily. The journey was pleasant, for it was cool. There were a lot of us, and we two Englishmen had a tent in which we could shut ourselves up and be alone. A weariness of the desert was the living always in company, each of the party hearing all that was said and seeing all that was done by the others, day and night. To have privacy, as Newcomb and I had, was ten thousand times more restful than the open life, but the work suffered by the creation of such a bar between leaders and men. Among the Arabs there were no distinctions, traditional or natural, except the unconscious power given a famous sheikh by virtue of his accomplishment. And they taught me that no man could be their leader, except he ate the ranks food, wore their clothes, lived level with them, and yet appeared better in himself. In the morning, we pressed toward Abu Zarebat, over a sweeping fall of bare black gravel. Once, we halted and began to feel that a great depression lay in front of us. But not till two in the afternoon, after we had crossed a basalt outcrop, did we look out over a trough fifteen miles across, which was Wadi Hamt, escaped from the hills. To our eyes, sated with small things, it was a fair sight, this end of a dry river longer than the Tigris, the greatest valley in Arabia, first understood by Doughty and as yet unexplored. Full of expectation, we rode down the gravel slopes on which tufts of grass became more frequent, till at three o'clock we entered the wadi itself, a bed about a mile wide, filled with clumps of asla bushes, round which clung sandy hillocks each a few feet high. Their sand was not pure, but seamed with lines of dry and brittle clay, last indications of old flood levels. These divided them sharply into layers, rotten with salty mud and flaking away, so that our camels sank in, fetlock deep, with a crunching noise like breaking pastry. The dust rose up in thick clouds, thickened yet more by the sunlight held in them, for the dead air of the hollow was a dazzle. The ranks behind could not see where they were going, which was difficult for them, as the hillocks came closer together and the riverbed split into a maze of shallow channels the work of partial floods year after year. Before we gained the middle of the valley, everything was overgrown by brushwood, which sprouted sideways from the mounds and laced one to another with tangled twigs, as dry, dusty, and brittle as old bone. We tucked in the streamers of our gaudy saddlebags to prevent their being jerked off by the bushes, drew cloaks tight over our clothes, bent our heads down to guard our eyes, and crashed through like a storm amongst reeds. The dust was blinding and choking, and the snapping of the branches, grumbles of the camels, shouts and laughter of the men, made a rare adventure. Before we quite reached the far bank, the ground suddenly cleared at a clay bottom, in which stood a deep brown water pool, eighty yards long and about fifteen yards wide. This was the flood water of Abu Zarabat, our goal. We went a few yards further, through the last scrub, and reached the open north bank where Faisal had appointed the camp. So we stopped our camels, and the slaves unloaded them and set up the tents. While we walked back to see the mules, thirsty after their long day's march, rush with the foot soldiers into the pond, kicking and splashing with pleasure in the sweet water. The abundance of fuel was an added happiness, 
and in whatever place they chose to camp, each group of friends had a roaring fire. Very welcome, as a wet evening mist rose eight feet out of the ground, and their woolen cloaks stiffened and grew cold with its silver beads and their coarse wool. It was a black night, moonless, but above the fog very brilliant with stars. On a little mound near our tents, we collected and looked over the rolling white seas of fog. Out of it rose tent peaks and tall spires of melty smoke, which became luminous underneath when the flames licked higher into the clean air, as if driven by the noises of the unseen army. Old Audi ibn Zuwaid corrected me gravely when I said this to him, telling me, It is not an army, it is a world which is moving on wedge. I rejoiced at his insistence, for it had been to create this very feeling that we had hampered ourselves with an unwieldy crowd of men on so difficult a march. Then, without warning or parade, Sharif Nasir of Medina came in. Faisal leaped up, embraced him, and led him over to us. Nasir made a splendid impression, much as we had heard, and much as we were expecting of him. He was the opener of roads, the forerunner of Faisal's movement, the man who had fired his first shot in Medina and who was to fire our last shot at Muslimia beyond Aleppo on the day that Turkey asked for an armistice. And from beginning to end, all that could be told of him was good. He was a man of gardens whose lot had been unwilling war since boyhood. He was now about 27. His low, broad forehead matched his sensitive eyes while his weak, pleasant mouth and small chin were clearly seen through a clipped black beard. We slept late the following day, to brace ourselves for the necessary hours of talk. Faisal carried most of this upon his own shoulders. Nasir supported him as second in command, and the Bedawi brothers sat by to help. The day was bright and warm, threatening to be hot later, and Newcomb and I wandered about looking at the watering, the men, and the constant affluence of newcomers. We were already two days behind our promise to the Navy, and Newcomb decided to ride ahead this night to Haban. There, he would meet Boyle and explain that we must fail the Harding at the rendezvous, but would be glad if she could return there on the evening of January the 24th, when we should arrive much in need of water. He would also see if the naval attack could not be delayed till the 25th to preserve the joint scheme. In the morning, early, we marched in a straggle for three hours down Wadi Hamd. Then the valley went to the left, and we struck out across a hollow, desolate, featureless region. Today was cold. A hard north wind drove into our faces down the grey coast. As we marched, we heard intermittent heavy firing from the direction of Wedge, and feared that the Navy had lost patience and were acting without us. However, we could not make up the days we had wasted, so we pushed on for the whole dull stage, crossing affluent after affluent of Hamd. The plain was striped with these wadis, all shallow and straight and bare, as many and as intricate as the veins in a leaf. At last, we re-entered Hamd at Kurna, and though its clay bottoms held only mud, decided to camp. While we were settling in, there was a sudden rush, Camels had been seen pasturing away to the east, and the energetic of the Johanna streamed out, captured them, and drove them in. Faisal was furious and shouted to them to stop, but they were too excited to hear him. He snatched his rifle and shot at the nearest man, who in fear tumbled out of his saddle so that the others checked their course. Faisal had them up before him, laid about the principals with his camel stick, and impounded the stolen camels and those of the thieves till the whole tally was complete. Then he handed the beast back to their billy owners. Had he not done so, it would have involved a private war with the local people, our allies of the morrow, and might have checked extension beyond Wedge. Our success lay in bond to such trifles. Next morning, we made for the beach and up at Tahaban at four o'clock. The Harding was duly there to our relief, and landing water, although the shallow bay gave little shelter and the rough sea rolling in made boat work hazardous. We reserved first call for the mules and gave what water was left to the more thirsty of the footmen, 
but it was a difficult night, and crowds of suffering men lingered jostling about the tanks in the rays of the searchlight, hoping for another drink if the sailors should venture in again. I went on board and heard that the naval attack had been carried out as though the land army were present, since Boyle feared that the Turks would run away if he waited. As a matter of fact, the day we reached Abu Zarabat, Ahmed Tufik Bey, Turkish governor, had addressed the garrison, saying that Wej must be held to the last drop of blood. Then at dusk, he had got onto his camel and ridden off to the railway, with the few mounted men fit for flight. The two hundred infantry determined to do his abandoned duty against the landing party, but they were outnumbered three to one, and the naval gunfire was too heavy to let them make proper use of their positions. So far as the Harding knew, the fighting was not ended, but Weij town had been occupied by seamen and Arabs. Profitable rumors excited the army, which began to trickle off northward soon after midnight. At dawn, we rallied the various contingents and advanced in order, meeting a few scattered Turks, of whom one party put up a short resistance. The Agil dismounted to strip off their cloaks, headcloths, and shirts, and went on in brown half-nakedness, which they said would ensure clean wounds if they were hit. Also, their precious clothes would not be damaged. It was pretty to look at the neat brown men in the sunlit sandy valley, with the turquoise pool of salt water in the midst to set off the crimson banners, which two standard bearers carried in the van. They went along in a steady lope, covering the ground at nearly six miles an hour, dead silent, and reached and climbed the ridge without a shot fired, so we knew the work had been finished for us by the Navy and its landing parties. End of chapter 5「the yet hot authorities promised gold, rifles, mules, more machine guns, and mountain guns. But these last, of course, we never got. The gun question was an eternal torment. It was maddening to be unequal to many enterprises and to fail in others, for the technical reason that we could not keep down the Turkish artillery, because its guns outranged ours by three or four thousand yards. We received a great reinforcement to our cause in Ja'afar Pasha, a Baghdadi officer from the Turkish army. After distinguished service in the German and Turkish armies, he had been chosen by Enver to organize the levies of the Sheikh el Senussi. He went there by submarine, made a decent force of the wild men, and showed tactical ability against the British in two battles. Then he was captured and lodged in the citadel at Cairo with the other officer prisoners of war. He escaped one night, slipping down a blanket rope towards the moat. But the blankets failed under the strain, and in the fall he hurt his ankle, and was retaken, helpless. In hospital he gave his parole and was enlarged after paying for the torn blanket. But one day he read in an Arabic newspaper of the Sharif's revolt, and of the execution by the Turks of prominent Arab nationalists, his friends, and realized that he had been on the wrong side. Faisal had heard of him, of course, and wanted him as commander-in-chief of his regular troops, whose improvement was now our main effort. In Cairo were Hogarth and George Lloyd, Storrs and Didas, and many old friends. Beyond them, the circle of Arabian well-wishers was now strangely increased. Sir Archibald Murray realized with a sudden shock that more Turkish troops were fighting the Arabs than were fighting him, and began to remember how he had always favored the Arab revolt. Admiral Weymouth was as ready to help now as he had been in our hard days around Rabig. Sir Reginald Wingate, High Commissioner in Egypt, 
was happy in the success of the work he had advocated for years. I grudged him this happiness, for McMahon, who took the actual risk of starting it, had been broken just before prosperity began. I returned to Wedge, where life was interesting. We had now set our camp in order. Faisal pitched his tents, here an opulent group, living tents, reception tents, staff tents, guest tents, servants, about a mile from the sea, on the edge of the coral shelf which ran up gently from the beach, till it ended in a steep drop facing east and south over broad valleys, radiating starlight from the landlocked harbour. The tents of soldiers and tribesmen were grouped in these sandy valleys, leaving the chill height for ourselves, and very delightful in the evening we northerners found it, when the breeze from the sea carried us a murmur of the waves, faint and far off, like the echo of traffic up a by-street in London. Immediately beneath us were the Aguil, an irregular close group of tents. South of these were Racim's artillery, and by him for company, Abdullah's machine gunners, in regular lines, with their animals picketed out in those formal rows, which were incense to the professional officer, and convenient if space were precious. Further out, the market was set plainly on the ground, a boiling swell of men always about the goods. The scattered tents and shelters of the tribesmen filled each gully or windless place. Beyond the last of them lay open country, with camel parties coming in and out by the straggling palms of the nearest, too brackish well. As background were the foothills, reefs, and clusters, like ruined castles, thrown up craggily to the horizon of the coastal range. As it was the custom in Wedge to camp wide apart, very wide apart, my life was spent in moving back and forth to Faisal's tents, to the English tents, to the Egyptian army tents, to the town, the port, the wireless station, tramping all day restlessly up and down these coral paths in sandals or barefoot, hardening my feet, getting by slow degrees the power to walk with little pain over sharp and burning ground, tempering my already trained body for greater endeavor. Poor Arabs wondered why I had no mare, and I forbore to puzzle them by incomprehensible talk of hardening myself, or confess that I would rather walk than ride, for sparing of animals. Yet the first was true, and the second true. Something hurtful to my pride, disagreeable, rose at the sight of these lower forms of life. Their existence struck a servile reflection upon our human kind, the style on which a god would look on us, and to make use of them, to lie under an avoidable obligation to them, seemed to me shameful. It was as with the Negroes, Tom Tom playing themselves to red madness each night under the ridge. Their faces, being clearly different from our own, were tolerable. But it hurt that they should possess exact counterparts of all our bodies. Faisal, within, labored day and night at his politics, in which so few of us could help. Outside, the crowd employed and diverted us with parades, joy-shooting, and marches of victory. Also, there were accidents. Once a group, playing behind our tents, set off a seaplane bomb, dud relic of Boyle's capture of the town. In the explosion, their limbs were scattered about the camp, marking the canvas with red splashes, which soon turned a dull brown and then faded pale. Faisal had the tents changed and ordered the bloody ones to be destroyed. The frugal slaves washed them. Another day, a tent took fire and part roasted three of our guests. The camp crowded round and roared with laughter till the fire died down. And then, rather shamefacedly, we cared for their hurts. The third day, a mare was wounded by a falling joy bullet, and many tents were pierced. One night, the Aguil mutinied against their commandant, Ibn Dakil, for fining them too generally and flogging them too severely. They rushed his tent, howling and shooting, threw his things about and beat his servants. 
that not being enough to blunt their fury, they began to remember Yembo and went off to kill the Atiba. Faisal, from our bluff, saw their torches and ran barefoot amongst them, laying on with the flat of his sword like four men. His fury delayed them while the slaves and horsemen, calling for help, dashed downhill with rushes and shouts and blows of sheathed swords. One gave him a horse on which he charged down the ringleaders, while we dispersed groups by firing very lights into their clothing. Only two were killed and thirty wounded. Ibn Dakil resigned next day. Fakri Pasha was still playing our game. He held an entrenched line around Medina, just far enough out to make it impossible for the Arabs to shell the city. Such an attempt was never made or imagined. The other troops were being distributed along the railway, in strong garrisons at all water stations between Medina and Tabuk, and in smaller posts between these garrisons, so that daily patrols might guarantee the track. In short, he had fallen back on as stupid a defensive as could be conceived. Garland had gone southeast from Wej, and Newcomb northeast, to pick holes in it with high explosives. They would cut rails and bridges and place automatic mines for running trains. The Arabs had passed from doubt to violent optimism and were promising exemplary service. Faisal enrolled most of the Billy, who made him master of Arabia between the railway and the sea. He then sent the Juhayna to Abdullah in Wadi Ais. He could now prepare to deal solemnly with the Hejaz Railway but I begged him first to delay in Wej and set marching an intense movement among the tribes beyond us, that in the future our revolt might be extended and the railway threatened from Tabuk, our present limit of influence, northward as far as Maan. With his northern neighbors, the coastal Hawetat, he had already made a beginning, but we now sent to the Beni Etie, a stronger people to the northeast, the chief Asi ibn Atiye came in and swore allegiance. He gave us freedom of movement across his tribe's territory. Beyond lay various tribes owning obedience to Nuri Sha'alan, the great emir of the Ru'ala, who after the Sharif and Ibn Sa'd and Ibn Rashid was the fourth figure among the precarious princes of the desert. Nuri was an old man who had ruled his Anaze tribesmen for thirty years. His was the chief family of the Ru'ala. But Nuri had no precedence among them at birth, nor was he loved, nor a great man of battle. His headship had been acquired by sheer force of character. To gain it, he had killed two of his brothers. Later, he had added Shararat and others to the number of his followers. And in all their desert, his word was absolute law. He had none of the wheedling diplomacy of the ordinary sheikh, a word, and there was an end of opposition, or of his opponent. All feared and obeyed him. To use his roads, we must have his countenance. Fortunately, this was easy. Faisal had secured it years ago, and had retained it by interchange of gifts from Medina and Yembo. Now from Wej, Faiz al Gusain went up to him, and on the way crossed Ibn Dugmi, one of the chief men of the Ru'ala, coming down to us with the desirable gift of some hundreds of good baggage camels. Nuri, of course, still kept friendly with the Turks. Damascus and Baghdad were his markets, and they could have half-starved his tribe in three months had they suspected him. But we knew that when the moment came, we should have his armed help, and till then anything short of a breach with Turkey. His favor would open to us the Sirhan, a famous roadway, camping ground, and chain of water holes, which in a series of linked depressions extended from Jauf, Nori's capital in the southeast, northwards to Azraq, near Jebel Druze in Syria. It was the freedom of the Sirhan we needed to reach the tents of the eastern Hawitat, those famous Abu Taye, of whom Auda, the greatest fighting man in northern Arabia, was chief. Only by means of Auda Abu Taye could we swing the tribes from Ma'an to Aqaba so violently in our favor that they would help us take Aqaba and its hills from their Turkish garrisons. Only with his active support could we venture to thrust out from Wej on the long trek to Ma'an. 
Since our Yembo days, we had been longing for him and trying to win him to our cause. We made a great step forward at Wej. Ibn Za'al, his cousin and a war leader of the Abu Taye, arrived on the 17th of February, which was in all respects a fortunate day. At dawn, there came in five chief men of the Shararat, from the desert east of Tabuk, bringing a present of eggs of the Arabian ostrich, plentiful in their little frequented desert. After them, the slaves showed in Daif Allah, Abu Tir, a cousin of Habd ibn Jazi, paramount of the central Hawaitat of the Ma'an Plateau. These were numerous and powerful, splendid fighters, but blood enemies of their cousins, the nomad Abu Tayyi, because of an old grounded quarrel between Auda and Hamd. We were proud to see them coming thus far to greet us, yet not content, for they were less fit than the Abu Tayyi for our purposed attack against Aqaba. On their heels came a cousin of Nawaf, Nuri Sha'alan's eldest son, with a mare sent by Nawaf to Faisal. The Sha'alan and the Jazi, being hostile, hardened eyes at one another, so we divided the parties and improvised a new guest camp. After the Ru'ala was announced the Abu Tagega chief of the sedentary Hawatat of the coast. He brought his tribe's respectful homage and the spoils of Daba and Moweli, the last two Turkish outlets on the Red Sea. Room was made for him on Faisal's carpet, and the warmest thanks rendered him for his tribe's activity, which carried us to the borders of Aqaba, by tracks too rough for operations of force, but convenient for preaching, and still more so for getting news. In the afternoon, Ibn Zal arrived, with ten other of Auda's chief followers. He kissed Faisal's hand once for Auda, and then once for himself, and sitting back declared that he came from Auda to present his salutations, and to ask for orders. Faisal, with policy, controlled his outward joy, and introduced him gravely to his blood enemies, the Jazi Hawatat. Ibn Zal acknowledged them distantly. Later, we held great private conversations with him and dismissed him with rich gifts, richer promises, and Faisal's own message to Auda that his mind would not be smooth till he had seen him face to face in Wej. Auda was an immense, chivalrous name, but an unknown quantity to us, and in so vital a matter as Aqaba, we could not afford a mistake. He must come down that we might weigh him, and frame our future plans actually in his presence, and with his help. When the sun had declined across the sea, and the cool of evening drew down, a great cavalcade issued from the ridges masking Abu Zarebat, and closed on us. Forth from its front at wild speed shot three or four mounted specks, crossing each other's in their own tracks in mimic battle, while the main body began to chant a deep Ataba melody. This was Sharif Shakir, my astonishment of Jeddah, coming attended to visit Faisal from Sharif Abdullah's camp at Wadi Ais, near Medina. Shakir was a prince in the eyes of the great Atiba tribe, to whom his riding, the man was a very centaur on horseback, his shooting, his bravery, his recklessness, his wealth, were alike wonderful. In return, Shakir played the Badawi. His simple clothes, simple living, his arts and manners were all nomadic. Even his appearance, from the horny feet to the braided hair, and the hair was Bedouin also in its population. Only a niggard, laughed Shakir, would want his whole head to himself. Except that all its events were happy, this day was not essentially unlike Faisal's every day. The rush of news made my diary fat. The roads to Wej swarmed with envoys and volunteers and great sheikhs riding in to swear allegiance. The contagion of their constant passage made the lukewarm billy even more profitable to us. Faisal swore new adherence, solemnly, on the Quran between his hands, to wait while he waited march when he marched, to yield obedience to no Turk, to deal kindly with all who spoke Arabic, whether Baghdadi, Aleppine, Syrian, or pure-blooded, and to put independence above life, 
family, and goods. He also began to confront them at once, in his presence, with their tribal enemies, and to compose their feuds. An account of profit and loss would be struck between the parties, with Faisal modulating and interceding between them, and often paying the balance, or contributing towards it from his own funds, to hurry on the pact. During two years, Faisal so labored daily, putting together and arranging in their natural order the innumerable tiny pieces which made up Arabian society, and combining them into his one design of war against the Turks. There was no blood feud left active in any of the districts through which he had passed, and he was court of appeal, ultimate and unchallenged, for Western Arabia. He showed himself worthy of this achievement. He never gave a partial decision, nor a decision so impracticably just that it must lead to disorder. No Arab ever impugned his judgments or questioned his wisdom and competence in tribal business. By patiently sifting out right and wrong, by his tact, his wonderful memory, he gained authority over the nomads from Medina to Damascus and beyond. He was recognized as a force transcending tribe, superseding blood chiefs, greater than jealousies. The Arab movement became, in the best sense, national, since within it all Arabs were at one, and for it private interests must be set aside. And in this movement, chief place by right of application and by right of ability, had been properly earned by the man who had filled it for those few weeks of triumph and longer months of disillusion, after Damascus had been set free. The Bedou were odd people. For an Englishman, sojourning with them was unsatisfactory unless he had patience wide and deep as the sea. They were absolute slaves of their appetite, with no stamina of mind, drunkards for coffee, milk, or water, gluttons for stewed meat, shameless beggars of tobacco. They dreamed for weeks before and after their rare sexual exercises, and spent the intervening days titillating themselves and their hearers with body tales. Had the circumstances of their lives given them opportunity, they would have been sheer sensualists. Their strength was the strength of men geographically beyond temptation. The poverty of Arabia made them simple, continent, enduring. If forced into civilized life, they would have succumbed like any savage race to its diseases. Meanness, luxury, cruelty, crooked dealing, artifice, and like savages, they would have suffered them exaggeratedly for lack of inoculation. If they suspected that we wanted to drive them, either they were mulish or they went away. If we comprehended them and gave time and trouble to make things tempting to them, then they would go to great pains for our pleasure. Whether the results achieved were worth the effort, no man could tell. Englishmen, accustomed to greater returns, would not, and indeed could not, have spent the time, thought, and tact, lavished every day by sheikhs and emirs for such meager ends. Arab processes were clear. Arab minds moved logically as our own, with nothing radically incomprehensible or different, except the premises. There was no excuse or reason, except our laziness and ignorance, whereby we could call them inscrutable or oriental, or leave them misunderstood. Militarily, we were now firmly assured in Wege. Allenby sent us down two Rolls-Royce armored cars, veterans of General Smut's campaign in German East Africa. Their officers and crews were English and enterprising. They began to learn the arts of sand driving. Yembo was emptied of its last soldiers and stores. Rabig also was being abandoned. The airplanes from it had flown up here and were established. Their Egyptian troops had been shipped after them, with Joyce and Goslett and the Rabig staff, who were now in charge of things at Wej. Newcomb and Hornby were up country, tearing at the railway day and night, almost with their own hands. All seemed already for the best, when one afternoon Suleiman, the guest master, hurried in and whispered to Faisal, who turned to me with shining eyes, trying to be calm, and said, Auda is here. I shouted, Auda Abu Tayi, and at that moment the tent flap was drawn back, 
before a deep voice which booms salutations to our Lord, the commander of the faithful. There entered a tall, strong figure with a haggard face, passionate and tragic. This was Auda, and after him followed Muhammad, his son, a child in looks and only eleven years old in truth. Faisal had sprung to his feet. Auda caught his hand and kissed it, and they drew aside a pace or two and looked at each other. A splendid, unlike pair, typical of much that was best in Arabia, Faisal the prophet and Auda the warrior, each filling his part to perfection and immediately understanding and liking the other. They sat down. Faisal introduced us one by one, and Auda with a measured word seemed to register each person. We had heard much of Auda and were banking to open Aqaba with his help, and after a moment I knew, from the force and directness of the man, that we would attain our end. He had come down to us like a knight errant, chafing at our delay in wedge, anxious only to be acquiring merit for Arab freedom in his own lands. If his performance was one half his desire, we should be prosperous and fortunate. The weight was off all minds before we went to supper. We were a cheerful party, Nasib, Faiz, Muhammad al Dalan, Auda's politic cousin, Zal, his nephew, and Sharif Nasir, resting in Wej for a few days between expeditions. I told Faisal odd stories of Abdullah's camp and the joy of breaking railways. Suddenly, Auda scrambled to his feet with a loud, God forbid, and flung from the tent. We stared at one another, and there came a noise of hammering outside. I went after to learn what it meant, and there was Auda bent over a rock, pounding his false teeth to fragments with a stone. I had forgotten, he explained. Jemal Pasha gave me these. I was eating my lord's bread with Turkish teeth. Unfortunately, he had few teeth of his own, so that henceforward, eating the meat he loved was difficulty and after, pain. And he went about half-nourished till we had taken Aqaba, and Sir Reginald Wingate sent him a dentist from Egypt to make an allied set. Auda was very simply dressed, northern fashion, in white cotton with a red Mosul headcloth. He might be over fifty, and his black hair was streaked with white, but he was still strong and straight, loosely built, spare, and as active as a much younger man. His face was magnificent in its lines and hollows. On it was written how truly the death and battle of Anad, his favorite son, cast sorrow over all his life when it ended his dream of handing on to future generations the greatness of the name of Abu Tayyi. He had large, eloquent eyes, like black velvet in richness. His forehead was low and broad, his nose very high and sharp, powerfully hooked, his mouth rather large and mobile. His beard and mustaches had been trimmed to a point in Hawitat style, with the lower jaw shaven underneath. Centuries ago, the Hawitat came from Hajaz, and their nomad clans prided themselves on being true Bedu. Auda was their master type. His hospitality was sweeping, except to very hungry souls, inconvenient. His generosity kept him always poor, despite the profits of a hundred raids. He had married twenty-eight times, had been wounded thirteen times. Whilst the battles he provoked had seen all his tribesmen hurt and most of his relations killed, he himself had slain seventy-five men, Arabs, with his own hand in battle and never a man except in battle. Of the number of dead Turks he could give no account. They did not enter the register. His Tuweha under him had become the first fighters of the desert, with a tradition of desperate courage, a sense of superiority which never left them while there was life and work to do, but which had reduced them from 1,200 men to less than 500 in 30 years as the standard of nomadic fighting rose. Auda raided as often as he had opportunity, and as widely as he could. He had seen Aleppo, Basra, Wej, and Wadi Dawasir on his expeditions, and was careful to be at enmity with nearly all tribes in the desert, that he might have proper scope for raids. After his robber fashion, he was as hard-headed as he was hot-headed, 
and in his maddest exploits there would be a cold factor of possibility to lead him through. His patience in action was extreme, and he received and ignored advice, criticism, or abuse with a smile as constant as it was very charming. If he got angry, his face worked uncontrollably, and he burst into a fit of shaking passion, only to be assuaged after he had killed. At such times, he was a wild beast, and men escaped his presence. Nothing on earth would make him change his mind, or obey an order, or do the least thing he disapproved, and he took no heed of men's feelings when his face was set. He saw life as a saga. All the events in it were significant, all personages in contact with him heroic. His mind was stored with poems of old raids and epic tales of fights, and he overflowed with them on the nearest listener. If he lacked listeners, he would very likely sing them to himself in his tremendous voice, deep and resonant and loud. He had no control over his lips, and was therefore terrible to his own interests and hurt his friends continually. He spoke of himself in the third person, and was so sure of his fame that he loved to shout out stories against himself. At times, he seemed taken by a demon of mischief, and in public assembly would invent and utter on oath appalling tales of the private life of his hosts or guests. And yet with all this he was modest, as simple as a child, direct, honest, kind-hearted, and warmly loved, even by those to whom he was most embarrassing, his friends. The long pause after Wedge fell had an important effect on my mind, for I was sent on detached duty and had solitude for thinking, in a remote point from which to regard our activities. Every effort was still directed against the railway. Newcomb and Garland were near Muadam, with Sharif Sharaf and Maulud. They had many Billy, the mule-mounted infantry, and guns, and machine guns, and hoped to take the ford and railway station there. Newcomb meant them to move all Faisal's men forward very close to Madey and Sali, and by taking and holding a part of the line, to cut off Medina and compel its early surrender. Wilson was coming up to help in this operation, and Davenport would take as many of the Egyptian army as he could transport to reinforce the Arab attack. All this program was what I had believed necessary for the further progress of the Arab revolt when we took Wej. I had planned and arranged some of it myself. But now, to my leisure, it seemed that not merely the details, but the essence of this plan were wrong. It therefore became my business to explain my changed ideas, and if possible, to persuade my chiefs to follow me into the new theory. So I began with three propositions. Firstly, that irregulars would not attack places, and so remained incapable of forcing a decision. Secondly, that they were as unable to defend a line or point as they were to attack it. Thirdly, that their virtue lay in depth, not in face. The Arab war was geographical, and the Turkish army an accident. Our aim was to seek the enemy's weakest material link, and bear only on that till time made their whole length fail. Our largest resources, the Bedouin on whom our war must be built, were unused to formal operations, but had assets of mobility, toughness, self-assurance, knowledge of the country, intelligent courage. With them, dispersal was strength. Consequently, we must extend our front to its maximum, to impose on the Turks the longest possible passive defense, since that was, materially, their most costly form of war. Our duty was to attain our end with the greatest economy of life, since life was more precious to us than money or time. If we were patient and superhuman skilled, we could follow the direction of Saxe and reach victory without battle, by pressing our advantages, mathematical and psychological. Fortunately, our physical weakness was not such as to demand this. We were richer than the Turks in transport, machine guns, cars, high explosive. We could develop a highly mobile, highly equipped striking force of the smallest size and use it successively at distributed points of the Turkish line to make them strengthen their posts beyond the defensive minimum of 20 men. This would be a shortcut to success. We must not take Medina. 
the Turk was harmless there. In prison in Egypt, he would cost us food and guards. We wanted him to stay at Medina and every other distant place in the largest numbers. Our ideal was to keep his railway just working, but only just, with the maximum of loss and discomfort. The factor of food would confine him to the railways, but he was welcome to the Hejaz Railway and the Transjordan Railway and the Palestine and Syrian Railways for the duration of the war, so long as he gave us the other 999 thousandths of the Arab world. If he tended to evacuate too soon, as a step to concentrating in the small area which his numbers could dominate effectually, then we should have to restore his confidence by reducing our enterprises against him. His stupidity would be our ally, for he would like to hold, or to think he held, as much of his old provinces as possible. This pride in his imperial heritage would keep him in his present absurd position, all flanks and no front. In detail, I criticize the ruling scheme. To hold a middle point of the railway would be expensive, for the holding force might be threatened from each side. The mixture of Egyptian troops with tribesmen was a moral weakness. If there were professional soldiers present, the Bedouin would stand aside and watch them work, glad to be excused the leading part. Jealousy, superadded to inefficiency, would be the outcome. Further, the Billy country was very dry, and the maintenance of a large force up by the line technically difficult. Neither my general reasoning, however, nor my particular objections had much weight. The plans were made, and the preparations advanced. Everyone was too busy with his own work to give me specific authority to launch out on mine. All I gained was a hearing and a qualified admission that my counteroffensive might be a useful diversion. I was working out with Auda Abu Tayyi, a march to the Hawatat in their spring pastures of the Syrian desert. From them, we might raise a mobile camel force and rush Aqaba from the eastward without guns or machine guns. The eastern was the unguarded side, the line of least resistance, the easiest for us. Our march would be an extreme example of a turning movement, since it involved a desert journey of 600 miles to capture a trench within gunfire of our ships. But there was no practicable alternative. Auda thought all things possible, with dynamite and money, and that the smaller clans about Aqaba would join us. Faisal, who was already in touch with them, also believed that they would help if we won a preliminary success up by Ma'an, and then moved in force against the port. The Navy raided it while we were thinking, and their captured Turks gave us such useful information that I became eager to go off at once. End of chapter 6「all things were ready, and in the glare of mid-afternoon, we left Faisal's tent, his good wishes sounding after us from the hilltop as we marched away. Sharif Nasir led us, his lucent goodness made him the only leader and a benediction for forlorn hopes. Our short stage was to the ford at Sabail, inland Wej, where the Egyptian pilgrims used to water. We camped by their great brick tank, in shade of the fort's curtain wall, or of the palms, and put to rights the deficiencies which this first march had shown. Auda and his kinsmen were with us, also Nasib el Bekri, the politic Damascene, to represent Faisal to the villagers of Syria. Nasib had brains and position, and the character of a previous successful desert journey. His cheerful endurance of adventure, rare among Syrians, marked him out as our fellow as much as his political mind, his ability, his persuasive good-humoured eloquence, and the patriotism which often overcame his native passion for the indirect. Nasib chose Zeki, 
a Syrian officer, as his companion. For escort, we had thirty-five a gale, under Ibn de Gaithier, a man walled into his own temperament, remote, abstracted, self-sufficient. Faisal made up a purse of twenty thousand pounds in gold, all he could afford and more than we asked for, to pay the wages of the new men we hoped to enroll, and to make such advances as should stimulate the Hawitat to swiftness. My Agil, Mukamer, Murhan, Ali, had been supplemented by Mohammed, a blowsy, obedient peasant boy from some village in Horan, and by Gassim, of Man, a fanged and yellow-faced outlaw who fled into the desert to the Hawitat after killing a Turkish official in a dispute over cattle tax. Crimes against tax gatherers had a sympathetic aspect for all of us, and this gave Gassim a specious rumor of geniality, which actually was far from truth. After dark, we loaded up and started. Nasir, our guide, had grown to know this country nearly as well as he did his own. While we rode through the moonlit and starry night, his memory was dwelling very intimately about his home. He told me of their stone-paved house, whose sunk halls had vaulted roofs against the summer heat, and of the gardens planted with every kind of fruit tree, in shady paths about which they could walk at ease, mindless of the sun. He told me of the wheel over the well, with its machinery of leathern trip buckets, raised by oxen upon an inclined path of hard-trodden earth, and of how the water from its reservoir slid in concrete channels by the borders of the pass, or worked fountains in the court beside the great vine trellis swimming tank, lined with shining cement, within whose green depth he and his brother's household used to plunge at midday. Nasir, though usually merry, had a quick vein of suffering in him, and tonight he was wondering why he, an emir of Medina, rich and powerful and at rest in that garden palace, had thrown up all to become the weak leader of desperate adventures in the desert. For two years he had been outcast, always fighting beyond the front line of Faisal's armies, chosen for every particular hazard, the pioneer in each advance, and meanwhile the Turks were in his house, wasting his fruit trees and chopping down his palms. Even, he said, the great well which had sounded with the creak of the bullock wheels for six hundred years had fallen silent. The garden, cracked with heat, was becoming waste as the blind hills over which we rode. After four hours' march, we slept for two and rose with the sun. The baggage camels, weak with the cursed mange of Wej, moved slowly, grazing all day as they went. We riders, light-mounted, might have passed them easily, but Auda, who was regulating our marches, forbade, because of the difficulties in front, for which our animals would need all the fitness we could conserve in them. So we plodded soberly on for six hours in great heat. The summer sun in this country of white sand behind Wedge could dazzle the eyes cruelly, and the bare rocks each side our path threw off waves of heat which made our heads ache and swim. Consequently, by eleven of the forenoon, we were mutinous against Auda's wish still to hold on. So we halted and lay under trees till half-past two, each of us trying to make a solid though shifting shadow for himself by means of a doubled blanket caught across the thorns of overhanging boughs. We rode again after this break for three gentle hours over level bottoms, approaching the walls of a great valley, and found the green garden of Alcur lying just in front of us. White tents peeped from among the palms. While we dismounted, Rasim and Abdullah, Mahmoud the doctor, and even old Maulud, the cavalryman, came out to welcome us. They told us that Sharif Sharaf, whom we wished to meet at Abu Raga, our next stopping place, was away raiding for a few days. This meant that there was no hurry, so we made holiday at El Kerr for two nights. The inhabitant of Kerr, the only sedentary Baluwi, Hori Daif Allah, 
labored day and night with his daughters in the little terrace plot which he had received from his ancestors. It was built out of the south edge of the valley in a bay defended against flood by a massive wall of unhewn stone. In its midst opened the well of clear cold water, above which stood a balanced cantilever of mud and rude poles. By this, Daif Allah, morning and evening when the sun was low, drew up great bowls of water and spilled them into clay runnels, contrived through his garden among the tree roots. He grew low palms, for their spreading leaves shaded his plants from the sun, which otherwise might in that stark valley wither them, and raised young tobacco, his most profitable crop. With smaller plots of beans and melons, cucumbers and eggplants, in due season. The old man lived with his women in a brushwood hut beside the well, and was scornful of our politics, demanding what more to eat or drink these sore efforts and bloody sacrifices would bring. We gently teased him with notions of liberty, with freedom of the Arab countries for the Arabs. This garden, Daifala, should it not be your very own? However, he would not understand, but stood up to strike himself proudly on the chest, crying, I, I am Kerr. Still, we were grateful to him, for beside that he showed an example of contentment to us slaves of a necessary appetite, he sold vegetables, and on them, and on the tin bounty of Rasim and Abdullah and Mahmud, we lived richly. Each evening round the fires they had music, not the monotonous open-throated roaring of the tribes, nor the exciting harmony of the agail, but the falsetto quarter tones and trills of urban Syria. Maulud had musicians in his unit, and bashful soldiers were brought up each evening to play guitars and sing cafe songs of Damascus or the love verses of their villages. The soldier camp would grow dead silent till the stanza ended, and then from every man would come a sighing, longing echo of the last note. Only old Daif Allah went on splashing out his water, sure that after we had finished with our silliness, someone would yet need and buy his green stuff. To townsmen, this garden was a memory of the world before we went mad with war and drove ourselves into the desert. To Auda, there was an indecency of exhibition in the plant richness, and he longed for an empty view. So we cut short our second night in paradise, and at two in the morning went on up the valley. It was pitch dark, the very stars in the sky being unable to cast light into the depths where we were wandering. Auda was guide, and to make us sure of him, he lifted up his voice in an interminable Ho, 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 song of the Hawitat, an epic chanted on three bass notes, up and down, back and forward, in so round a voice that the words were indistinguishable. After a little, we thanked him for the singing, since the path went away to the left, and our long line followed his turn by the echoes of his voice, rolling about the torn black cliffs in the moonlight. We marched until the early sun, very trying to those who had ridden all night, opposed us. Breakfast was off our own flour, thus lightening at last, after days of hospitality, our poor camel's food load. Sharaf being not yet in Abu Raga, we made no more haste than water difficulties compelled, and after food, again put up our blanket roofs and lay till afternoon, fretfully dodging after their unstable shadow, getting moist with heat and the constant pricking of flies. In the morning, we rode at five. Our valley pinched together, and we went round a sharp spur, ascending steeply. The track became a bad goat path, zigzagging up a hillside too precipitous to climb except on all fours. We dropped off our camels and led them by the headstalls. Soon we had to help each other, a man urging the camels from behind, another pulling them from the front, encouraging them over the worst places, adjusting their loads to ease them. Parts of the track were dangerous, where rocks bulged out and narrowed it, so that the near half of the load grazed and forced the animals to the cliff edge. We had to repack the food and explosives, and in spite of all our care, 
lost two of our feeble camels in the pass. The Hawitat killed them where they lay broken, stabbing a keen dagger into the throat artery near the chest, while the neck was strained tight by pulling the head round to the saddle. They were at once cut up and shared out as meat. Then we came to the first break of surface, a sharp passage to the bottom of a shrub-grown sandy valley, on each side of which sandstone precipices and pinnacles, gradually growing in height as we went down, detached themselves sharply against the morning sky. We wound on, ever deeper into the earth until, half an hour later, by a sharp corner, we entered Wadi Jizl, a deep gorge some two hundred yards in width. Our camp was on some swelling dunes of weedy sand in an elbow of the valley, where a narrow cleft had set up a backwash and scooped out a basin in which a remnant of last winter's flood was caught. We sent a man for news up the valley to an oleander thicket where we saw the white peaks of Sharaf's tents. They expected him next day, so we passed two nights in this strange-colored echoing place. The brackish pool was fit for our camels, and in it we bathed at noon. Then we ate and slept generously, and wandered in the nearer valleys to see the horizontal stripes of pink and brown and cream and red, which made up the general redness of the cliffs, delighting in the varied patterns of thin pencilings of lighter or darker tint, which were drawn over the plain body of rock. One afternoon, I spent behind some shepherd's fold of sandstone blocks, in warm soft air and sunlight, with a low burden of the wind plucking at the rough wall top above my head. The valley was instinct with peace, and the wind's continuing noise made even it seem patient. My eyes were shut and I was dreaming, when a youthful voice made me see an anxious Ageli, a stranger, Daoud, squatting by me. He appealed for my compassion. His friend Faraj had burned their tent in a frolic, and Sa'ad, captain of Sharaf Sagil, was going to beat him in punishment. At my intercession he would be released. Sa'ad happened just then to visit me, and I put it to him, while Daoud sat watching us, his mouth slightly, eagerly open, his eyelids narrowed over large dark eyes, and his straight brows furrowed with anxiety. Daoud's pupils, set a little in front from the center of the eyeball, gave him an air of acute readiness. Sa'ad's reply was not comforting. The pair were always in trouble, and of late so outrageous in their tricks that Sharaf, the severe, had ordered an example to be made of them. All he could do for my sake was to let Daoud share the ordained sentence. Daoud leaped at the chance, kissed my hand and Saad's, and ran off up the valley, while Saad, laughing, told me stories of the famous pair. They were an instance of the eastern boy and boy affection which the segregation of women made inevitable. Such friendships often led to manly loves of a depth and force beyond our flesh-steeped conceit. When innocent, they were hot and unashamed. If sexuality entered, they passed into a give-and-take, unspiritual relation, like marriage. Next day, Sharaf did not come. Our morning passed with Auda talking of the march in front, while Nasir, with forefinger and thumb, flicked sputtering matches from the box across his tent at us. In the midst of our merriment, two bent figures, with pain in their eyes but crooked smiles upon their lips, hobbled up and saluted. These were Daoud, the hasty, and his love fellow, Faraj, a beautiful, soft-framed, girlish creature, with innocent, smooth face and swimming eyes. They said they were for my service, I had no need of them, and objected that after their beating they could not ride. They replied they had now come barebacked. I said I was a simple man who disliked servants about him. Dowd turned away, defeated and angry, but Farage pleaded that we must have men, and they would follow me for company and out of gratitude. While the harder Dowd revolted, he went over to Nasir and knelt in appeal, all the women of him evident in his longing. At the end, on Nasir's advice, I took them both, mainly because they looked so young and clean. 
Sharaf delayed to come until the third morning. He had captured prisoners on the line and blown up rails in the culvert. One piece of his news was that in Wadi Dira'a, on our road, were pools of rainwater, new fallen and sweet. This would shorten our waterless march to Fezur by fifty miles. Next day, we left Abu Raga. Auda led us up a tributary valley, which soon widened into the plain of the Sheg, a sand flat. About it, in scattered confusion, sat small islands and pinnacles of red sandstone, grouped like seracs, wind eroded at the bases till they looked very fit to fall and block the road, which wound in and out between them, through narrows seeming to give no passage, but always opening into another bay of blind alleys. Through this maze, Auda led unhesitatingly, digging along on his camel, elbows out, hands poised, swaying in the air by his shoulders. There were no footmarks on the ground, for each wind swept like a great brush over the sand surface, stippling the traces of the last travelers till the surface was again a pattern of innumerable tiny virgin waves. Only the dried camel droppings, which were lighter than the sand and rounded like walnuts, escaped over its ripples. They rolled about to be heaped in corners by the skirling winds. It was perhaps by them, as much as by his unrivaled road sense, that Auda knew the way. In the mid-march, we perceived five or six riders coming from the railway. I was in front with Auda, and we had that delicious thrill, friend or enemy, of meeting strangers in the desert, whilst we circumspectly drew across the vantage side, which kept the rifle arm free for a snap shot. But when they came nearer, we saw that they were of the Arab forces, the first riding loosely on a hulking camel, with the unwieldy Manchester-made timber saddle of the British Camel Corps, was a fair-haired, shaggy, bearded Englishman in tattered uniform. This, we guess, must be Hornby, Newcomb's pupil, the wild engineer who vied with him in smashing the railway. After we had exchanged greetings on this our first meeting, he told me that Newcomb had lately gone to Wedge to talk over his difficulties with Faisal and make fresh plans to meet them. At sunset, we reached the northern limit of the ruined sandstone land and rode up to a new level, sixty feet higher than the old, blue-black and volcanic, with a scattered covering of worn basalt blocks, small as a man's hand, neatly bedded like cobble paving over a floor of fine, hard black cinder, debris of themselves. It was very dark, a pure night enough, but the black stone underfoot swallowed the light of the stars, and at seven o'clock, when at last we halted, only four of our party were with us. We had reached a gentle valley, with a yet damp, soft, sandy bed, full of thorny brushwood, unhappily useless as camel food. We ran about tearing up these bitter bushes by the roots and heaping them in a great pyre, which Auda lit. When the fire grew hot, a long black snake wormed slowly out into our group. We must have gathered it, torpid with the twigs. The flames went shining across the dark flat, a beacon to the heavy camels which had lagged so much today that it was two hours before the last group arrived, the men singing their loudest, partly to encourage themselves and their hungry animals over the ghostly plain, partly so that we might know them friends. In the night, some of our camels strayed and our people had to go looking for them, so long that it was nearly eight o'clock, and we had baked bread and eaten before again we started. Our track lay across more lava field, but to our morning strength, the stones seemed rarer, and waves or hard surfaces of laid sand often drowned them smoothly, with covering as good to march on as a tennis court. We marched steadily till noon, and then sat out on the bare ground till three. An uneasy halt made necessary by our fear that the dejected camels, so long accustomed only to the sandy tracks of the coastal plain, might have their soft feet scorched by the sun-baked stones and go lame with us on the road. After we mounted, 
the going became worse and we had continually to avoid large fields of piled basalt or deep yellow watercourses which cut through the crust into the soft stone beneath after a while red sandstone again cropped out in crazy chimneys from which the harder layers projected knife sharp in level shelves beyond the soft crumbling rock at last these sandstone ruins became plentiful in the manner of yesterday and stood grouped about our road in similar checkered yards of light and shade again we marvelled at the sureness with which Auda guided our little party through the mazy rocks they passed and we re-entered volcanic ground little pimply craters stood about often two or three together and from them spines of high broken basalt led down like disordered causeways between craters the basalt was strewn in small tetrahedra with angles rubbed and rounded stone tight to stone like tesserae upon a bed of pink yellow mud the ways worn across such flats by the constant passage of camels were very evident since the slouching tread had pushed the blocks to each side of the path and the thin mud of wet weather had run into these hollows and now inlaid them palely against the blue less used roads for hundreds of yards were like narrow ladders across the stone fields for the tread of each foot was filled in with clean yellow mud and ridges or bars of the blue-gray stone remained between each stepping place after a stretch of such stone laying would be a field of jet-black basalt cinders firm as concrete in the sun-baked mud and afterwards a valley of soft black sand with more crags of weathered sandstone rising from the blackness or from waves of the wind-blown red and yellow grains of their own decay at last Auda pointed ahead to a fifty-foot ridge of large twisted blocks lying coursed one upon the other as they had writhed and shrunk in their cooling there was the limit of lava and he and i rode on together and saw in front of us an open rolling plain wadi aish a fine scrub in golden sand with green bushes scattered here and there it held a very little water in holes which someone had scooped after the rainstorm of three weeks ago we camped by them and drove our unladen camels out till sunset to graze for the first adequate time since abu raga while they were scattered over the land mounted men appeared on the horizon to the east making towards the water they came on too quickly to be honest and fired at our herdsmen but the rest of us ran at once upon the scattered reefs and knolls shooting or shouting hearing us so many they drew off as fast as their camels would go and from the ridge in the dusk we saw them a bare dozen in all scampering away towards the line we were glad to see them avoid us so thoroughly. Auda thought they were a Shamar patrol. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of Revolt in the Desert。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 8 The Veritable Desert. At dawn, we saddled up for the short stage to Deir A'a, the water pools of which Sharaf had told us. We halted there till afternoon, for we were now quite near the railway, and had to drink our stomachs full and fill our few water skins ready for the long dash to Fezzer. In the halt, Auda came to see Farage and Daoud dressed my camel with butter for relief against the intolerable itch of mange which had broken out recently on its face. The dry pasturage of the Billy country and the infected ground of Wedge had played havoc with our beasts. In all Faisal's stud of riding camels, there was not one healthy. In our little expedition, every camel was weakening daily nasir was full of anxiety lest many break down in the forced march before us and leave their riders stranded in the desert we had no medicines for mange and could do little for it in spite of our need however 
The rubbing and anointing did make my animal more comfortable, and we repeated it as often as Faraj or Daoud could find butter in our party. These two boys were giving me great satisfaction. They were brave and cheerful, active, good riders and willing workmen. By a quarter to four, we were in the saddle, going down Wadi Dira'a into steep and high ridges of shifting sand, sometimes with a cap of harsh red rock jutting from them. After a while, three or four of us, in advance of the main body, climbed a sand peak on hands and knees to spy out the railway. There was no air, and the exercise was more than we required. But our reward was immediate, for the line showed itself quiet and deserted looking. We were to have an unmolested crossing. Our heavy camels marched over the valley, the line, and the further flat, till sheltered in the sand and rock mouths of the country beyond the railway. Meanwhile, the Agail fixed gun cotton or gelatin charges to as many of the rails as we had time to reach, and began, in proper order, to light the fuses, filling the hollow valley with the echoes of repeated bursts. Auda had not before known dynamite, and with a child's first pleasure was moved to a rush of hasty poetry on its powerful glory. We cut three telegraph wires and fastened the free ends to the saddles of six riding camels of the Hawetat. The astonished team struggled far into the eastern valleys with the growing weight of twanging, tangling wire and the bursting poles dragging after them. At last, they could no longer move, so we cut them loose and rode in the falling dusk, laughing after the caravan. In the morning, Auda had us afoot before four, going uphill, till at last we climbed a ridge to a plain, with an illimitable view downhill to the east, where one gentle level after another slowly modulated into a distance only to be called distance because it was a sober blue and more hazy. The rising sun flooded this falling plain with a perfect level of light, throwing up long shadows of almost imperceptible ridges, and the whole life and play of a complicated ground system but a transient one. For as we looked at it, the shadows drew in towards the dawn, quivered a last moment behind their mother banks, and went out as though at a common signal. Full morning had begun. The river of sunlight, sickeningly in the full face of us moving creatures, poured impartially on every stone of the desert. The Fezzer Bedouin, whose property it was, called our plain al Hul because it was desolate, and today we rode without seeing signs of life. No tracks of gazelle, no lizards, no burrowing of rats, not even birds. We ourselves felt tiny in it, and our urgent progress across its immensity was a stillness or immobility of futile effort. The only sounds were the hollow echoes, like the shutting down of pavements over vaulted places of rotten stone slab on stone slab when they tilted under our camel's feet, and the low but piercing rustle of the sand as it crept slowly westward before the hot wind along the worn sandstone, under the harder overhanging caps which gave each reef its eroded rind-like shape. It was a breathless wind, with the furnace taste sometimes known in Egypt when a camson came, and as the day went on and the sun rose in the sky, it grew stronger, more filled with the dust of the Nefud, the great sand desert of northern Arabia, close by us over there, but invisible through the haze. By noon, it blew a half-gale, so dry that our shriveled lips cracked open and the skin of our faces chapped, while our eyelids, gone granular, seemed to creep back and bare our shrinking eyes. The Arabs drew their headcloth tightly across their noses and pulled the brow folds forward like visors with only a narrow, loose flapping slit of vision. We plodded on all day. Even without the wind forbidding us, there could have been no more luxury halts under the shadow of blankets if we would arrive on broken men with strong camels at El Fezer. And nothing made us widen an eye or think a thought till evening calm and black and full of stars, had come down on us. We had covered about fifty miles, so we halted.
Before dawn the following day we started, and at the height of noon reached the well of our desire. It was about thirty feet deep, stone-stained, seeming ancient. The water was slightly brackish, but not ill-tasting when drunk fresh, though it soon grew foul in the skin. The valley had flooded in some burst of rain the year before, and therefore contained much dry and thirsty pasturage. To this we loosed our camels, to crop industriously till nightfall. Then we watered them again and pounded them under the bank a half mile from the water for the night, thus leaving the well unmolested in case raiders should need it in the dark hours. Yet our sentries heard no one. As usual, we were off before dawn and reached our stage, Kabr Ajaj, just before sunset, after a dull ride over a duller plain. The pool was of this year's rain, good for camels and just possible for men to drink. We had thought to find Hawitat here, but the ground was grazed bare and the water fouled by their animals, while they themselves were gone. Auda searched for their tracks but could find none. The wind storms had swept the sand face into clean new ripples. However, if we went away northward, we should find them. The following day, despite the interminable lapse of time, was only our fourteenth from Wedge, and its sun rose upon us again marching, over flats of limestone and sand, toward a distant corner of the great Nefud, the famous belts of sand dune which cut off Jebel Shamar from the Syrian desert. Palgrave, the Blunts, and Gertrude Bell amongst the storied travellers had crossed it, and I begged Auda to bear off a little and let us enter it, and their company. But he growled that men went to the Nefwood only of necessity, when raiding, and that the son of his father did not raid on a tottering mangy camel. Our business was to reach Arfaja alive. So we wisely marched on, over monotonous, glittering sand and over those worst stretches, Gia'an, of polished mud, nearly as white and smooth as laid paper, and often whole miles square. They blazed back the sun into our faces with glassy vigor, so we rode with its light raining direct arrows upon our heads, and its reflection glancing up from the ground through our inadequate eyelids. It was not a steady pressure, but a pain ebbing and flowing, at one time piling itself up and up till we nearly swooned, and then falling away coolly, in a moment of false shadow like a black web crossing the retina. These gave us a moment's breathing space to store new capacity for suffering, like the struggles to the surface of a drowning man. We grew short answer to one another, but relief came toward six o'clock, when we halted for supper and baked ourselves fresh bread. After dark, we crawled for three hours, reaching the top of a sand ridge. There we slept thankfully after a bad day of burning wind, dust blizzards, and drifting sand, which stung our inflamed faces and at times, in the greater gusts, wrapped the sight of our road from us and drove our complaining camels up and down. But Auda was anxious about the morrow, for another hot head wind would delay us a third day in the desert and we had no water left. So he called us early in the night, and we marched down into the plain of the Bizeta, so called in derision for its huge size and flatness, before day broke. Its fine surface litter of sun-brown flints was restfully dark, after sunrise, for our streaming eyes, but hot and hard going for our camels, some of which were already limping with sore feet. Camels brought up on the sandy plains of the Arabian coast had delicate pads to their feet, and if such animals were taken suddenly inland for long marches over flints or other heat-retaining ground, their soles would burn and at last crack in a blister, leaving quick flesh two inches or more across in the center of the pad. In this state, they could march as ever over sand, but if by chance the foot came down on a pebble, they would stumble or flinch as though they had stepped on fire, and in a long march might break down altogether unless they were very brave. So we rode carefully, picking the softest way, Auda and myself in front. As we went, 
Some little puffs of dust scurried into the eye of the wind. Auda said they were ostriches. A man ran up to us with two great ivory eggs. We settled to breakfast on this bounty of the bezeta and looked for fuel, but in twenty minutes found only a wisp of grass. The barren desert was defeating us. The baggage train passed, and my eye fell on the loads of blasting gelatin. We broached a packet, shredding it carefully into a fire beneath the egg propped on stones till the cookery was pronounced complete. Nasir and Nasib, really interested, dismounted to scoff at us. Auda drew his silver-hilted dagger and chipped the top of the first egg. A stink like pestilence went across our party. We fled to a clean spot, rolling the second hot egg before us with gentle kicks. It was fresh enough and hard as stone. We dug out its contents with the dagger onto the flint flakes which were our platters, and ate it piecemeal, persuading even Nasir, who in his life before had never fallen so low as egg meat, to take his share. The general verdict was, tough and strong, but good in the bezeta. Zal saw an oryx, stalked it, and killed it. The better joints were tied upon the baggage camels for the next halt, and our march continued. Afterwards, the greedy Hawitat saw more oryx in the distance, and went after the beasts, who foolishly ran a little, then stood still and stared till the men were near, and too late ran away again. Their white shining bellies betrayed them, for by the magnification of the mirage, they winked each move to us from afar. I was too weary, and too little sporting to go out of the straight way for all the rare beasts in the world. So I rode after the caravan, which my camel overhauled quickly with her longer stride. At the tail of it were my men, walking. They feared that some of their animals would be dead before evening, if the wind blew stronger, but were leading them by hand in hope of getting them in. I admired the contrast between Muhammad the lusty, heavy-footed peasant and the lithe Agil, with Faraj and Daoud dancing along, barefooted, delicate as thoroughbreds. Only Gassim was not there. They thought him among the Hawitat, for his surliness offended the laughing soldiery and kept him commonly with the Bedouin, who were more of his kidney. There was no one behind, so I rode forward wishing to see how his camel was, and at last found it, riderless, being led by one of the Hawitat. His saddlebags were on it, and his rifle, and his food, but he himself nowhere. Gradually it dawned on us that the miserable man was lost. This was a dreadful business, for in the haze and mirage the caravan could not be seen two miles, and on the iron ground it made no tracks. Afoot he would never overtake us. Everyone had marched on, thinking him elsewhere in our loose line. But much time had passed, and it was nearly midday, so he must be miles back. His loaded camel was proof that he had not been forgotten asleep at our night halt. The Agel ventured that perhaps he had dozed in the saddle and fallen, stunning or killing himself, or perhaps someone of the party had borne him a grudge. Anyway, they did not know. He was an ill-natured stranger, no charge on any of them, and they did not greatly care. True, but it was true also that Muhammad, his countryman and fellow, who was technically his rogue companion, knew nothing of the desert, had a foundered camel, and could not turn back for him. I looked weakly at my trudging men, and wondered for a moment if I could change with one, sending him back on my camel to the rescue. My shirking the duty would be understood, because I was a foreigner, but that was precisely the plea I did not dare set up, while I yet presumed to help these Arabs in their own revolt. It was hard, anyway, for a stranger to influence another people's national movement, and doubly hard for a Christian and a sedentary person to sway Muslim nomads. I should make it impossible for myself if I claimed simultaneously the privileges of both societies. So, without saying anything, I turned my unwilling camel round and forced her, grunting and moaning for her camel friends, back past the long line of men, 
and past the baggage into the emptiness behind. My temper was very unheroic, for I was furious with my other servants, with my own play-acting as a Bedouin, and most of all with Gassim, a gap-toothed grumbling fellow, scrimshank in all our marches, bad-tempered, suspicious, brutal, a man whose engagement I regretted, and of whom I had promised to rid myself as soon as we reached a discharging place. It seemed absurd that I should peril my weight in the Arab adventure for a single worthless man. My camel seemed to feel it also, by her deep grumbling, but that was a constant recourse of ill-treated camels. After a mile or two she felt better, and began to go forward less constrainedly, but still slowly. I had been noting our direction all these days with my oil compass, and hoped by its aid to return nearly to our starting place, seventeen miles away. I had ridden about an hour and a half easily, for the following breeze had let me wipe the crust from my red eyes and look forward almost without pain, when I saw a figure, or large bush, or at least something black ahead of me. The shifting mirage disguised height or distance, but this thing seemed moving, a little east of our course. On chance, I turned my camel's head that way, and in a few minutes saw that it was Gassim. When I called, he stood confusedly. I rode up and saw that he was nearly blinded and silly, standing there with his arms held out to me and his black mouth gaping open. The agale had put our last water in my skin, and this he spilled madly over his face and breast in haste to drink. He stopped babbling and began to wail out his sorrows. I sat him, pillion, on the camel's rump, then stirred her up and mounted. At our turn, the beast seemed relieved and moved forward freely. In spite of our double weight, she began to stride out, and at times even put her head down and for a few paces developed that fast and most comfortable shuffle to which the best animals, while young, were broken by skilled riders. This proof of reserved spirit in her rejoiced me, as did the little time lost in search. Gassim was moaning impressively about the pain and terror of his thirst. I told him to stop, but he went on and began to sit loosely, until at each step of the camel he pumped down on her hinder quarters with a crash, which, like his crying, spurred her to greater pace. There was danger in this, for we might easily founder her so. Again I told him to stop, and when he only screamed the louder, hit him and swore that for another sound I would throw him off. The threat to which my general rage gave color worked. After it he clung on grimly without sound. Not four miles had passed when again I saw a black bubble, lunging and swaying in the mirage ahead. It split into three and swelled. I wondered if they were enemy. A minute later, the haze unrolled with the disconcerting suddenness of illusion. And it was Auda, with two of Nasir's men, come back to look for me. I yelled jests and scoffs at them for abandoning a friend in the desert. Auda pulled his beard and grumbled that had he been present, I would never have gone back. Gassim was transferred with insults to a better rider's saddle pad, and we ambled forward together. In an hour, we rejoined Nasir and Nasib in the van. Nasib was vexed with me for periling the lives of Auda and myself on a whim. It was clear to him that I reckoned they would come back for me. Nasir was shocked at his ungenerous outlook, and Auda was glad to rub into a townsman the paradox of tribe and city, the collective responsibility and group brotherhood of the desert contrasted with the isolation and competitive living of the crowded districts. Over this little affair hours had passed, and the rest of the day seemed not so long, though the heat became worse and the sand blast stiffened in our faces, till the air could be seen and heard, whistling past our camels like smoke. The ground was flat and featureless till five o'clock, when we saw low mounds ahead, and a little later found ourselves in comparative peace, amid sand hills coated slenderly with tamarisk. These were the Cassim of Sirhan. The bushes and the dunes broke the wind. It was sunset, and the evening mellowed and reddened on us from the west, 
so I wrote in my diary that Sirhan was beautiful. Having not a mouthful of water, we of course ate nothing, which made it a continent night. Yet the certainty of drink on the morrow let us sleep easily, lying on our bellies to prevent the inflation of foodlessness. Arab habit was to fill themselves to vomiting point at each well, and either to go dry to the next, or if they carried water, to use it lavishly at the first halt, drinking and bread making. Next morning, we rode down slopes over a first ridge, and a second, and a third, each three miles from the other, till at eight o'clock we dismounted by the wells of our faja, the sweet-smelling bush, so-called, being fragrant all about us. The unlined wells were dug about eighteen feet, to water creamy to the touch with a powerful smell and brackish taste. We found it delicious, and since there was green stuff about, good for camel food, decided to stay here the day. End of chapter 8「Revolt in the Desert」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 9 Feasts of the Tribes. Next morning, we did a fast march of five hours, our camels being full of life after their ease of yesterday, to an oasis hollow of stunted palm trees, with tamarisk clumps here and there, and plentiful water, about seven feet underground, tasting sweeter than the water of our faja. Yet this also upon experience proved Sirhan water, the first drink of which was tolerable, but which refused to lather to soap, and developed, after two days in closed vessels, a foul smell and taste destructive to the intended flavor of coffee, tea, or bread. Verily, we were tiring of Wadi Sirhan. Though Nasib and Zeki still design works of plantation and reclamation here for the Arab government, when by them established, such vaulting imagination was typical of Syrians, who easily persuaded themselves of possibilities, and as quickly reached forward to lay their present responsibilities on others. Zeki said I one day, your camel is full of mange. Alas and alack, agreed he mournfully. In the evening, very quickly when the sun is low, we shall dress her skin with ointment. During our next ride, I mentioned mange once more. Aha, said Zeki, it has given me a full idea conceived the establishment of a veterinary department of state for Syria when Damascus is ours. We shall have a staff of skilled surgeons, with a school of probationers and students in a central hospital, or rather central hospitals, for camels and for horses, and for donkeys and cattle, even, why not, for sheep and goats. There must be scientific and bacteriological branches to make researches into universal cures for animal disease. And what about a library of foreign books? And district hospitals to feed the central, and traveling inspectors. With Nasib's eager collaboration, he carved Syria into four inspectorates general, and many sub-inspectorates. Again on the morrow, there was mention of mange. They had slept on their labor, and the scheme was rounding out. Yet, my dear, it is imperfect, and our nature stops not short of perfection. We grieve to see you thus satisfied to snatch the mere opportune. It is an English fault. I dropped into their vein. O Nasib, said I, and O Zeki, will not perfection, even in the least of things, entail the ending of this world? Are we ripe for that? When I am angry, I pray God to swing our globe into the fiery sun and prevent the sorrows of the not yet born. But when I am content, I want to lie forever in the shade till I become a shade myself. Uneasily, they shifted the talk to stud farms, and on the sixth day, the poor camel died. Very truly, because, as Zeki pointed out, you did not dress her. Auda, Nasir, and the rest of us kept our beast going by constant care. 
We could perhaps just stave the mange off till we should reach the camp of some well-provided tribe and be able to procure medicines with which to combat the disease wholeheartedly. A mounted man came bearing down upon us. Tension there was, for a moment, but then the Hawatat hailed him. He was one of their herdsmen, and greetings were exchanged in an unhurried voice, as was proper in the desert, where noise was a low-bred business at the best, and urban at its worst. He told us the Hawatat were camped in front, from Isawiya to Nebk, anxiously waiting our news. All was well with their tents. Out as anxiety passed and his eagerness kindled, we rode fast for an hour to Isawiya and the tents of Ali Abu Fitna, chief of one of Auda's clans. Old Ali, roomy-eyed, red and unkempt, into whose jutting beard a long nose perpetually dripped, greeted us warmly and urged us to the hospitality of his tent. We excused ourselves as too many and camped nearby under some thorns, while he and the other tent holders made estimate of our numbers and prepared feasts for us in the evening to each group of tents its little batch of visitors. The meal took hours to produce, and it was long after dark when they called us to it. I woke and stumbled across, ate, made my way back to our couched camels, and slept again. Our march was prosperously over. We had found the Hawitat. Our men were in excellent fettle. We had our gold and our explosives still intact. So we drew happily together in the morning to a solemn council on action. There was agreement that first we should present six thousand pounds to Nuri Sha'alan, by whose sufferance we were in Sirhan. We wanted from him liberty to stay while enrolling and preparing our fighting men. And when we moved off, we wanted him to look after their families and tents and herds. These were great matters. It was determined that Auda himself should ride to Nuri on embassy, because they were friends. Meanwhile, we would stay with Ali Abu Fitna, moving gently northward with him toward Nebg, where Auda would tell all the Abu Tayi to collect. He would be back from Nuri before they were united. This was the business, and we laded six bags of gold into Auda's saddlebags, and off he went. Afterwards, the chiefs of the Fitna waited on us, and said they were honored to feast us twice a day, forenoon and sunset, so long as we remained with them, and they meant what they said. Hawaitat hospitality was unlimited, no three-day niggardliness for them of the nominal desert law, and importunate, and left us no honorable escape from the entirety of the nomad's dream of well-being. Each morning between eight and ten, a little group of blood mares under an assortment of imperfect saddlery would come to our camping place, and on them Nasir, Nasib, Zeki, and I would mount, and with perhaps a dozen of our men on foot would move solemnly across the valley by the sandy pass between the bushes. Our horses were led by our servants, since it would be immodest to ride free or fast, so eventually we would reach the tent which was to be our feast hall for that time, each family claiming us in turn, and bitterly offended if Zal, the adjudicator, preferred one out of just order. As we arrived, the dogs would rush out at us and be driven off by onlookers. Always a crowd had collected round the chosen tent, and we stepped in under the ropes to its guest half, made very large for the occasion, and carefully dressed with its wall curtain on the sunny side to give us shade. The bashful host would murmur and vanish again out of sight. The tribal rugs, lurid red things from Beirut, were ready for us, arranged down the partition curtain, along the back wall and across the dropped end, so that we sat down on three sides of an open dusty space. We might be fifty men in all. The host would reappear, Standing by the pole, our local fellow guests, Al Daylan, Zaal, and other sheikhs, reluctantly let themselves be placed on the rugs between us, sharing our elbow room on the pack saddles, padded with folded felt rugs over which we leaned. The front of the tent was cleared, and the dogs were frequently chased away by excited children, who ran across the empty space pulling yet smaller children after them. 
Their clothes were less as their years were less, and their pot bodies rounder. The smallest infants of all, out of their fly-black eyes, would stare at the company, gravely balanced on spread legs, stark naked, sucking their thumbs and pushing out expectant bellies towards us. Then would follow an awkward pause, which our friends would try to cover, by showing us on its perch the household hawk, when possible, a seabird taken young on the Red Sea coast, or their watch cockerel, or their greyhound. Once a tame ibex was dragged in for our admiration, another time an oryx. When these interests were exhausted, they would try and find a small talk to distract us from the household noises, and from noticing the urgent whispered cookery directions wafted through the dividing curtain with a powerful smell of boiled fat and drifts of tasty meat smoke. After a silence, the host or a deputy would come forward and whisper, black or white, an invitation for us to choose coffee or tea. Nasir would always say black, and the slave would be back and forward with the beaked coffee pot in one hand and three or four clinking cups of whiteware in the other. He would dash a few drops of coffee into the uppermost cup and proffer it to Nasir, then pour the second for me and the third for Nasib, and pause while we turn the cups about in our hands and suck them carefully to get appreciatively from them the last, richest drop. As soon as they were empty, his hand was stretched to clap them noisily, one above the other, and toss them out with a lesser flourish for the next guest in order, and so on round the assembly till all had drunk. Then back to Nasir again. The second cup would be tastier than the first, partly because the pot was yielding deeper from the brew, partly because of the heel taps of so many previous drinkers present in the cups, whilst the third and fourth rounds, if the serving of the meat delayed so long, would be of surprising flavor. However, at last, two men came staggering through the thrilled crowd, carrying the rice and meat on a tin copper tray or shallow bath, five feet across, set like a great brazier on a foot. In the tribe, there was only this one food bowl of the size, and an incised inscription ran round it in florid Arabic characters. To the glory of God, and in trust of mercy at the last, the property of his poor suppliant, Auda Abu Tayi. It was borrowed by the host, who was to entertain us for the time, and since my urgent brain and body made me wakeful, from my blankets in the first light I would see the dish going across country, and by marking down its goal, would know where we were to feed that day. The bowl was now brim full, ringed round its edge by white rice in an embankment a foot wide and six inches deep, filled with legs and ribs of mutton till they toppled over. It needed two or three victims to make in the center a dressed pyramid of meat such as honor prescribed. The centerpieces were the boiled, upturned heads, propped on their severed stumps of neck, so that the ears, brown like old leaves, flapped out on the rice surface. The jaws gaped emptily upward, pulled open to show the hollow throat with the tongue still pink, clinging to the lower teeth, and the long incisors whitely crowned the pile, very prominent above the nostrils pricking hair, and the lips which sneered away blackly from them. This load was set down on the soil of the cleared space between us, where it steamed hotly, while a procession of minor helpers bore the small cauldrons and copper vats in which the cooking had been done. From them, with much bruised bowls of enameled iron, they ladled out over the main dish all the inside and outside of the sheep, little bits of yellow intestine, the white tail cushion of fat, brown muscles and meat and bristly skin, all swimming in the liquid butter and grease of the seething. The bystanders watched anxiously, muttering satisfactions when a very juicy scrap plopped out. The fat was scalding. Every now and then a man would drop his baler with an exclamation and plunge his burnt fingers, not reluctantly, in his mouth to cool them but they persevered till at last their scooping rang loudly on the bottoms of the pots, and with a gesture of triumph they fished out the intact livers from their hiding place in the gravy 
and topped the yawning jaws with them. Two raised each smaller cauldron and tilted it, letting the liquid splash down upon the meat till the rice crater was full, and the loose grains at the edge swam in the abundance. And yet they poured till, amid cries of astonishment from us, it was running over, and a little pool congealing in the dust. That was the final touch of splendor, and the host called us to come and eat. We feigned a deafness, as manners demanded. At last we heard him, and looked surprised at one another, each urging his fellow to move first, till Nasir rose coyly, and after him we all came forward to sink on one knee round the tray, wedging in and cuddling up till the twenty-two for whom there was barely space were grouped around the food. We turned back our right sleeves to the elbow, and taking lead from Nasir with a low, the name of God the merciful, the loving kind, we dipped together. The first dip, for me at least, was always cautious, since the liquid fat was so hot that my unaccustomed fingers could seldom bear it. And so I would toy with an exposed and cooling lump of meat till others' excavations had drained my rice segment. We would knead between the fingers, not soiling the palm, neat balls of rice and fat and liver and meat, cemented by gentle pressure, and project them by leverage of the thumb from the crooked forefinger into the mouth. With the right trick and the right construction, the little lump held together and came clean off the hand. But when surplus butter and odd fragments clung, cooling to the fingers, they had to be licked carefully to make the next effort slip easier away. Our host stood by the circle, encouraging the appetite with pious ejaculations. At top speed, we twisted, tore, cut, and stuffed, never speaking since conversation would insult a meal's quality, though it was proper to smile thanks when an intimate guest passed a select fragment, or when Muhammad al Daylan gravely handed over a huge barren bone with a blessing. On such occasion, I would return the compliment with some hideous, impossible lump of guts, a flippancy which rejoiced the Hawaitat, but which the gracious, aristocratic Nasir saw with disapproval. At length, some of us were nearly filled and began to play and pick, glancing sideways at the rest till they too grew slow and at last ceased eating, elbow on knee, the hand hanging down from the wrist over the tray edge to drip, while the fat, butter, and scattered grains of rice cooled into a stiff white grease which gummed the fingers together. When all had stopped, Nasir meaningly cleared his throat, and we rose up together in haste with an explosive. God requite it you, O host, to group ourselves outside among the tent ropes, while the next twenty guests inherited our leaving. Those of us who were nice would go to the end of the tent where the flap of the roof cloth, beyond the last poles, drooped down as an end curtain, and on this clan handkerchief, whose coarse goat hair mesh was pliant and glossy with much use, would scrape the thickest of the fat from the hands. Then we would make back to our seats and retake them sighingly, while the slaves, leaving aside their portion, the skulls of the sheep, would come round our rank with a wooden bowl of water and a coffee cup as dipper to splash over our fingers while we rubbed them with the tribal soap cake. Meantime, the second and third sittings by the dish were having their turn, and then there would be one more cup of coffee, or a glass of syrup-like tea, and at last the horses would be brought, and we would slip out to them and mount, with a quiet blessing to the hosts as we passed by. When our backs were turned, the children would run in disorder upon the ravaged dish, tear our gnawed bones from one another, and escape into the open with valuable fragments to be devoured in security behind some distant bush while the watchdogs of all the camp prowled round snapping, and the master of the tent fed the choicest offal to his greyhound. We feasted on the first day once, on the second twice, on the third twice at Isawiya, and then on the 30th of May, we saddled and rode easily for three hours, 
past an old sanded lava field to a valley in which seven-foot wells of the usual brackish water lay all about us. The Abu Tayi struck camp when we struck, and journeyed at our side, and camped around us. So today, for the first time, I was spectator from the midst of an Arab tribe, an actor in the routine of its march. It was strangely unlike the usual desert constancy. All day, the grey-green expanse of stones and bushes quivered like a mirage with the movement of men on foot, and horsemen, men on camels, camels bearing the hunched black loads which were the goat-hair tent cloths, camels swaying curiously like butterflies under the winged and fringed howdahs of the women, camels tusked like mammoths, or tailed like birds with the cocked or dragging tent poles of silvery poplar. There was no order nor control, nor routine of march, other than the wide front, the self-contained parties, the simultaneous start, which the insecurity of countless generations had made instinctive. The difference was that the desert, whose daily sparseness gave value to every man, today seemed with their numbers suddenly to come alive. The pace was easy, and we, who had been guarding our own lives for weeks, found it a relaxation beyond feeling to know ourselves so escorted as to share the light liability of danger with a host. Even our most solemn riders let themselves go a little, and the wilder ones became licentious. First amongst these, of course, were Faraj and Daoud, my two imps whose spirits not all the privations of our road had quelled for a moment. About their riding places in our line of march centered two constant swirls of activity or of accident, according as their quenchless mischief found a further expression. On my dry patience, they graded a little, because the plague of snakes which had been with us since our first entry into Sirhan, today rose to memorable height and became a terror. In ordinary times, so the Arabs said, snakes were little worse here than anywhere by water in the desert. But this year, the valley seemed creeping with horned vipers and puff adders, cobras and black snakes. By night, movement was dangerous, and at last we found it necessary to walk with sticks, beating the bushes each side while we stepped warily through on bare feet. A strange thing was the snake's habit, at night, of lying beside us, probably for warmth, under or on the blanket. When we learned this, our rising was with infinite care, and the first up would search round his fellows with a stick till he could pronounce them unencumbered. Our party of fifty men killed perhaps twenty snakes daily. At last, they got so on our nerves that the boldest of us feared to touch ground, while those, who like myself, had a shuddering horror of all reptiles, long that our stay in Surhan might end. Not so Faraj and Daoud. To them, this was a new and splendid game. They troubled us continually with alarms and furious beatings upon the head of every harmless twig or root which caught their fancy. At last, in our noon halt, I charged them strictly not to let the cry of snake again pass their lips aloud. And then... Sitting by our traps upon the sand, we had peace. To live on the floor, whence it was so far to arise and walk, disposed to inaction, and there was much to think about, so that it may have been an hour afterwards before I noticed the offending pair smiling and nudging one another. My eyes idly followed their eyes to the neighboring bush, under which a brown snake lay coiled, glittering at me. Quickly, I moved myself and cried to Ali, who jumped in with his riding cane and settled it. I told him to give the two boys a swinging half-dozen each, to teach them not again to be literal at my expense. Nasir, slumbering behind me, heard and with joy shouted to add six from himself. Nasib copied him, and then Zeki, and then Ibn de Gaythir, till half the men were clamoring for revenge. The culprits were abashed when they saw that all the hides and all the sticks in the party would hardly expiate their account. However, I saved them the weight of it, and instead we proclaimed them moral bankrupts and set them under the women to gather wood and draw water for the tents. 
We were very weary of Sirhan. The landscape was of a hopelessness and sadness deeper than all the open deserts we had crossed. Sand or flint or a desert of bare rocks was exciting sometimes, and in certain lights had the monstrous beauty of sterile desolation. But there was something sinister, something actively evil in the snake-devoted Sirhan, proliferant of salt water, barren palms, and bushes which served neither for grazing nor for firewood. Accordingly, we marched one day and another beyond Guti, whose weak well was nearly sweet. When we got near Agela, we saw that it was held by many tents, and presently a troop came out to meet us. They were Auda Abu Tayi, safely back from Nuri Sha'alan, with the one-eyed Durzi Ibn Dugmi, our old guest at Wej. His presence proved Nuri's favor, as did their strong escort of Ruala horse, who bareheaded and yelling, welcomed us to Nuri's empty house with a great show of spears and wild firing of rifles and revolvers at full gallop through the dust. Affairs looked well, and we set three men to make coffee for the visitors, who came in to Nasir one by one or group by group, swearing allegiance to Faisal and to the Arab movement in the Wej formula, and promising to obey Nasir and to follow after him with their contingents. Besides their formal presence, each new party deposited on our carpet their privy, accidental gift of lice. And long before sunset, Nasir and I were in a fever, with relay after relay of irritation. Auda had a stiff arm, the effect of an old wound in the elbow joint, and so could not scratch all of himself. But experience had taught him a way of thrusting a cross-headed camel stick up his left sleeve and turning it round and round inside against his ribs, which method seemed to relieve his itch more than our claws did ours. End of chapter 9「Ten of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 10. Nomads and Nomad Life. We were now five weeks out of Wej. We had spent nearly all the money we had bought with us. We had eaten all the Hawitat sheep. We had rested or replaced all our old camels. Nothing hindered the start. The freshness of the adventure in hand consoled us for everything, and Auda, importing more mutton, gave a farewell feast, the greatest of the whole series, in his huge tent the eve before we started. Hundreds were present, and five fills of the great tray were eaten up in relay as fast as they were cooked and carried in. Sunset came down, delightfully red, and after the feast, the whole party lay round the outside coffee hearth, lingering under the stars, while Auda and others told us stories. In a pause, I remarked casually that I had looked for Mohammed al Delan in his tent that afternoon to thank him for the milch camel he had given me but had not found him. Auda shouted for joy till everybody looked at him, and then, in the silence which fell that they might learn the joke, he pointed to Muhammad sitting dismally beside the coffee mortar and said in his huge voice, Ho, oh, shall I tell why Muhammad for fifteen days has not slept in his tent? Everybody chuckled with delight, and conversation stopped. All the crowd stretched out on the ground, chins in hands, prepared to take the good points of the story which they had heard perhaps twenty times. The women, out as three wives, Zal's wife, and some of Muhammad's, who had been cooking, came across, straddling their bellies in the billowy walk which came of carrying burdens on their heads, till they were near the partition curtain. And there they listened like the rest, while Auda told at length how Muhammad had bought publicly in the bazaar at Wej a costly string of pearls, and had not given it to any of his wives, and so they were all at odds, except in their common rejection of him. 
The story was, of course, a pure invention. Out his elvish humor heightened by the stimulus of revolt, and the luckless Muhammad, who had dragged through the fortnight guesting casually with one or other of the tribesmen, called upon God for mercy, and upon me for witness that Auda lied. I cleared my throat solemnly. Auda asked for silence and begged me to confirm his words. I began with the introducing phrase of a formal tale, In the name of God the merciful, the loving kind. We were six in Wej. There were Auda and Muhammad and Za'al, Gassim al-Shimt, Mufadi, and the poor man, myself. And one night just before dawn, Auda said, Let us make a raid against the market. And we said, In the name of God. And we went, Auda in a white robe and a red headcloth and Kasim sandals of peace leather, Muhammad in a silken tunic of seven kings and barefoot, Za'al, I forget Za'al, Gassim wore cotton, and Mufadi was in silk of blue stripes with an embroidered headcloth. Your servant was as your servant. My pause was still with astonishment. This was a close parody of Auda's epic style, and I mimicked also his wave of the hand, his round voice, and the rising and dropping tone which emphasized the points, or what he thought were points, of his pointless stories. The Hawitat sat silent as death, twisting their full bodies inside their sweat-stiffened shirts for joy, and staring hungrily at Auda, for they all recognized the original, and parody was a new art to them and to him. The coffee man, Mufadi, a Shama refugee from the guilt of blood, himself a character, forgot to pile fresh thorns on his fire, for fixity of listening to the tale. I told how we left the tents, with a list of the tents, and how we walked down towards the village, describing every camel and horse we saw, and all the passers-by, and the ridges, all bare of grazing, for by God that country was barren. And we marched, and after we had marched the time of a smoked cigarette, we heard something, and Auda stopped and said, Lads, I hear something. And Mohammed stopped and said, Lads, I hear something. And Za'al by God, you were right. And we stopped to listen, and there was nothing. And the poor man said, By God, I hear nothing. And Za'al said, By God, I hear nothing. And Muhammad said, By God, I hear nothing. And Auda said, By God, you are right. And we marched, and we marched, and the land was barren, and we heard nothing. And on our right hand came a man, a negro, on a donkey. The donkey was gray, with black ears and one black foot, and on its shoulder was a brand like this, a scrabble in the air, and its tail moved in its legs. Auda saw it and said, By God, a donkey! And Muhammad said, By the very God, a donkey and a slave! And we marched, and there was a ridge, not a great ridge, but a ridge as great as from the here to the what do you call it, Lil Bilie El Hawk, that is yonder. And we marched to the ridge, and it was barren. That land is barren, barren, barren. And we marched. And beyond the what do you call it, there was a what there is, as far as hereby from thence, and thereafter a ridge. And we came to that ridge, and went up that ridge. It was barren. All that land was barren. And as we came up that ridge, and were by the head of that ridge, and came to the end of the head of that ridge, by God, by my God, by very God, the sun rose upon us. It ended the session. Everyone had heard that sunrise twenty times in its immense bathos. An agony piled up of linked phrases, repeated and repeated with breathless excitement by Auda, to carry over for hours the thrill of a raiding story in which nothing happened. And the trivial rest of it was exaggerated. The degree which made it like one of Auda's tales... And yet, also, the history of the walk to market at Wej, which many of us had taken. The tribe was in waves of laughter on the ground. Auda laughed the loudest and longest, for he loved a jest upon himself, and the fatuousness of my epic had shown him his own sure mastery of descriptive action. He embraced Muhammad and confessed the invention of the necklace. In gratitude, Muhammad invited the camp to breakfast with him in his regained tent on the morrow, 
an hour before we started for the swoop on Aqaba. We should have a sucking camel calf boiled in sour milk by his wives, famous cooks in a legendary dish. We started an hour before noon on June 19, 1917. Nasir led us, riding his gazala, a camel vaulted and huge ribbed as an antique ship, towering a good foot above the next of our animals, and yet perfectly proportioned, with a stride like an ostrich's, a lyrical beast, noblest and best bred of the Hawatat camels, a female of nine remembered dams. Auda was beside him, and I skirmished about their gravities on Naama, the hen ostrich, a racing camel in my last purchase. Behind me rode my agale with Mohammed the clumsy. Mohammed was now companioned by Ahmed, another peasant, who had been for six years living among the Hawatat by force of his thews and wits, a knowing, eager ruffian. Our present party totaled more than five hundred strong, and the sight of this jolly mob of hardy, confident northerners chasing gazelle wildly over the face of the desert took from us momentarily all sorry apprehension as to the issue of our enterprise. We felt it was a rice night, and the chiefs of the Abu Tayi came to sup with us. Afterwards, with the embers of our coffee fire pleasantly red between us against the cool of this upland north country, we sat about on the carpets, chatting discursively of this remote thing and that. Nasir rolled over on his back with my glasses and began to study the stars, counting aloud first one group and then another, crying out with surprise at discovering little lights not noticed by his unaided eye. Auda set us on to talk of telescopes, of the great ones, and of how man in three hundred years had so far advanced from his first essay that now he built glasses as long as a tent, through which he counted thousands of unknown stars. And the stars, what are they? We slipped into talk of suns beyond suns, sizes and distances beyond wit. What will now happen with this knowledge? asked Muhammad. We shall set to and many learned and some clever men together will make glasses as more powerful than ours as ours than Galileo's. And yet more hundreds of astronomers will distinguish and reckon yet more thousands of now unseen stars, mapping them and giving each one its name. When we see them all, there will be no night in heaven. Why are the Westerners always wanting all? provokingly said Auda. Behind our few stars we can see God, who is not behind your millions. We want the world's end, Auda. But that is God's, complained Zael, half angry. Muhammad would not have his subject turned. Are there men on these greater worlds, he asked? God knows. And has each the prophet in heaven and hell? Auda broke in on him. Lads, we know our districts, our camels, our women. The excess and the glory are to God. If the end of wisdom is to add star to star, our foolishness is pleasing. And then he spoke of money, and distracted their minds till they all buzzed at once. Afterwards, he whispered to me that I must get him a worthy gift from Faisal when he won Aqaba. We marched at dawn, and presently Auda told me he was riding ahead to bear, and would I come. We went fast, and in two hours came upon the place suddenly under a knoll. Auda had hurried on to visit the tomb of his son Anad, who had been waylaid by five of his Motalga cousins, in revenge for Abtan, their champion, slain by Anad in single combat. Auda told me how Anad had ridden at them, one against five, and had died as he should, but it left only little Muhammad between him and childlessness. He had brought me along to hear him greatly lament his dead. However, as we rode down towards the graves, we were astonished to see smoke wreathing from the ground about the wells. We changed direction sharply and warily approached the ruins. It seemed there was no one there, but the thick dung cake round the well brink was charred and the well itself shattered at the top. The ground was torn and blackened as if by an explosion, and when we looked down the shaft we saw its staining stripped and split and many blocks thrown down the bore half choking it, and the water in the bottom. I sniffed the air and thought the smell was dynamite. Outer ran to the next well, in the bed of the valley below the graves, 
and that too was ragged about the head and choked with fallen stones. This, said he, is jazzy work. We walked across the valley to the third, the Benny Sacker well. It was only a crater of chalk. Za'al arrived, grave at sight of the disaster. We explored the ruined Khan, in which were night-old traces of perhaps a hundred horse. There was a fourth well, north of the ruins in the open flat, and to it we went hopelessly, wondering what would become of us if Bear were all destroyed. To our joy it was uninjured. This was a jazzy well, and its immunity gave strong color to Auda's theory. We were disconcerted to find the Turks so ready, and began to fear that perhaps they had also raided al Jafer, east of Man, the wells at which we planned to concentrate before we attacked. Their blocking would be a real embarrassment. Meanwhile, thanks to the fourth well, our situation, though uncomfortable, was not dangerous. Yet its water facilities were altogether insufficient for 500 camels. So it became imperative to open the least damaged of the other wells, that in the ruins, about whose lip the turf smoldered. Auda and I went off with Nasir to look again at it. And Agali brought us an empty case of Nobel's gelignite, evidently the explosive which the Turks had used. From scars in the ground, it was clear that several charges had been fired simultaneously round the wellhead and in the shaft. Staring down it till our eyes were adjusted to its dark, we suddenly saw many niches cut in the shaft less than twenty feet below. Some were still tamped and had wires hanging down. Evidently, there was a second series of charges, either inefficiently wired or with a very long time fuse. Hurriedly, we unrolled our bucket ropes, twined them together, and hung them freely down the middle of the well from a stout cross pole, the sides being so tottery that the scrape of a rope might have dislodged their blocks. I then found that charges were small, not above three pounds each, and had been wired in series with field telephone cable. But something had gone wrong. Either the Turks had scamped their job or their scouts had seen us coming before they had time to reconnect. So we soon had two fit wells and a clear profit of 30 pounds of enemy gelignite. We determined to stay a week in this fortunate bear. A third object, to discover the condition of the Jaffer wells, was now added to our needs for food and for news of the state of mind of the tribes between Ma'an and Aqaba. We sent a man to Jaffer. We prepared a little caravan of pack camels with Hawatat brands and sent them across the line to Tafile with three or four obscure clansmen, people who would never be suspected of association with us. They would buy all the flour they could and bring it back to us in five or six days' time. As for the tribes about the Aqaba road, we wanted their active help against the Turks, to carry out the provisional plan we had made at Wej. Our idea was to advance suddenly from Al Jafer, to cross the railway line and to crown the great pass, Negab al Shtar, down which the road dipped from the Ma'an Plateau to the Red Guerra Plain. To hold this pass, we should have to capture Abba al Lisan, the large spring at its head, about sixteen miles from Ma'an. But the garrison was small and we hoped to overrun it with a rush. We would then be astride the road, whose posts at the end of the week should fall from hunger. Though probably before that the hill tribes, hearing of our successful beginning, would join us to wipe them out. The crux of our plan was the attack on Abba al-Lisan, lest the force in Ma'an have time to sally out, relieve it, and drive us off the head of Shtar. If, as at present... They were only a battalion, they would hardly dare move, and should they let it fall while waiting for reinforcements to arrive, Aqaba would surrender to us, and we should be based on the sea, and have the advantageous gorge of Itam between us and the enemy. So our insurance for success was to keep Ma'an careless and weak, not suspecting our malevolent presence in the neighborhood. It was never easy for us to keep our movements secret, as we live by preaching to the local people, and the unconvinced would tell the Turks. Our long march into Wadi Sirhan was known to the enemy, 
and the most civilian owl could not fail to see that the only fit objective was Aqaba. The demolition of Ber and Jaffer too, for we had it confirmed that the seven wells of Jaffer were destroyed, showed that the Turks were to that extent on the alert. It might be that Jaffer really was denied to us, but we were not without hope that there too we should find the technical work of demolition ill done by these pitiful Turks. Daif Allah, a leading man of the Jazi Hawatat, one who came down to Wej and swore allegiance, had been present in Jaffer when the king's well was fired by dynamite placed about its lip, and sent a secret word from Man that he had heard the upper stones clap together and key over the mouth of the well. His conviction was that the shaft was intact, and the clearing of it a few hours' work. We hoped so, and rode away from Bear all in order on the 28th of June to find out. Quickly, we crossed the weird plain of Jaffer. Next day by noon, we were at the wells. They seemed most thoroughly destroyed, and the fear grew that we might find in them the first check to our scheme of operations, a scheme so much too elaborate that a check might be far-reaching. However, we went to the well, out as family property, of which Daif Allah had told us the tale, and began to sound about it. The ground rang hollow under our mallet, and we called for volunteers able to dig and build. Some of the agale came forward, led by the Merzugi, a capable camel boy of Nasir's. They started with the few tools we had. The rest of us formed a ring round the well depression and watched them work, singing to them and promising rewards of gold when they had found the water. It was a hot task in the full glare of the summer sun, for the Jaffer plain was of hard mud, flat as the hand, blinding white with salt, and twenty miles across. But time pressed, because if we failed we might have to ride fifty miles in the night to the next well. So we pushed the work by relays at speed through the midday heat, turning into laborers all our amenable fellows. It made easy digging, for the explosion which shifted the stones had loosened the soil. As they dug and threw out the earth, the core of the well rose up like a tower of rough stones in the center of the pit. Very carefully, we began to take away the ruined head of the pile. Difficult work, for the stones had become interlocked in their fall. But this was the better sign, and our spirits rose. Before sunset, the workers shouted that there was no more packing soil, that the interstices between the blocks were clear, and that they heard the mud fragments, which slipped through, splashing many feet below. Half an hour later came a rush and rumble of stones in the mouth, followed by a heavy splash and yells. We hurried down and by the Merzugi's torch saw the well yawning open, no longer a tube, but a deep bottle-shouldered pit, twenty feet across at the bottom, which was black with water and white in the middle with spray where the agili who had been clearing when the key slipped was striking out lustily in the effort not to drown. Everybody laughed down the well at him, till at last Abdullah lowered him a noose of rope, and we drew him up, very wet and angry, but in no way damaged by his fall. We rewarded the diggers, and feasted them on a weak camel, which had failed in the march today, and then all night we watered, while a squad of a gale, with a long chorus, stained up to ground level an eight-foot throat of mud and stones. At dawn the earth was stamped in round this, and the well stood complete, as fit in appearance as ever. Only the water was not very much. We worked it the twenty-four hours without rest, and ran it to a cream, and still some of our camels were not satisfied. From Jaffer we took action. Riders went forward into the Dumania tents to lead their promised attack against Fuela, the blockhouse which covered the head of the pass of Abba el Lisan. Our attack was planned for two days before the weekly caravan, which from Man replenished the client garrisons. Starvation would make reduction of these distant places easier, by impressing on them how hopelessly they were cut off from their friends. We sat in Jaffer, meanwhile, waiting to hear the fortune of the attack. On its success or failure would depend the direction of our next march. The halt was not unpleasant, for our position had its comic side. We were within sight of Man, 
during those minutes of the day in which the mirage did not make eyes and glasses useless. And yet we strolled about admiring our new well-lip, in complete security, because the Turkish garrison believed water impossible here or at Bear, and were hugging the pleasant idea that we were now desperately engaged with their cavalry in Sirhan. I hid under some bushes near the well for hours, against the heat, very lazy, pretending to be asleep, the wide silk sleeve of my pillow arm drawn over my face as veil against the flies. Outa sat up and talked like a river, telling his best stories in great form. At last I reproved him with a smile, for talking too much and doing too little. He sucked his lips with pleasure of the work to come. In the following dawn, a tired horseman rode into our camp with news that the Dumania had fired on the Fuela post the afternoon before, as soon as our men had reached them. The surprise had not been quite complete. The Turks manned their dry stone breastworks and drove them off. The crestfallen Arabs drew back into cover, and the enemy, believing it only an ordinary tribal affray, had made a mounted sortie upon the nearest encampment. One old man, six women, and seven children were its only occupants. In their anger at finding nothing actively hostile or able-bodied, the trooper smashed up the camp and cut the throats of its helpless ones. The Dumigny on the hilltops heard and saw nothing till it was too late. But then, in their fury, they dashed down across the return road of the murderers and cut them off almost to the last man. To complete their vengeance, they assaulted the now weakly garrison fort, carried it in the first fierceness of their rush, and took no prisoners. We were ready saddled, and within ten minutes had loaded and marched for Gadir el Haj, the first railway station south of Man, on our direct road for Abba el Isan. Simultaneously, we detached a small party to cross the railway just above Ma'an and create a diversion on that side. Especially, they were to threaten the great herds of sick camels, casualties of the Palestine front, which the Turks pastured in the Shobek plains till once more fit for service. We calculated that the news of their Fuela disaster would not have reached Ma'an till the morning, and that they could not drive in these camels, supposing our northern party missed them, and fit out a relief expedition before nightfall. And if we were then attacking the line of Gadir al Haj, they would probably divert the relief thither, and so let us move on Aqaba unmolested. With this hope, we rode steadily through the flowing mirage till afternoon, when we descended on the line, and having delivered a long stretch of it from guards and patrols, began on the many bridges of the captured section. The little garrison of Gadir al Haj sallied out with the valor of ignorance against us, but the heat haze blinded them, and we drove them off with loss. They were on the telegraph and would notify Ma'an, which beside could not fail to hear the repeated thuds of our explosive. It was our aim to bring the enemy down upon us in the night, or rather down here, where they would find no people but many broken bridges for we worked fast and did great damage. The drainage holes in the spandrels held from three to five pounds of gelatin each. We, firing our mines by short fuses, brought down the arch, shattered the pier, and stripped the side walls in no more than six minutes' work. So we ruined ten bridges and many rails and finished our explosive. After dusk, when our departure could not be seen, we rode five miles westward of the line to cover. There we made fires and baked bread. Our meal, however, was not cooked before three horsemen cantered up to report that a long column of new troops, infantry and guns, had just appeared at Abba al Isan from Man. The Dumania, disorganized with victory, had had to abandon their ground without fighting. They were at Batra waiting for us. We had lost Abba al Isan the blockhouse, the pass, the command of the Aqaba road, without a shot being fired. We learned afterwards that this unwelcome and unwanted vigor on the part of the Turks was accident. A relief battalion had reached Man that very day. The news of an Arab demonstration against Fuela arrived simultaneously, 
and the battalion, which happened to be formed up ready with its transport in the station yard, to march to barracks, was hurriedly strengthened by a section of pack artillery and some mounted men, and moved straight out as a punitive column to rescue the supposedly besieged post. They had left Mann in mid-morning, and marched gently along the motor road, the men sweating in the heat of the south country after their native Caucasian snows, and drinking thirstily of every spring. From Abba al lisan they climbed uphill toward the old blockhouse, which was deserted except for the silent vultures flying above its walls in slow, uneasy rings. The battalion commander feared lest the sight be too much for his young troops, and led them back to the roadside spring of Abba al Hassan and its serpentine narrow valley, where they camped all night in peace about the water. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 11 Fighting to the Sea. Such news shook us into quick life. We threw our baggage across our camels on the instant and set out over the rolling downs of this end of the tableland of Syria. Our hot bread was in our hands, and as we ate, there mingled with it the taste of the dust of our large force crossing the valley bottoms, and some taint of the strange keen smell of the wormwood which overgrew the slopes. In the breathless air of these evenings in the hills, after the long days of summer, Everything struck very acutely on the senses, and when marching in a great column, as we were, the front camels kicked up the aromatic, dust-laden branches of the shrubs, whose scent particles rose into the air and hung in a long mist, making fragrant the road of those behind. The slopes were clean with the sharpness of wormwood, and the hollows oppressive with the richness of their stronger, more luxuriant growths. Our night passage might have been through a planted garden, and these varieties part of the unseen beauty of successive banks of flowers. The noises, too, were very clear. Auda broke out singing, away in front, and the men joined in from time to time with the greatness, the catch at heart, of an army moving into battle. We rode all night, and when dawn came, were dismounting on the crest of the hills between Batra and Abba al Lisan with a wonderful view westwards over the green and gold Guerra plain, and beyond it to the ruddy mountains hiding Aqaba and the sea. Gassim Abu Dumek, head of the Dumaniya, was waiting anxiously for us, surrounded by his hard-bitten tribesmen, their grey strained faces flecked with the blood of the fighting yesterday. There was a deep greeting for Auda and Nasir. We made hurried plans and scattered to the work, knowing we could not go forward to Aqaba with this battalion in possession of the pass. Unless we dislodged it, our two months' hazard and effort would fail before yielding even first fruits. Fortunately, the poor handling of the enemy gave us an unearned advantage. They slept on, in the valley, while we crowned the hills in wide circle about them unobserved. We began to snipe them steadily in their positions under the slopes and rock faces by the water, hoping to provoke them out and up the hill in a charge against us. Meanwhile, Za'al rode away with our horsemen and cut them on telegraph and telephone in the plain. This went on all day. It was terribly hot, hotter than ever before I had felt in Arabia, and the anxiety and constant moving made it hard for us. Some even of the tough tribesmen broke down under the cruelty of the sun and crawled or had to be thrown under rocks to recover in their shade. We ran up and down to supply our lack of numbers by mobility, ever looking over the long ranges of hill for a new spot from which to counter this or that Turkish effort. The hillsides were steep and exhausted our breath, and the grasses twined like little hands about our ankles as we ran and plucked us back. The sharp reefs of limestone which cropped out over the ridges tore our feet, 
and long before evening the more energetic men were leaving a rusty print upon the ground with every stride. Our rifles grew so hot with sun and shooting that they seared our hands, and we had to be grudging of our rounds, considering every shot, and spending great pains to make it sure. The rocks on which we flung ourselves for aim were burning, so that they scorched our breasts and arms, from which later the skin drew off in ragged sheets. The present smart made us thirst, yet even water was rare with us. We could not afford men to fetch enough from Batra, and if all could not drink, it was better that none should. We consoled ourselves with knowledge that the enemy's enclosed valley would be hotter than our open hills, also that they were Turks, men of white meat, little apt for warm weather. So we clung to them and did not let them move or mass or sortie out against us cheaply. They could do nothing valid in return. We were no targets for their rifles, since we moved with speed, eccentrically. Also, we were able to laugh at the little mountain guns which they fired up at us. The shells passed over our heads, to burst behind us in the air. And yet, of course, for all that they could see from their hollow place fairly amongst us above the hostile summits of the hill. Just after noon, I had a heat stroke, or so pretended, for I was dead weary of it all, and cared no longer how it went. So I crept into a hollow where there was a trickle of thick water in a muddy cup of the hills, to suck some moisture off its dirt through the filter of my sleeve. Nasir joined me, panting like a winded animal, with his cracked and bleeding lips shrunk apart in his distress, and old Auda appeared, striding powerfully, his eyes bloodshot and staring, his naughty face working with excitement. He grinned with malice when he saw us lying there, spread out to find coolness under the bank, and croaked at me harshly, Well, how is it with the Howitat? All talk and no work? By God, indeed, spat I back again, for I was angry with everyone, and with myself. They shoot a lot and hit a little. Auda, almost pale with rage and trembling, tore his headcloth off and threw it on the ground beside me. Then he ran back up the hill like a madman, shouting to the men in his dreadful strained and rustling voice. They came together to him, and after a moment scattered away downhill. I feared things were going wrong, and struggled to where he stood alone on the hilltop glaring at the enemy, but all he would say to me was, get your camel if you want to see the old man's work. Nasir called for his camel and we mounted. The Arabs passed before us into a little sunken place, which rose to a low crest, and we knew that the hill beyond went down in a facile slope to the main valley of Abba al Isan, somewhat below the spring. All our four hundred camel men were here tightly collected, just out of sight of the enemy. We rode to their head and asked the shimped what it was and where the horsemen had gone. He pointed over the ridge to the next valley above us and said, Without a there! And as he spoke, yells and shots poured up in a sudden torrent from beyond the crest. We kicked our camels furiously to the edge to see our fifty horsemen coming down the last slope into the main valley like a runaway at full gallop, shooting from the saddle. As we watched, Two or three went down, but the rest thundered forward at marvelous speed, and the Turkish infantry, huddled together under the cliff, ready to cut their desperate way out towards Mon in the first dusk, began to sway in and out, and finally broke before the rush, adding their flight to Auda's charge. Nasir screamed at me, Come on, with his bloody mouth, and we plunged our camels madly over the hill, and down towards the head of the fleeing enemy. The slope was not too steep for a camel gallop, but steep enough to make their pace terrific, and their course uncontrollable. Yet the Arabs were able to extend to right and left and to shoot into the Turkish brown. The Turks had been too bound up in the terror of Auda's furious charge against their rear to notice us as we came over the eastward slope. So we also took them by surprise and in the flank, and a charge of ridden camels going nearly thirty miles an hour was irresistible. The Hawitat were very fierce, for the slaughter of their women on the day before had been a new and horrible side of warfare suddenly revealed to them. 
so there were only a hundred and sixty prisoners, many of them wounded, and three hundred dead and dying were scattered over the open valleys. A few of the enemy got away, the gunners on their teams, and some mounted men and officers with their jazzy guides. Muhammad al Daylan chased them for three miles into Mrega, hurling insults as he rode, that they might know him and keep out of his way. The feud of Auda and his cousins had never applied to Muhammad, the political-minded, who showed friendship to all men of his tribe when he was alone to do so. Among the fugitives was Daif Allah, who had done us the good turn about the king's well at Jaffer. Auda came swinging up on foot, his eyes glazed over with the rapture of battle, and the words bubbling with incoherent speed from his mouth. Work, work, where are words? Work, bullets, Abu Tayi! And he held up his shattered field glasses, his pierced pistol holster, and his leather sword scabbard cut to ribbons. He had been the target of a volley which had killed his mare under him, but the six bullets through his clothes had left him scatheless. He told me later, in strict confidence, that thirteen years before he had bought an amulet Koran for one hundred and twenty pounds, and had not since been wounded. Indeed, death had avoided his face, and gone scurvily about killing brothers, sons, and followers. The book was a Glasgow reproduction, costing eighteen pence, but Auda's deadliness did not let people laugh at his superstition. He was wildly pleased with the fight, most of all because he had confounded me and shown what his tribe could do. Muhammad was wroth with us for a pair of fools, calling me worse than Auda, since I had insulted him by words like flung stones to provoke the folly which had nearly killed us all, though it had killed only two of us, one Rueli and one Sharari. It was, of course, a pity to lose any one of our men, but time was of importance to us, and so imperative was the need of dominating Ma'an to shock the little Turkish garrisons between us and the sea into surrender, that I would have willingly lost much more than the two. On occasions like this, death justified himself and was cheap. Meanwhile, our Arabs had plundered the Turks, their baggage train, and their camp, and soon after moonrise, Auda came to us and said that we must move. It angered Nasir and myself. Tonight there was a dewy west wind blowing, and at Abba al Hassan's four thousand feet, after the heat and burning passion of the day, its damp chill struck very sharply on our wounds and bruises. The spring itself was a thread of silvery water in a runnel of pebbles, across delightful turf, green and soft, on which we lay, wrapped in our cloaks, wondering if something to eat were worth preparing, for we were subject at the moment to the physical shame of success, a reaction of victory, when it became clear that nothing was worth doing and that nothing worthy had been done. Auda insisted. Partly it was superstition. He feared the newly dead around us. Partly lest the Turks return in force. Partly lest other clans of the Hawitat take us, lying there broken and asleep. Some were his blood enemies. Others might say they came to help our battle, and in the darkness thought we were Turks and fired blindly. So we roused ourselves and jogged the sorry prisoners into line. Most had to walk. Some twenty camels were dead or dying from wounds which they had got in the charge, and others were over weak to take a double burden. The rest were loaded with an Arab and a Turk, but some of the Turkish wounded were too hurt to hold themselves on pillion. In the end, we had to leave about twenty on the thick grass beside the rivulet, where at least they would not die of thirst, though there was little hope of life or rescue for them. Nasir set himself to bag blankets for these abandoned men, who were half-naked. And while the Arabs packed, I went off down the valley where the fight had been, to see if the dead had any clothing they could spare. But the Bedouin had been beforehand with me, and had stripped them to the skin. Such was their point of honor. To an Arab, an essential part of the triumph of victory was to wear the clothes of an enemy, and next day we saw our force transformed, as to the upper half, into a Turkish force, each man in a soldier's tunic. For this was a battalion straight from home, very well found and dressed in new uniforms. In the end, 
our little army was ready and wound slowly up the height and beyond into a hollow sheltered from the wind. And there, while the tired men slept, we dictated letters to the sheikhs of the coastal Hawitat, telling them of the victory, that they might invest their nearest Turks and hold them till we came. We had been kind to one of the captured officers, a policeman despised by his regular colleagues, and him we persuaded to be our Turkish scribe to the commandants of Guwera, Kethera, and Hadra, the three posts between us and Aqaba, telling them that if her blood was not hot, we took prisoners, and that prompt surrender would ensure their good treatment and safe delivery to Egypt. This lasted till dawn, and then Auda marshaled us for the road, and led us up the last mile of soft, heath-clad valley between the rounded hills. It was intimate and homelike till the last green bank, when suddenly we realized it was the last, and beyond lay nothing but clear air. The lovely change this time checked me with amazement, and afterwards, however often we came, there was always a catch of eagerness in the mind, a pricking forward of the camel, and straightening up to see again over the crest into openness. Star Hillside swooped away below us for hundreds and hundreds of feet, in curves like bastions, against which summer morning clouds were breaking, and from its foot opened the new earth of the Guerra Plain. Abba al rounded limestone breasts were covered with soil and heath, green, well watered. Guerra was a map of pink sand, brushed over with streaks of watercourses in a mantle of scrub. And out of this, and bounding this, towered islands and cliffs of glowing sandstone, wind-scarped and rain-furrowed, tinted celestially by the early sun. After days of travel on the plateau in prison valleys, to meet this brink of freedom was a rewarding vision, like a window in the wall of life. We walked down the whole zigzag pass of Star to feel its excellence, for on our camels we rocked too much with sleep to dare see anything. At the bottom, the animals found a matted thorn which gave their jaws pleasure. We in front made a halt, rolled onto sand soft as a couch, and incontinently slept. Auda came. We pleaded that it was for mercy upon our broken prisoners. He replied that they alone would die of exhaustion if we rode, but if we dallied, both parties might die. For truly there was now little water and no food. However, we could not help it, and stopped that night short of Guerra after only fifteen miles. At Guerra lay Sheikh Ibn Jad, balancing his policy to come down with the stronger. And today, we were the stronger, and the old fox was ours. He met us with honeyed speeches. The hundred and twenty Turks of the garrison were his prisoners. We agreed with him to carry them at his leisure and their ease to Aqaba. Today was the 4th of July. Time pressed us, for we were hungry, and Aqaba was still far ahead behind two defenses. The nearer post, Kethera, stubbornly refused parley with our flags. Their cliff commanded the valley, a strong place which it might be costly to take. We assigned the honor, in irony, to Ibn Jad and his unwearied men, advising him to try it after dark. He shrank, made difficulties, pleaded the full moon. But we cut hardly into this excuse, promising that tonight for a while there should be no moon. By my diary, there was an eclipse. Duly it came, and the Arabs forced the post without loss, while the superstitious soldiers were firing rifles and clanging copper pots to rescue their threatened satellite. Reassured, we set out across the strand-like plain. Niazi Bey, the Turkish battalion commander, was Nasir's guest, to spare him the humiliation of Bedouin contempt. Now he sidled up by me, and his swollen eyelids and long nose betraying the moroseness of the man, began to complain that an Arab had insulted him with a gross Turkish word. I apologized, pointing out that it must have been learnt from the mouth of one of his Turkish fellow governors. The Arab was repaying Caesar. Caesar, not satisfied, pulled from his pocket a wizened hunch of bread to ask if it was fit breakfast for a Turkish officer. 
my heavenly twins, foraging in Guerra, had bought, found, or stolen a Turkish soldier's ration loaf, and we had quartered it. I said it was not breakfast, but lunch and dinner, and perhaps tomorrow's meals as well. I, a staff officer of the British Army, not less well fed than the Turkish, had eaten mine with a relish of victory. It was defeat, not bread, which stuck in his gullet, and I begged him not to blame me for the issue of a battle imposed on both our honours. The narrows of Wadi Itam increased in intricate ruggedness as we penetrated deeper. Below Kathira, we found Turkish post after Turkish post, empty. Their men had been drawn into Kadra, the entrenched position at the mouth of Itam, which covered Aqaba so well against the landing from the sea. Unfortunately for them, the enemy had never imagined attack from the interior, and of all their great works not one trench or post faced inland. Our advance from so new a direction threw them into panic. In the afternoon, we were in contact with this main position, and heard from the local Arabs that the subsidiary posts about Aqaba had been called in or reduced, so that only a last three hundred men barred us from the sea. We dismounted for a council, to hear that the enemy were resisting firmly, in bomb-proof trenches with a new artesian well. Only it was rumoured that they had little food. No more had we. It was a deadlock. Our council swayed this way and that. Arguments bickered between the prudent and the bold. Tempers were short and bodies restless in the incandescent gorge whose granite peaks radiated the sun in a myriad shimmering points of light, and into the depths of whose torturous bed no wind could come to relieve the slow saturation of the air with heat. Our numbers had swollen double. So thickly did the men crowd in the narrow space and press about us that we broke up our council twice or thrice, partly because it was not good they should overhear us wrangling, partly because in the sweltering confinement our unwashed smells offended us. Through our heads the heavy pulses throbbed like clocks. We sent the Turks summonses, first by white flag and then by Turkish prisoners, but they shot at both. This inflamed our Bedouin, and while we were yet deliberating, a sudden wave of them burst up onto the rocks and sent a hail of bullets spattering against the enemy. Nasir ran out barefoot to stop them, but after ten steps on the burning ground, screeched for sandals. While I crouched in my atom of shadow, too wearied of these men, whose minds all wore my livery, to care who regulated their febrile impulses. We had a third try to communicate with the Turks, by means of a little conscript, who said that he understood how to do it. We walked down close to the trenches with him, and sent in for an officer to speak with us. After some hesitation, this was achieved, and we explained the situation on the road behind us, our growing forces, and our short control over their tempers. The upshot was that they promised to surrender at daylight, so we had another sleep, an event rare enough to chronicle, in spite of our thirst. Next day at dawn, fighting broke out on all sides, for hundreds more hillmen, again doubling our number, had come in the night, and not knowing the arrangement, began shooting at the Turks, who defended themselves. Nasir went out, with Ibn de Gaythir and Azagil marching in fours, down the open bed of the valley. Our men ceased fire. The Turks then stopped, for their rank and file had no more fight in them, and no more food, and thought we were well supplied. So the surrender went off quietly after all. As the Arabs rushed in to plunder, I noticed an engineer in grey uniform, with red beard and puzzled blue eyes, and spoke to him in German. He was the well-borer and knew no Turkish. Recent doings had amazed him, and he begged me to explain what we meant. I said that we were a rebellion of the Arabs against the Turks. This it took him time to appreciate. He wanted to know who was our leader. I said the Sharif of Mecca. He supposed he would be sent to Mecca. I said rather to Egypt. He inquired the price of sugar, and when I replied, 
cheap and plentiful, he was glad. The loss of his belongings he took philosophically, but was sorry for the well, which a little work would have finished as his monument. He showed me where it was, with the pump only half built. By pulling on the sludge bucket, we drew enough delicious clear water to quench our thirsts. Then we raced through a driving sandstorm down to Aqaba, four miles further, and splashed into the sea on July the 6th, just two months after our setting out from Wedge. End of Chapter 11Chapter 12 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 12 Aqaba, Suez, Allenby. We sat down to watch our men streaming past as lines of flushed, vacant faces without message for us. For months, Aqaba had been the horizon of our minds, the goal. We had no thought, we had refused thought, of anything beside. Now, in achievement, we were a little despising the entities which had spent their extremest effort on an object whose attainment changed nothing radical, either in mind or body. Hunger called us out of our trance. We had now 700 prisoners in addition to our own 500 men and 2,000 expectant allies. We had not any money, or indeed a market, and the last meal had been two days ago. In our riding camels, we possessed meat enough for six weeks, but it was poor diet and a deer diet, indulgence in which would bring future immobility upon us. Supper taught us the urgent need to send news over the 150 desert miles to the British at Suez for a relief ship. I decided to go across myself with a party of eight, mostly Hawitat, on the best camels in the force. One even was the famous Jedha, the seven-year-old for whom the Nawasara had fought the Beni Sakr. As we rode round the bay, we discussed the manner of our journey. If we went gently, Sparing the animals, they might fail with hunger. If we rode hard, they might break down with exhaustion or sore feet in mid-desert. Finally, we agreed to keep at a walk, however tempting the surface, for so many hours of the twenty-four as our endurance would allow. On such time tests, the man, especially if he were a foreigner, usually collapsed before the beast. In particular, I had ridden fifty miles a day for the last month and was near my limit of strength. If I held out, we should reach Suez in fifty hours of a march, and to preclude cooking halts upon the road, we carried lumps of boiled camel and broiled dates in a rag behind our saddles. Near midnight, we reached Temed, the only wells on our route, in a clean valley sweep below the deserted guardhouse of the Sinai police. We let the camels breathe, gave them water, and drank ourselves. Then forward again, plodding through a silence of night so intense that continually we turned round in the saddles at fancied noises away there by the cloak of stars. But the activity lay in ourselves, in the crackling of our passage through the undergrowth, perfumed like ghost flowers about us. We marched into the very slow dawn. At sunup, we were far out in the plain through which sheaves of watercourses gathered toward Arish, and we stopped to give our camels a few minutes' mockery of pasture. Then again in the saddle till noon, and past noon, when behind the mirage rose the lonely ruins of Nekel. These we left on our right. At sunset, we halted for an hour. Camels were sluggish, and ourselves utterly wearied, but Motlog, the one-eyed owner of Jedha, called us to action. We remounted, and at a mechanical walk climbed the Mitla Hills. The moon came out and their tops, contoured in form lines of limestone strata, shone as though crystalline with snow. In the dawn, 
we passed a melon field sown by some adventurous Arab in this no-man's land between the armies. We halted another of our precious hours, loosing the disgusted camels to search the sand valleys for food while we cracked the unripe melons and cooled our chapped lips on their pithy flesh. Then again forward, in the heat of the new day, though the canal valley, constantly refreshed by breezes from the Gulf of Suez, was never too oppressive. By midday, we were through the dunes, after a happy switchback ride up and down their waves, and out on the flatter plain. Suez was to be guessed at, as the frieze of indeterminate points, mowing and bobbing in the mirage of the canal hollow far in front. We reached great trench lines, with forts and barbed wire, roads and railways, falling to decay. We passed them without challenge. Our aim was the Shat, a post opposite Suez on the Asiatic bank of the canal, and we gained it at last near three in the afternoon, forty-nine hours out of Aqaba. For a tribal raid this would have been fair time, and we were tired men before ever we started. Shat was in unusual disorder, without even a sentry to stop us, plague having appeared there two or three days before. So the old camps had been hurriedly cleared, left standing, while the troops bivouacked out in the clean desert. Of course, we knew nothing of this, but hunted in the empty offices till we found a telephone. I rang up Suez headquarters and said I wanted to come across. They regretted that it was not their business. The inland water transport managed transit across the canal, after their own methods. There was a sniff of implication that these methods were not those of the general staff. Undaunted, for I was never a partisan of my nominal branch of the service, I rang up the office of the water board, explained that I had just arrived in shot from the desert with urgent news for headquarters. They were sorry, but had no free boats just then. They would be sure to send first thing in the morning to carry me to the quarantine department, and rang off. Now I had been four months in Arabia, continually on the move. In the last four weeks I had ridden 1,400 miles by camel, not sparing myself anything to advance the war. But I refused to spend a single superfluous night with my familiar vermin. I wanted a bath, and something with ice in it to drink. To change these clothes, all sticking to my saddle sores and filthiness, to eat something more tractable than green date and camel sinew. I got through again to the inland water transport and talked like Chrysostom. It had no effect, so I became vivid. Then, once more, they cut me off. I was growing very vivid when friendly northern accents from the military exchange floated down the line. It's no bloody good, sir, talking to them fooking water boogers. This expressed the apparent truth, and the broad-spoken operator worked me through to the embarkation office. Here Littleton, a major of the busiest, had added to his innumerable labors out of catching Red Sea warships one by one as they entered Suez roads and persuading them, how some loved it, to pile high their decks with stores for Wedge or Yembo. In this way, he ran our thousands of bales and men, free, as a by-play in his routine, and found time as well to smile at the curious games of us curious folk. He never failed us. As soon as he heard who and where I was, and what was not happening in the inland water transport, the difficulty was over. His launch was ready, would be at the shad in half an hour. I was to come straight to his office, and not explain, till perhaps now after the war, that a common harbour launch had entered the sacred canal without permission of the water directorate. All fell out, as he said. I sent my men and camels north to Kubri, where by telephone from Suez, I would prepare them rations and shelter in the animal camp on the Asiatic shore. Later, of course, came the reward of hectic and astonishing days in Cairo. Littleton saw my weariness and let me go at once to the hotel. Long ago it had seemed poor, but now was become splendid, and after conquering its first hostile impression of me in my dress, it produced the hot baths and the cold drinks, six of them, and the dinner and bed of my dreams. The most willing intelligence officer, 
warned by spies of a disguised European in the Sinai Hotel, charged himself with the care of my men at Kubri, and provided tickets and passes for me to Cairo next day. At Ismailia, passengers for Cairo changed to wait until the express from Port Said was due. In the other train shone an opulent saloon, from which descended Admiral Weymouth and Burmester and Neville, with a very large and superior general. A terrible tension grew along the platform as the party marched up and down it in weighty talk. Officers saluted once, twice. Still they marched up and down. Three times was too much. Some withdrew to the fence and stood permanently to attention. These were the mean souls. Some fled. These were the contemptibles. Some turned to the bookstall and studied bookbacks avidly. These were shy. Only one was blatant. Burmester's eye caught my staring. He wondered who it was, for I was burned crimson and very haggard with travel. Later I found my weight to be less than seven stone. However, he answered, and I explained the history of our unannounced raid on Aqaba. It excited him. I asked that the Admiral send a storeship there at once. Burmester said the Dufferin, which came in that day, should load all the food in Suez, go straight to Aqaba, and bring back the prisoners. Splendid! He would order it himself, not to interrupt the Admiral and Allenby. Allenby? What's he doing here? cried I. Oh, he's in command now. And Murray? Gone home. This was news of the biggest importantly, concerning me, and I climbed back and fell to wondering if this heavy, rubicund man was like ordinary generals, and if we should have trouble for six months teaching him. Murray and Belinda had begun so tiresomely that our thought those first days had been not to defeat the enemy, but to make our own chiefs let us live. Only by time and performance had we converted Sir Archibald and his chief of staff, who in their last months wrote to the war office commending the Arab venture, and especially Faisal in it. This was generous of them, and our secret triumph, for they were an odd pair in one chariot, Murray, all brains and claws, nervous, elastic, changeable, Lyndon Bell so solidly built up of layers of professional opinion, glued together after government testing and approval, and later trimmed and polished to standard pitch. At Cairo, my sandaled feet slip-slapped up the quiet Savoy corridors to Clayton, who habitually cut the lunch hour to cope with his thronging work. As I entered, he glanced up from his desk with muttered Mushfadi, Anglo-Egyptian for engaged. But I spoke and got a surprised welcome. In Suez the night before, I had scribbled a short report, so we had to talk only of what needed doing. Before the hour ended, the Admiral rang up to say that the Dufferin was loading flour for her emergency trip. Clayton drew 16,000 pounds in gold and got an escort to take it to Suez by the three o'clock train. This was urgent, that Nasir might be able to meet his debts. The notes we had issued at Ber, Jaffer, and Guerra were penciled promises on army telegraph forms to pay so much to Bearer and Aqaba. It was a great system, but no one had dared issue notes before in Arabia, because the Bedouins had neither pockets in their shirts nor strong rooms in their tents, and notes could not be buried for safety. So there was an unconquerable prejudice against them, and for our good name it was essential that they be early redeemed. Afterwards, in the hotel, I tried to find clothes less publicly exciting than my Arab get-up, but the moss had corrupted all my former store and it was three days before I became normally ill-dressed. Before I was clothed, the commander-in-chief sent for me, curiously. In my report, thinking of Saladin and Abu Obedah, I had stressed the strategic importance of the eastern tribes of Syria and their proper use as a threat to the communications of Jerusalem. This jumped with his ambitions, and he wanted to weigh me. It was a comic interview, for Allenby was physically large and confident, and morally so great that the comprehension of our littleness came slow to him. He sat in his chair, 
looking at me, not straight as his custom was, but sideways, puzzled. He was newly from France, where for years he had been a tooth of the great machine grinding the enemy. He was full of Western ideas of gunpowder and weight, the worst training for our war. But as a cavalryman was already half persuaded to throw up the new school in this different world of Asia and accompany Donne and Chetwode along the worn road of maneuver and movement. Yet he was hardly prepared for anything so odd as myself, a little, barefooted, silk-skirted man, offering to hobble the enemy by his preaching, if given stores and arms and a fund of 200,000 sovereigns to convince and control his converts. Allenby could not make out how much was genuine performer and how much charlatan. The problem was working behind his eyes, and I left him unhelped to solve it. He did not ask many questions, nor talk much, but studied the map and listened to my unfolding of eastern Syria and its inhabitants. At the end, he put up his chin and said quite directly, Well, I will do for you what I can, and that ended it. I was not sure how far I had caught him, but we learned gradually that he meant exactly what he said, and that what General Allenby could do was enough for his very greediest servant. End of Chapter 12Chapter 13 of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 13 Reforming Ourselves. Upon Clayton, I opened myself completely. Aqaba had been taken on my plan by my effort. The cost of it had fallen on my brain and nerves. There was much more I felt inclined to do, and capable of doing, if he thought I had earned the right to be my own master. The Arab said that each man believed his ticks to be gazelles. I did, fervently. Clayton agreed that they were spirited and profitable ticks but objected that actual command could not be given to an officer junior to the rest. He suggested Joyce as commanding officer at Aqaba, a notion which suited me perfectly. Joyce was a man in whom one could rest against the world, a serene, unchanging, comfortable spirit. His mind, like a pastoral landscape, had four corners to its view, cared for, friendly, limited, displayed. The rest was easy. For supply officer, we would have Goslett, the London businessman who had made chaotic wedge so prim. The aeroplanes could not yet be moved, but the armored cars might come straight away, and a guard ship if the admiral was generous. We rang up Sir Rosalind Weymouth, who was very generous. His flagship, the Euryalus, should sit there for the first few weeks. Genius this was, for in Arabia, ships were esteemed by the number of funnels, and the Euryalus with four was exceptional in ships. Her great reputation assured the mountains that we were indeed the winning side, and her huge crew, by the prompting of Everard Fielding, for fun built us a good pier. On the Arab side, I asked that the expensive and difficult wedge be closed down, and Faisal come to Aqaba with his full army. Then I showed that Aqaba was Allenby's right flank, only 100 miles from his center, but 800 miles from Mecca. As the Arabs prospered, their work would be done more and more in the Palestine sphere. So it was logical that Faisal be transferred from the area of King Hussein to become an army commander of the Allied expedition of Egypt under Allenby. This idea held difficulties. Would Faisal accept? I had talked it over with him in Wej months ago. The High Commissioner? Faisal's army had been the largest and most distinguished of the Hejaz units. Its future would not be dull. General Wingate had assumed full responsibility for the Arab movement in its darkest moment, at great risk in reputation. Dare we ask him to relinquish its advance guard now, on the very threshold of success? 
Clayton, knowing Wingate very well, was not afraid to broach the idea to him, and Wingate replied promptly that if Allenby could make direct and large use of Faisal, it would be both his duty and his pleasure to give him up for the good of the show. A third difficulty of the transfer might be King Hussein, an obstinate, narrow-minded, suspicious character, little likely to sacrifice a pet vanity for unity of control. His opposition would endanger the scheme, and I offered to go down to talk him over, calling on the way to get from Faisal such recommendations of the change as should fortify the powerful letters which Wingate was writing to the king. This was accepted. The Dufferin, on returning from Aqaba, was detailed to take me to Jidda for the new mission. The king came down from Mecca and talked discursively. Wilson was the royal touchstone by which to try doubtful courses. Thanks to him, the proposed transfer of Faisal to Allenby was accepted at once, King Hussein taking the opportunity to stress his complete loyalty to our alliance. Then, changing his subject, as usual without obvious coherence, he began to expose his religious position, neither strong Shia nor strong Sunni, aiming rather at a simple pre-schism interpretation of the faith. In foreign politics, he betrayed a mind as narrow as it had been broad in unworldly things, with much of that destructive tendency of little men to deny the honesty of opponents. I grasped something of the fixed jealousy which made the modern Faisal suspect in his father's court, and realized how easily mischief-makers could corrode the king. While we played so interestingly at Jeddah, two abrupt telegrams from Egypt shattered our peace. The first reported that the Hawatat were in treasonable correspondence with Ma'an. The second connected Auda with the plot. This dismayed us. Wilson had traveled with Auda and formed the inevitable judgment of his perfect sincerity. Yet Muhammad al Daylan was capable of double play, and Ibn Jad and his friends were still uncertain. We prepared to leave at once for Aqaba. Treachery had not been taken into account when Nasir and I had built our plan for the town's defense. Fortunately, the Harding was in harbor for us. On the third afternoon we were in Aqaba, where Nasir had no notion that anything was wrong. I told him only of my wish to greet Auda. He lent me a swift camel and guide, and at dawn we found Auda and Mohammed and Zal all in a tent at Guera. They were confused when I dropped in on them, unheralded but protested that all was well. We fed together as friends. Others of the Hawitat came in, and there was gay talk about the war. I distributed the king's presents and told them to their laughter that Nasir had got his month's leave to Mecca. The king, an enthusiast for the revolt, believed that his servants should work as manfully, so he would not allow visits to Mecca, and the poor men found continual military service heavy banishment from their wives. We had jested a hundred times that, if he took Aqaba, Nasir would deserve a holiday, but he had not really believed in its coming until I gave him Hussein's letter the evening before. In gratitude, he sold me Ghazala, the regal camel he won from the Hawatat. As her owner, I became of new interest to the Abu Tayyi. After lunch, by pretense of sleep, I got rid of the visitors and then abruptly asked Auda and Muhammad to walk with me to see the ruined fort and reservoir. When we were alone, I touched on their present correspondence with the Turks. Auda began to laugh, Muhammad to look disgusted. At last they explained elaborately that Muhammad had taken out a seal and written to the governor of Ma'an, offering to desert the Sharif's cause. The Turk had replied gladly, promising great rewards. Muhammad asked for something on account. Auda then heard of it, waited till the messenger with presents was on his way, caught him, robbed him to the skin, and was denying Muhammad a share of the spoils. A farcical story, and we laughed richly over it, but there was more behind. They were angry that no guns or troops had yet come to their support, and that no rewards had been given them for taking Aqaba. They were anxious to know how I had learnt of their secret dealings, and how much more I knew. We were on a slippery ledge. I played on their fear by my unnecessary amusement, quoting in careless laughter, as if they were my own words, 
actual phrases of the letters they had exchanged. This created the impression desired. Parenthetically, I told them Faisal's army was coming up and how Allenby was sending rifles, guns, high explosive, food and money to Aqaba. Finally, I suggested that Auda's present expenses in hospitality must be great. Would it help if I advanced something of the great gift Faisal would make him, personally, when he arrived? Auda saw that the immediate moment would not be unprofitable, that Faisal would be highly profitable, and that the Turks would be always with him if other resources failed. So he agreed, in a very good temper, to accept my advance, and with it to keep the Hawatat well fed and cheerful. It was near sunset. Za'al had killed a sheep, and we ate again in real amity. Afterwards, I remounted, with Mufadi, to draw out his allowance, and Abd al-Rahman, a servant of Muhammad's, who, so he whispered me, would receive any little thing I wished to send him separately. We rode all night towards Aqaba, where I roused Nasir from sleep, to run over our last business. Then... I paddled out in a derelict canoe from Euryalus Jetty to the Harding, just as the first dawn crept down the western peaks. I went below, bathed, and slept till mid-morning. When I came on deck, the ship was rushing grandly down the narrow gulf under full steam for Egypt. My appearance caused a sensation, for they had not dreamed I could reach Guerra, assure myself, and get back in less than six or seven days to catch a later steamer. We rang up Cairo and announced that the situation at Guerra was thoroughly good and no treachery abroad. This may have been hardly true, but since Egypt kept us alive by stinting herself, we must reduce impolitic truth to keep her confident and ourselves a legend. The crowd wanted book heroes and would not understand how more human old Auda was because, after battle and murder, his heart yearned towards the defeated enemy now subject at his free choice, to be spared or killed, and therefore never so lovely. End of chapter 13Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter 14. Pricking the Enemy. Vessels steamed up the Gulf of Aqaba. Faisal landed, and with him Jafar, his staff, and Joyce, the fairy godmother. There came the armored cars, Goslet, Egyptian laborers and thousands of troops. To repair the six weeks' peace, Falkenhayn had been down to advise the Turks, and his fine intelligence made them worthier our opposition. Man was a special command under Bejet, the old GOC, Sinai. He had 6,000 infantry, a regiment of cavalry, and mounted infantry, and had entrenched Ma'an till it was impregnable according to the standard of maneuver war. A flight of airplanes operated daily thence. Great supply dumps had been collected. By now, the Turkish preparations were complete. They began to move, disclosing that their objective was Guerra, the best road for Aqaba. Two thousand infantry pushed out to Abba al-Lisan and fortified it. Cavalry kept the outskirts, to contain a possible Arab counterstroke from the Wadi Musa side. This nervousness was our cue. We would play with them and provoke them to go for us in Wadi Musa, where the natural obstacles were so tremendous that the human defending factor might behave as badly as it liked and yet hold the place against attack. To bait the hook, the men of neighboring Delaga were set busy. The Turks, full of spirit, put in a counterstroke and suffered sharply. We rubbed into the peasantry of Wadi Musa, the rich booty now enjoyed by their rivals of Dalaga. Maloud, the old war horse, went up with his mule-mounted regiment and quartered himself among the famous ruins of Petra. 
the encouragedly Athena, under their one-eyed sheikh Khalil, began to foray out across the plateau and to snap up by twos and threes Turkish riding or transport animals, together with the rifles of their occasional guards. This went on for weeks, while the irritated Turks grew hotter and hotter. We could also prick the Turks into discomfort by asking General Salman for his promised long-distance air raid on Ma'an. As it was difficult, Salman had chosen Stent, with other tried pilots of Rabeg or Wej, and told them to do their best. They had experience of forced landing on desert surfaces, and could pick out an unknown destination across unmapped hills. Stent spoke Arabic perfectly. The flight had to be air-contained, but its commander was full of resource and display, like other bundles of nerves, who, to punish themselves, did outrageous things. On this occasion, he ordered low flying to make sure the aim, and profited by reaching Ma'an and dropping 32 bombs in and about the unprepared station. Two bombs into the barracks killed 35 men and wounded 50. Eight struck the engine shed, heavily damaging the plant and stock. A bomb in the general's kitchen finished his cook and his breakfast. Four fell on the aerodrome. Despite the shrapnel, our pilots and engines returned safely to their temporary landing ground at Kuntila above Aqaba. That afternoon, they patched the machines and after dark slept under their wings. In the following dawn, they were off once more, three of them this time, to Abba el Lisan, where the sight of the great camp had made Stent's mouth water. They bombed the horse lines and stampeded the animals, visited the tents, and scattered the Turks. As on the day before, they flew low and were much hit, but not fatally. Long before noon, they were back in Kuntila. Stent looked over the remaining petrol and bombs, and decided they were enough for one more effort. So he gave directions to everyone to look for the battery, which had troubled them in the morning. They started in the midday heat. Their loads were so heavy they could get no height, and therefore came blundering over the crest behind Abba el Lisan, and down the valley at about 300 feet. The Turks, always somnolent at noon, were taken completely by surprise. Thirty bombs were dropped. One silenced the battery. The others killed dozens of men and animals. Then the lightened machine soared up and home to El Arish. The Arabs rejoiced. The Turks were seriously alarmed. Bejet Pasha set his men to digging shelters. And when his airplanes had been repaired, he disposed them innocuously about the plateau for camp defense. By air... We had perturbed the Turks. By irritative raids, we were luring them towards a wrong objective. Our third resource, to ruin their offensive, was to hinder the railway, whose need would make them split up the striking force on defensive duties. Accordingly, we arranged many demolitions for mid-September. I decided also to revive the old idea of mining a train, Something more vigorous and certain than automatic mines was indicated, and I had imagined the direct firing, by electricity, of a charge under the locomotive. The British sappers encouraged me to try, especially General Wright, the chief engineer in Egypt, whose experience took a sporting interest in my irregularities. He sent me the recommended tools, an exploder and some insulated cable. With them... I went on board HMS Humber, our new guard ship, and introduced myself to Captain Snag, in command. Snag was fortunate in his ship, which had been built for Brazil and was much more comfortably furnished than British monitors. And we were doubly fortunate in him and in this, for he was the spirit of hospitality. His inquiring nature took interest in the shore and saw the comic side, even of our petty disasters. To tell him the story of a failure was to laugh at it, and always, for a good story, he gave me a hot bath and tea, with civilized trappings, free from every suspicion of blown sand. 
His kindness and help served us in lieu of visits to Egypt for repairs and enabled us to hammer on against the Turks through month after month of feckless disappointment. The exploder was in a formidable locked white box, very heavy. We split it open, found a ratchet handle, and pushed it down without harming the ship. The wire was heavy rubber insulated cable. We cut it in half, fastened the ends to screw terminals on the box, and transmitted shocks to one another convincingly. It worked. I fetched detonators. We stuffed the free ends of the cable into one and pumped the handle. Nothing followed. We tried again and again ineffectually, grieving over it. At last, Snag rang his bell for the gunner warrant officer, who knew all about circuits. He suggested special electric detonators. The ship carried six and gave me three of them. We joined one up with our box, and when the handle was crashed down, it popped off beautifully. So I felt that I knew all about it and turned to arrange the details of the raid. Of targets, the most promising and easiest reach seemed Mudawara, a water station, 80 miles south of Man. A smashed train there would embarrass the enemy. For men, I would have tried Hawatat, and at the same time, the expedition would test the three Horani peasants whom I had added to my personal followers. In view of the new importance of the Horan, there was need for us to learn its dialect, the construction and jealousies of its clan framework, and its names and roads. These three fellows, Rahel, Asaf, and Hamid, would teach me their home affairs imperceptibly as we rode on business, chatting. To make sure of the arrested train required guns and machine guns. For the first, why not trench mortars? For the second, Lewis guns. Accordingly, Egypt chose two forceful sergeant instructors from the army school at Zaytun to teach squads of Arabs in Aqaba how to use such things. Snag gave them quarters in his ship, since we had, as yet, no convenient English camp ashore. Their names may have been Yells and Brook, but became Lewis and Stokes after their jealously loved tools. Lewis was an Australian, long, thin, and sinuous, his supple body lounging in unmilitary curves, his hard face, arched eyebrows, and predatory nose set off the peculiarly Australian air of reckless willingness and capacity to do something very soon. Stokes was a stocky English yeoman, workmanlike and silent, always watching for an order to obey. Lewis, full of suggestion, emerged bursting with delight at what had been well done whenever a thing happened. Stokes never offered opinion until after action, when he would stir his cap reflectively and painstakingly recount the mistakes he must next time avoid. Both were admirable men, in a month, without common language or interpreter, they got on terms with their classes and taught them their weapons with reasonable precision. More was not required, for an empirical habit appeared to agree with the spirit of our haphazard raids, better than complete scientific knowledge. As we worked at the organization of the raid, our appetites rose. Mudawara Station sounded vulnerable. Three hundred men might rush it suddenly. That would be an achievement, for its deep well was the only one in the dry sector below Ma'an. Without its water, the train service across the gap would become uneconomic in load. Lewis, the Australian, at such an ambitious moment, said that he and Stokes would like to be of my party, a new, attractive idea. With them, we should feel sure of our technical detachments whilst attacking a garrison place. Also, the sergeants wanted to go very much, and their good work deserved reward. They were warned that their experiences might not, at the moment, seem altogether joyful. There were no rules, and there could be no mitigation of the marching, feeding, and fighting inland. If they went, they would lose their British Army comfort and privilege to share and share with the Arabs, except in booty 
and suffer exactly their half in food and discipline. If anything went wrong with me, they, not speaking Arabic, would be in a tender position. Lewis replied that he was looking for just this strangeness of life. Stokes supposed that if we did it, he could. So they were lent two of my best camels, their saddlebags tight with bully beef and biscuits, and on the 7th of September, 1917, we went together up Wadi Itam to collect our habitat from Auda in Guerra. For the sergeant's sake, to harden them gently, things were made better than my word. We marched very easily for today, while we were our own masters. Neither had been on a camel before, and there was risk that the fearful heat of the naked granite walls of Itam might knock them out before the trip had properly begun. September was a bad month. A few days before, in the shade of the palm garden of Aqaba Beach, the thermometer had shown 120 degrees, so we halted for midday under a cliff, and in the evening rode only 10 miles to camp for the night. Next day, in the early heat, we were near Guerra, comfortably crossing the sanded plain of restful pink, with its grey-green undergrowth, when there came a droning through the air. Quickly, we drove the camels off the open road into the bush-speckled ground, where their irregular colouring would not be marked by the enemy airmen. For the loads of blasting gelatin, my favourite and most powerful explosive, and for the many ammonel-filled shells of the Stokes gun, would be ill neighbours in a bombing raid. We waited there, soberly, in the saddle, while our camels grazed the little which was worth eating in the scrub, until the airplane had circled twice about the rock of Guerra in front of us, and planted three loud bombs. The airplane was the quaint regulator of public business in the Guerra camp. The Arabs, up as ever before dawn, waited for it. Mastur set a slave on the crag's peak to sound the first warning. When its constant hour drew near, the Arabs would saunter, chatting in parade of carelessness towards the rock. Arrived beneath it, each man climbed to the ledge he favoured. After, Mastur would climb the bevy of his slaves with his coffee on the brazier and his carpet. In a shaded nook, he and Auda would sit and talk, till the little shiver of excitement tightened up and down the crowded ledges when first was heard the song of the engine over the pass of Star. Everyone pressed back against the wall and waited stilly while the enemy circled vainly above the strange spectacle of this crimson rock, banded with thousands of gaily-dressed Arabs nesting like ibises in every cranny of its face. The aeroplane dropped three bombs, or four bombs, or five bombs, according to the day of the week. Their bursts of dense smoke sat on the sage-green plain, compactly like cream puffs, writhing for minutes in the windless air before they slowly spread and faded. Though we knew there was no menace in it, yet we could not but catch our breath when the sharp growing cry of the falling bombs came through the loud engine overhead. Gladly, we left the noise and heart-burning of Guerra. So soon as we had lost our escort of flies, we halted. Indeed, there was no need of haste, and the two unfortunate fellows with me were tasting of such heat as they had never known. For the stifling air was like a metal mask over our faces. It was admirable to see them struggle not to speak of it that they might keep the spirit of the Aqaba undertaking to endure it as firmly as the Arabs. But by this silence, the sergeants went far past their bond. It was ignorance of Arabic which made them so superfluously brave, for the Arabs themselves were loud against the tyrannous sun and the breathlessness. But the test effort was wholesome, and for effect I played about, seeming to enjoy myself. In the late afternoon, we marched further and stopped for the night under a thick screen of tamarisk trees. The camp was very beautiful, for behind us rose a cliff, perhaps 400 feet in height, 
a deep red in the level sunset. Under our feet was spread a floor of buff-colored mud, as hard and muffled as wood paving, flat like a lake for half a mile each way. And on a low ridge to one side of it stood the grove of tamarisk stems of brown wood, edged with a sparse and dusty fringe of green, which had been faded by drought and sunshine, till it was nearly of the silvered grey below the olive leaves about Les Beaux, when a wind from the river mouth rustled up the valley grass and made the trees turn pale. We were riding for rum, the northern water of the Beni Atayi, a place which stirred my thought, and as even the unsentimental Hawatat had told me, it was lovely. The morrow would be new with our entry to it, but very early, while the stars were yet shining, I was roused by Aid, the humble Harithi Sharif accompanying us. He crept to me and said in a chilled voice, Lord, I am gone blind. I made him lie down and felt that he shivered as if cold, but all he could tell me was that in the night, waking up, there had been no sight, only pain in his eyes. The sun blink had burned them out. Day was still young as we rode, between two great pikes of sandstone, to the foot of a long, soft slope, poured down from the domed hills in front of us. It was tamarisk-covered, the beginning of the Valley of Rum, they said. We looked up on the left to a long wall of rock, shearing in like a thousand-foot wave toward the middle of the valley, whose other arc, to the right, was an opposing line of steep, red, broken hills. We rode up the slope, crashing our way through the brittle undergrowth. As we went, the brushwood grouped itself into thickets, whose mass leaves took on a stronger tint of green, the purer for their contrasted setting in plots of open sand of a cheerful, delicate pink. The ascent became gentle till the valley was a confined, tilted plain. The hills on the right grew taller and sharper, a fair counterpart of the other side, which straightened itself to one massive rampart of redness. They drew together until only two miles divided them, and then, towering gradually, till their parallel parapets must have been a thousand feet above us, ran forward in an avenue for miles. They were not unbroken walls of rock, but were built sectionally, in crags like gigantic buildings along the two sides of their street. Deep alleys, fifty feet across, divided the crags, whose plains were smoothed by the weather into huge apses and bays, and enriched with surface fretting and fracture, like design. Caverns high up on the precipice were round like windows. Others near the foot gaped like doors. Dark stains ran down the shadowed front for hundreds of feet, like accidents of use. The cliffs were striated vertically in their granular rock, whose main order stood on two hundred feet of broken stone, deeper in color and harder in texture. This plinth did not, like the sandstone, hang in folds like cloth, but chipped itself into loose courses of scree, horizontal as the footings of a wall. The crags were capped in nests of domes, less hotly red than the body of the hill, rather gray and shallow. They gave the finishing semblance of Byzantine architecture to this irresistible place, this processional way greater than imagination. The Arab armies would have been lost in the length and breadth of it, and within the walls a squadron of airplanes could have wheeled in formation. Our little caravan grew self-conscious and fell dead quiet, afraid and ashamed to flaunt its smallness in the presence of the stupendous hills. For hours, the perspectives grew greater and more magnificent in ordered design, till a gap in the cliff face opened on our right to a new wonder. The gap, perhaps three hundred yards across, was a crevice in such a wall, and led to an amphitheater, oval in shape, shallow in front, and long lobed right and left. The walls were precipices, 
looked like all the walls of rum, but appeared greater, for the pit lay in the very heart of a ruling hill, and its smallness made the besetting height seem overpowering. The sun had sunk behind the western wall, leaving the pit in shadow but its dying glare flooded with startling red the wings each side of the entry and the fiery bulk of the further wall across the great valley. The pit floor was of damp sand, darkly wooded with shrubs, while about the feet of all the cliffs lay boulders, greater than houses sometimes, indeed like fortresses, which had crashed down from the sheer heights above. In front of us a path, pale with use, zigzagged up the cliff plinth to the point from which the main face rose, and there it turned precariously southward along a shallow ledge outlined by occasional leafy trees. From between these trees, in hidden crannies of the rock, issued strange cries. The echoes turned into music of the voices of the Arabs watering camels at the springs which there flowed out three hundred feet above ground. Mohammed turned into the amphitheater's left-hand lobe. At its far end, Arab ingenuity had cleared a space under an overhanging rock. There we unloaded and settled down. The dark came upon us quickly in this high prison place, and we felt the water-laden air cold against our sunburnt skin. The Hawitat, who had looked after the loads of explosives, collected their camel drove, and led them with echo-testing shouts up the hill path to water against their early return to Gowera. We lit fires and cooked rice to add to the sergeant's bully beef, while my coffee men prepared for the visitors who would come to us. The Arabs in the tents outside the hollow of the springs had seen us enter, and were not slow to learn our news. In an hour, we had the headmen of the Derosha, Zalabani, Zueda, and Togada clans about us, and there mounted great talk, none too happy. Aid, the Sharif, was too cast down in heart by his blindness to lift the burden of entertainment from my shoulders, and a work of such special requirements was not to be well done by me alone. End of chapter 14「on the 16th of September, 1917, we rode out from Rum. Aid, the blind Sharif, insisted on coming, despite his lost sight, saying he could ride if he could not shoot, and that if God prospered us, he would take leave from Faisal in the flush of the success and go home, not too sorry, to the blank life which would be left. Za'al led his 25 Nawasara a clan of Audas Arabs who called themselves my men and were famous the desert over for their saddle camels. My hard riding tempted them to my company. Old Motlog al Awar, owner of Al Jedha, the finest she camel in North Arabia, rode her in our van. We looked at her with proud or greedy eyes, according to our relationship with him. My gazala was taller and more grand with a faster trot, but too old to be galloped. However, she was the only other animal in the party, or indeed in this desert, to be matched with the Jedha, and my honor was increased by her dignity. The rest of our party strayed like a broken necklace. No one group would ride or speak with another, and I passed back and forth all day like a shuttle, talking first to one lowering shake and then to another, striving to draw them together, so that before a cry to action came there might be solidarity. As yet, they agreed only in not hearing any word from Zal as to the order of our march. 
though he was admitted the most intelligent warrior and the most experienced. For my private part, he was the only one to be trusted further than eyesight. Of the others, it seemed to me that neither their words nor their counsels, perhaps not their rifles, were sure. We put our midday halt in a fertile place, where the late spring rain, falling on a sandy talus, had brought up a thick tufting of silvery grass, which our camels loved. The weather was mild, perfect as an August in England, and we lingered in great content, recovered at last from the bickering appetites of the days before the start, and from that slight rending of nerve, inevitable when leaving even a temporary settlement. Man, in our circumstances, took root so soon. Late in the day, we rode again, winding downhill in a narrow valley between moderate sandstone walls. Till before sunset, we were out on another flat of laid yellow mud, like that which had been so wonderful a prelude to rum's glory. By its edge, we camped. My care had borne fruit, for we settled in only three parties, by bright fires of crackling, flaring tamarisk. At one sup my men, at the second za'al, at the third the other hawitat, and late at night when all the chiefs had been well adjusted with gazelle meat and hot bread, it became possible to bring them to my neutral fire and discuss sensibly our course for the morrow. It seemed that about sunset we should water at Mudawara well, two or three miles this side of the station, in a covered valley. Then, in the early night, we might go forward to examine the station and see if, in our weakness, we might yet attempt some stroke against it. I held strongly to this, against the common taste, for it was by so much the most critical point of the line. The Arabs could not see it, since their minds did not hold a picture of the long, linked Turkish front with its necessitous demands. However, we had reached internal harmony and scattered confidently to sleep. In the morning, we delayed to eat again, having only six hours of march before us, and then pushed across the mud flat to a plain of firm limestone rag carpeted with brown, weather-blunted flint. This was succeeded by low hills, with occasional soft beds of sand, under the steeper slopes where eddying winds had dropped their dust. Through these, we rode up shallow valleys to a crest, and then by light valleys, down the far side, whence we issued abruptly from dark, tossed stone heaps into the sun-steeped wideness of a plain. Across it, an occasional low dune stretched a drifting line. We had made our noon halt at the first entering of the broken country, and rightly, in the late afternoon, came to the well. It was an open pool, a few yards square, in a hollow valley of large stone slabs and flint and sand. The stagnant water looked uninviting. Over its face lay a thick mantle of green slime, from which swelled curious bladder islands of floating fatty pink. The Arabs explained that the Turks had thrown dead camels into the pool to make the water foul, but that time had passed, and the effect was grown faint. It would have been fainter had the criterion of their effort been my taste. Yet, it was all the drink we should get up here unless we took Mudawara, so we set to and filled our water skins. One of the Hawatat, while helping in this, slipped off the wet edge into the water. Its green carpet closed oily over his head and hid him for an instant. Then he came up gasping vigorously and scrambled out amid our laughter, leaving behind him a black hole in the scum from which a stench of old meat rose like a visible pillar and hung about us and him and the valley disconcertingly. At dusk, Zal and I, with the sergeants and others, crept forward quietly. In half an hour, we were at the last crest, in a place where the Turks had dug trenches and stoned up an elaborate outpost of engrailed sangars, which on this black, new moon night of our raid were empty. In front and below lay the station, 
its doors and windows sharply marked by the yellow cooking fires and lights of the garrison. It seemed close under our observation, but the Stokes gun would carry only three hundred yards. Accordingly, we went nearer, hearing the enemy noises, and attentively afraid lest their barking dogs uncover us. Sergeant Stokes made casts out to left and right in search of gun positions, but found nothing that was satisfactory. Meanwhile, Zal and I crawled across the last flat till we could count the unlighted tents and hear the men talking. One came out a few steps in our direction, then hesitated. He struck a match to light a cigarette, and the bowl light flooded his face so that we saw him plainly, a young, hollow-faced, sickly officer. He squatted, busy for a moment, and returned to his men, who hushed as he passed. We moved back to our hill and consulted in whispers. The station was very long, of stone buildings, so solid that they might be proof against our time-fused shell. The garrison seemed about two hundred. We were one hundred and sixteen rifles, and not a happy family. Surprise was the only benefit we could be sure of. So in the end, I voted that we leave it, unalarmed, for a future occasion, which might be soon. But actually, one accident after another saved Mudawara, and it was not until August 1918 that Buxton's Camel Corps at last measured to it the fate so long overdue. Quietly, we regained our camels and slept. Next morning, we returned on our tracks to let a fold of the plain hide us from the railway, and then marched south across the sandy flat, seeing tracks of gazelle, oryx, and ostrich, within one spot stale pad marks of leopard. We were making for the low hills bounding the far side, intending to blow up a train, for Zael said that where these touched the railway was such a curve as we needed for mine laying, and that the spurs commanding it would give us ambush and a field of fire for our machine guns. So we turned east in the southern ridges till within half a mile of the line. There the party halted in a thirty-foot valley, while a few of us walked down to the line, which bent a little eastward to avoid the point of higher ground under our feet. The point ended in a flat table fifty feet above the track, facing north across the valley. The metals crossed the hollow on a high bank, pierced by a two-arch bridge for the passage of rainwater. This seemed an ideal spot to lay the charge. It was our first try at electric mining, and we had no idea what would happen. But it stood to our reason that the job would be more sure with an arch under the explosive, because... Whatever the effect on the locomotive, the bridge would go, and the succeeding coaches be inevitably derailed. Back with our camels, we dumped the loads and sent the animals to safe pasture near some undercut rocks from which the Arabs scraped salt. The freedmen carried down the Stokes gun with its shells, the Lewis guns, and the gelatin with its insulated wire, magneto, and tools to the chosen place. The sergeants set up their toys on a terrace while we went down to the bridge to dig a bed between the ends of two steel sleepers, wherein to hide my fifty pounds of gelatin. We had stripped off the paper wrapping of the individual explosive plugs and kneaded them together by help of the sun heat into a shaking jelly in a sandbag. The burying of it was not easy. The embankment was steep and in the sheltered pocket between it and the hillside was a wind-laid bank of sand. No one crossed this but myself, stepping carefully, yet I left unavoidable great prints over its smoothness. The ballast dug out from the track. I had to gather in my cloak for carriage and repeated journeys to the culvert, whence it could be tipped naturally over the shingle bed of the watercourse. It took me nearly two hours to dig in and cover the charge, then came the difficult job of unrolling the heavy wires from the detonator to the hills whence we would fire the mine. The top sand was crusted and had to be broken through in burying the wires. They were stiff wires, which scarred the wind-rippled surface with long lines like the belly marks of preposterously narrow and heavy snakes. When pressed down in one place, they rose into the air in another. At last, 
they had to be weighted down with rocks, which in turn had to be buried at the cost of great disturbance of the ground. Afterwards, it was necessary, with a sandbag, to stipple the marks into a wavy surface, and finally, with a bellows and long fanning sweeps of my cloak, to simulate the smooth laying of the wind. The whole job took five hours to finish, but then it was well finished. Neither myself nor any of us could see where the charge lay, or that double wires led out underground from it to the firing point, two hundred yards off, behind the ridge marked for our riflemen. The wires were just long enough to cross from this ridge into a depression. There we brought up the two ends and connected them with the electric exploder. It was an ideal place, both for it and for the men who fired it, except that the bridge was not visible thence. However, this only meant that someone would have to press the handle at a signal from a point fifty yards ahead, commanding the bridge and the ends of the wire alike. Salem, Faisal's best slave, asked for this task of honor, and was yielded it by acclamation. The end of the afternoon was spent in showing him, on the disconnected exploder, what to do, till he was act perfect, and banged down the ratchet precisely as I raised my hand with an imaginary engine on the bridge. We walked back to camp, leaving one man on watch by the line. Our baggage was deserted, and we stared about in a puzzle for the rest, till we saw them suddenly, sitting against the golden light of sunset along a high ridge. We yelled to them to lie down or come down, but they persisted up there on their perch, like a school of hooded crows, in full view of north and south. At last, we ran up and threw them off the skyline, too late. The Turks, in a little hill post by Halat Amar, four miles south of us, had seen them, and opened fire in their alarm upon the long shadows which the declining sun was pushing gradually up the slopes towards the post. Bedouin were past masters in the art of using country, but in their abiding contempt for the stupidity of the Turks, they would take no care to fight them. This ridge was visible at once from Mudawara and Halat Amar, and they had frightened both places by their sudden, ominous, expectant watch. However, the dark closed on us, and we knew we must sleep away the night patiently in hope of the morrow. Perhaps the Turks would reckon us gone if our place looked desert in the morning. So we lit fires in a deep hollow, baked bread, and were comfortable. The common tasks had made us one party, and the hilltop folly shamed everyone into agreement that Zal should be our leader. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Revolt in the Desert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence. Chapter Sixteen Victory and Loot. Day broke quietly and for hours we watched the empty railway with its peaceful camps. The constant care of Zal, and of his lame cousin, Hawaymil, kept us hidden, though with difficulty, because of the insatiate restlessness of the Bedouin, who would never sit down for ten minutes, but must fidget and do or say something. This defect made them very inferior to the stolid English for the long, tedious strain of a waiting war. Also, it partly accounted for their uncertain stomachs in defense. Today, they made us very angry. Perhaps, after all, the Turks saw us, for at nine o'clock some forty men came out of the tents on the hilltop by Halid Amar to the south and advanced in open order. If we left them alone, they would turn us off our mine in an hour. If we opposed them with our superior strength and drove them back, the railway would take notice and traffic be held up. It was a quandary, which eventually we tried to solve by sending thirty men to check the enemy patrol gradually, and if possible, to draw them lightly aside into the broken hills. 
This might hide our main position and reassure them as to our insignificant strength and purpose. For some hours, it worked as we had hoped. The firing grew desultory and distant. A permanent patrol came confidently up from the south and walked past our hill, over our mine and on toward Mudawara, without noticing us. There were eight soldiers and a stout corporal, who mopped his brow against the heat, for it was now after eleven o'clock and really warm. When he had passed us by a mile or two, the fatigue of the tramp became too much for him. He marched his party into the shade of a long culvert, under whose arches a cool draught from the east was gently flowing, and there in comfort they lay on the soft sand, drank water from their bottles, smoked and at last slept. We presumed that this was the noonday rest, which every solid Turk in the hot summer of Arabia took as a matter of principle, and that their allowing themselves the pause showed that we were disproved or ignored. However, we were in error. Noon brought a fresh care. Through my powerful glasses, we saw a hundred Turkish soldiers issue from Mudawara station and make straight across the sandy plain towards our place. They were coming very slowly, and no doubt unwillingly, for sorrow at losing their beloved midday sleep. But at their very worst marching in temper, they could hardly take more than two hours before they reached us. We began to pack up, preparatory to moving off, having decided to leave the mine and its leads in place on chance that the Turks might not find them, and we be able to return and take advantage of all the careful work. We sent a messenger to our covering party on the south that they should meet us further up, near those scarred rocks, which served as screen for our pasturing camels. Just as he had gone, the watchman cried out that smoking clouds was rising from Halid Amar. Zal and I rushed uphill, and saw by its shape and volume that indeed there must be a train waiting in that station. As we were trying to see it over the hill, suddenly it moved out in our direction. We yelled to the Arabs to get into position as quick as possible, and there came a wild scramble over sand and rock. Stokes and Lewis, being booted, could not win the race, but they came well up, their pains and dysentery forgotten. The men with rifles posted themselves in a long line behind the spur, running from the guns, past the exploder, to the mouth of the valley. From it, they would fire directly into the derailed carriages at less than 150 yards, whereas the ranges for the Stokes and Lewis guns were about 300 yards. An Arab stood up on high behind the guns and shouted to us what the train was doing, a necessary precaution, for if it carried troops and detrained them behind our ridge, we should have to face about like a flash and retire fighting up the valley for our lives. Fortunately, it held on at all the speed the two locomotives could make on wood fuel. It drew near where we had been reported, and opened random fire into the desert. I could hear the racket coming, as I sat on my hillock by the bridge to give the signal to Salem, who danced round the exploder on his knees, crying with excitement and calling urgently on God to make him fruitful. The Turkish fire sounded heavy, and I wondered with how many men we were going to have a fare and if the mine would be advantage enough for our eighty fellows to equal them. It would have been better if the first electrical experiment had been simpler. However, at that moment, the engines, looking very big, rocked with screaming whistles into view around the bend. Behind them followed ten box wagons, crowded with rifle muzzles at the windows and doors, and in little sandbag nests on the roofs, Turks precariously held on to shoot at us. I had not thought of two engines, and on the moment decided to fire the charge under the second, so that however little the mines affect, the uninjured engine should not be able to uncouple and drag the carriages away. Accordingly, when the front driver of the second engine was on the bridge, I raised my hand to Salem. There followed a terrific roar, and the line vanished from sight behind a spouting column of black dust and smoke a hundred feet high and wide. Out of the darkness came shattering crashes and long, loud, metallic clangings of ripped steel, with many lumps of iron and plate, while one entire wheel of a locomotive whirled up suddenly, black out of the cloud against the sky, 
and sailed musically over our heads to fall slowly and heavily into the desert behind. Except for the flight of these, there succeeded a deathly silence, with no cry of men or rifle shot, as the now gray mist of the explosion drifted from the line towards us and over our ridge until it was lost in the hills. In the lull, I ran southward to join the sergeants. Salem picked up his rifle and charged out into the murk. Before I had climbed to the guns, the hollow was alive with shots and with the brown figures of the Bedouin leaping forward to grips with the enemy. I looked round to see what was happening so quickly and saw the train stationary and dismembered along the track, with its wagon sides jumping under the bullets which riddled them while the Turks were falling out from the far doors to gain the shelter of the railway embankment. As I watched, our machine guns chattered out over my head, and the long rows of Turks on the carriage roofs rolled over and were swept off the top like bales of cotton before the furious shower of bullets which stormed along the roofs and splashed clouds of yellow chips from the planking. The dominant position of the guns had been an advantage to us so far. When I reached Stokes and Lewis, the engagement had taken another turn. The remaining Turks had got behind the bank, here about eleven feet high, and from cover of the wheels were firing point-blank at the Bedouin, twenty yards away across the sand-filled dip. The enemy in the crescent of the curving line were secure from the machine guns, but Stokes slipped in his first shell, and after a few seconds there came a crash as it burst beyond the train in the desert. He touched the elevating screw, and his second shot fell just by the trucks, in the deep hollow below the bridge, where the Turks were taking refuge. It made a shambles of the place. The survivors of the group broke out in a panic across the desert, throwing away their rifles and equipment as they ran. This was the opportunity of the Lewis gunners. The sergeant grimly traversed with drum after drum, till the open sand was littered with bodies. Mushagraf, the Sharari boy behind the second gun, saw the battle over, threw aside his weapon with a yell, and dashed down at speed with his rifle to join the others, who were beginning, like wild beasts, to tear open the carriage and fall to plunder. It had taken nearly ten minutes. I ran down to the ruins to see what the mine had done. The bridge was gone, and into its gap was fallen the front wagon, which had been filled with sick. The smash had killed all but three or four, and had rolled dead and dying into a bleeding heap against the splintered end. One of those yet alive deliriously cried out the word typhus, so I wedged shut the door and left them there, alone. Succeeding wagons were derailed and smashed. Some had frames irreparably buckled. The second engine was a blanched pile of smoking iron. Its driving wheels had been blown upward, taking away the side of the firebox. Cab and tender were twisted into strips among the piled stones of the bridge abutment. It would never run again. The front engine had got off better, though heavily derailed and lying half over with the cab burst, yet its steam was at pressure and driving gear intact. The valley was a weird sight. The Arabs, gone raving mad, were rushing about at top speed, bareheaded and half-naked, screaming, shooting into the air, clawing one another nail and fist, while they burst open trucks and staggered back and forward with immense bales, which they ripped by the rail side and tossed through, smashing what they did not want. There were scores of carpets spread about, dozens of mattresses and flowered quilts, blankets in heaps, clothes for men and women in full variety, clocks, cooking pots, food, ornaments and weapons. To one side stood thirty or forty hysterical women, unveiled, tearing their clothes and hair, shrieking themselves distracted, the Arabs, without regard to them, went on wrecking the household goods, looting their absolute fill. Camels had become common property. Each man frantically loaded the nearest with what it could carry and shoot it westward into the void while he turned to his next fancy. Seeing me tolerably unemployed, the women rushed and caught at me with howls for mercy. I assured them that all was going well, 
but they would not get away till some husbands delivered me. These knocked their wives off, and seized my feet in a very agony of terror of instant death. A Turk so broken down was a nasty spectacle. I kicked them off as well as I could with bare feet, and finally broke free. Lewis and Stokes had come down to help me. I was a little anxious about them, for the Arabs, having lost their wits, were as ready to assault friend as foe. Three times I had had to defend myself, when they pretended not to know me, and snatched at my things. However, the sergeant's war-stained khaki presented few attractions. Lewis went out east of the railway to count the thirty men he had slain, and incidentally to find Turkish gold and trophies in their haversacks. Stokes strolled through the wrecked bridge, saw there the bodies of twenty Turks torn to pieces by his second shell, and retired hurriedly. Ahmed came up to me, with his arms full of booty, and shouted. No Arab could speak normally in the thrill of victory. That an old woman in the last wagon but one wished to see me. I sent him at once, empty-handed, for my camel and some baggage camels to remove the guns, for the enemy's fire was now plainly audible, and the Arabs, sated with spoils, were escaping one by one towards the hills, driving tottering camels before them into safety. It was bad tactics to lead the guns until the end, but the confusion of a first, overwhelmingly successful experiment had dulled our judgment. Ahmed never brought the camels. My men, possessed by greed, had dispersed over the land with the Bedouins. The sergeants and I were alone by the wreck, which had a strange silence now. We began to fear that we must abandon the guns and run for it, but just then saw two camels dashing back. Za'al and Hawaymil had missed me and had returned in search. We were rolling up the insulated cable, our only piece. Za'al dropped from his camel and would have me mount and ride. But instead, we loaded it with the wire and the exploder. Za'al found time to laugh at our quaint booty after all the gold and silver in the train. Hawaymil was dead lame from an old wound in the knee and could not walk but we made him couch his camel and hoisted the Lewis guns tied butt to butt like scissors behind his saddle. There remained the trench mortars, but Stokes reappeared, unskillfully leading by the nose a baggage camel he had found straying. We packed the mortars in haste, put Stokes, who was still weak with his dysentery, on Zal's saddle with the Lewis guns and sent off the three camels in charge of Hawaymil at their best pace. Meanwhile, Louis and Zal, in a sheltered and invisible hollow behind the old gun position, made a fire of cartridge boxes, petrol and waste, banked round it the Lewis drums and the spare small arms ammunition, and gingerly on the top laid some loose stoke shells. Then we ran. As the flames reached the cordite and ammonel, there was a colossal and continuing noise. The thousands of cartridges exploded in series like massed machine guns, and the shells roared off in thick columns of dust and smoke. The outflanking Turks, impressed by the tremendous defense, felt that we were in strength and strongly posted. They halted their rush, took cover, and began carefully to surround our position and reconnoiter it according to rule, while we sped panting into concealment among the ridges. It seemed a happy ending to the affair, and we were glad to get off with no more loss than my camels and baggage, though this included the sergeant's cherished kits. However, there was food at rum, and Zal thought perhaps we should find our property with the others, who were waiting ahead. We did. My men were loaded with booty, and had with them all our camels, whose saddles were being suddenly delivered of spoils to look ready for our mounting. We asked if anyone were hurt, and a voice said that the shimp's boy, a very dashing fellow, had been killed in the first rush forward at the train. This rush was a mistake, made without instructions, as the Lewis and Stokes guns were sure to end the business if the mine worked properly, so I felt that his loss was not directly my reproach. Three men had been slightly wounded, then one of Faisal's slaves vouchsafed that Salem was missing. 
we called everyone together and questioned them. At last an Arab said that he had seen him lying hit just beyond the engine. This reminded Lewis, who, ignorant that he was one of us, had seen a negro on the ground there, badly hurt. I had not been told and was angry, for half the Hawitat must have known of it, and that Salem was in my charge. By their default, now for the second time, I had left a friend behind. I asked for volunteers to come back and find him. After a little, Zal agreed and then twelve of the Nawasara. We trotted fast across the plain towards the line. As we topped the last ridge but one, we saw the train wreck with Turks swarming over it. There must have been one hundred and fifty of them, and our attempt was hopeless. Salem would have been dead, for the Turks did not take Arab prisoners. Indeed, they used to kill them horribly. So in mercy, we were finishing those of our badly wounded, who would have to be left helpless on abandoned ground. We gave up Salem and prepared heavily to march away. Of our ninety prisoners, ten were friendly Medina women, electing to go to Mecca by way of Faisal. There had been twenty-two riderless camels. The women had climbed onto five pack saddles, and the wounded were in pairs on the residue. It was late in the afternoon. We were exhausted. The prisoners had drunk all our water. We must refill from the old well at Mudawara that night to sustain ourselves so far as rum. As the well was close to the station, it was highly desirable that we get to it and away, lest the Turks divine our course and find us there defenseless. We broke up into little parties and struggled north. Victory always undid an Arab force, so we were no longer a raiding party, but a stumbling baggage caravan loaded to breaking point with enough household goods to make rich an Arab tribe for years. My sergeants asked me for a sword each, as souvenir of their first private battle. As I went down the column to look out something, suddenly I met Faisal's freedmen, and to my astonishment, on the crupper behind one of them, strapped to him, soaked with blood, unconscious, was the missing Salem. I trotted up to Farron, and asked wherever he had found him. He told me that when the Stokes gun fired its first shell, Salem rushed past the locomotive, and one of the Turks shot him in the back. The bullet had come out near his spine, without in their judgment hurting him mortally. After the train was taken, the Hawitat had stripped him of cloak, dagger, rifle, and headgear. Midjbil, one of the freedmen, had found him, lifted him straight to his camel, and trekked off homeward without telling us. Furhan, overtaking him on the road, had relieved him of Salem, who, when he recovered, as later he did perfectly, bore me always a little grudge for having left him behind when he was of my company and wounded. I had failed in my staunchness. My habit of hiding behind a sharif was to avoid measuring myself against the pitiless Arab standard with its no mercy for foreigners who wore its clothes and aped its manners. Not often was I caught with so poor a shield as blind Sharif Aid. We reached the well in three hours and watered without mishap. Afterwards, we moved off another ten miles or so, beyond fear of pursuit. There we lay down and slept, and in the morning found ourselves happily tired. Stokes had had his dysentery heavy upon him the night before but sleep and the ending of anxiety made him well. He and I and Lewis, the only unburdened ones, went on in front across one huge mud flat after another, till just before sunset we were at the bottom of Wadi Rum. This new route was important for our armored cars, because his twenty miles of hard mud might enable them to reach Mudawara easily. If so, we should be able to hold up the circulation of trains when we pleased. Thinking of this, we wheeled into the avenue of rum, still gorgeous in sunset color, the cliffs as red as the clouds in the west, like them in scale, and in the level bar they raised against the sky. Again, we felt how rum inhibited excitement by its serene beauty. Such whelming greatness dwarfed us, stripped off the cloak of laughter, in which we had ridden over the Jokan Flats. Two days later, we were at Aqaba, 
entering in glory, laden with precious things and boasting that the trains were at our mercy. From Aqaba, the two sergeants took hurried ship to Egypt. Cairo had remembered them and gone peevish because of their non-return. However, they could pay the penalty of this cheerfully. They had won a battle single-handed, had had dysentery, lived on camel milk, and learned to ride a camel fifty miles a day without pain. Also, Allenby gave them a medal each. End of chapter 16「Revolt in the Desert」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Atul Sharma, Winnipeg, Canada. Revolt in the Desert by Thomas Edward Lawrence Chapter 17 Making Up Our Minds October 1917 was a month of anticipation for us. In the knowledge that Allenby, with Bowles and Donay, was planning to attack the Gaza-Beersheba line. Gaza had been entrenched on a European scale, with line after line of defenses in reserve. It was so obviously the enemy's strongest point that the British higher command had twice chosen it for frontal attack. Allenby, fresh from France, insisted that any further assault must be delivered by overwhelming numbers of men and guns, and their thrusts maintained by enormous quantities of all kinds of transport. Donay sought to destroy the enemy's strength with the least fuss. He advised a drive at the far end of the Turkish line, near Beersheba. To make his victory cheap, he wanted the enemy main force behind Gaza, which would be best secured if the British concentration was hidden, so that the Turks would believe the flank attack to be a shallow feint. We on the Arab front were very intimate with the enemy. Our Arab officers had been Turkish officers, and knew every leader on the other side, personally. Relation between us and them was universal, for the civil population of the enemy area was wholly ours, without pay or persuasion. In consequence, our intelligence service was the widest, fullest, and most certain imaginable. We knew, better than Allenby, the enemy hollowness and the magnitude of the British resources. We underestimated the crippling effect of Allenby's too plentiful artillery and the cumbrous intricacy of his infantry and cavalry, which moved only with rheumatic slowness. We hoped Allenby would be given a month's fine weather, and in that case expected to see him take not merely Jerusalem, but Haifa too, sweeping the Turks in ruin through the hills. Such would be our moment, and we needed to be ready for it in the spot where our weight and tactics would be least expected and most damaging. For my eyes, the center of attraction was Dara'a, the junction of the Jerusalem, Haifa, Damascus, Medina railways, the naval of the Turkish armies in Syria, the common point of all their fronts, and, by chance, an area in which lay great untouched reserves of Arab fighting men, educated and armed by Faisal from Aqaba. I pondered for a while whether we should not call up all these adherents and tackle the Turkish communications in force. We were certain, with any management, of 12,000 men, enough to rush Dara'a, to smash all the railway lines, even to take Damascus by surprise. Any one of these things would make the position of the Beersheba army critical, and my temptation to stake our capital instantly upon the issue was very sore. The local people were imploring us to come. Sheikh Talal al Haridin, leader of the hollow country about Dara'a, sent repeated messages that with a few of our riders as proof of Arab support, he would give us Dara'a. Such an exploit would have done the Allenby business but was not one which Faisal could scrupulously afford unless he had a fair hope of then establishing himself there. Dara'a's sudden capture, followed by a retreat, would have involved the massacre or the ruin of all the splendid peasantry of the district. They could only rise once, and their effort on that occasion must be decisive. To call them out now was to risk the best asset Faisal held for eventual success, 
on the speculation that Allenby's first attack would sweep the enemy before it, and that the month of November would be rainless, favorable to a rapid advance. I weighed the English army in my mind, and could not honestly assure myself of them. The men were often gallant fighters, but their generals as often gave away in stupidity what they had gained in ignorance. Allenby was quite untried, and his troops had been broken down in and been broken by the Murray period. Of course, we were fighting for an Allied victory, and since the English were the leading partners, the Arabs would have, in the last resort, to be sacrificed for them. But was it the last resort? The war generally was going neither well nor very ill, and it seemed as though there might be time for another try next year. So I decided to postpone the hazard for the Arab's sake. However, the Arab movement lived on Allenby's good pleasure, so it was needful to undertake some operation, less than a general revolt, in the enemy rear, an operation which could be achieved by a raiding party, without involving the settled peoples, and yet one which would please him by being of material help to the British pursuit of the enemy. These conditions and qualifications pointed, upon consideration, to an attempted cutting of one of the great bridges in the Yarmouk Valley. It was by the narrow and precipitous gorge of the river Yarmouk that the railway from Palestine climbed to Hauran on its way to Damascus. The depth of the Jordan Depression and the abruptness of the eastern plateau face made this section of the line most difficult to build. The engineers had to lay it in the very course of the winding river valley, and to gain its development, the line had to cross and recross the stream continually by a series of bridges, the furthest west and furthest east of which were hardest to replace. To cut either of these bridges would isolate the Turkish army in Palestine for one fortnight from its base in Damascus and destroy its power of escaping from Allenby's advance. To reach the Yarmouk, we should need to ride from Aqaba by way of Azraq some 420 miles. The Turks thought the danger from us so remote that they guarded the bridges insufficiently. Accordingly, we suggested the scheme to Allenby who asked that it be done on November the 5th, or one of the three following days. Nasir, our usual pioneer, was absent, but out with the Beni Sakr was Ali ibn al-Hussein, the youthful and attractive Harith Sharif, who had distinguished himself in Faisal's early desperate days about Medina, and later had out Nukum to Nukum about al-Ula. Ali, having been Jamal's guest in Damascus, had learned something of Syria, so I begged a loan of him from Faisal. His courage, his resource, and his energy were proven. There had never been any adventure, since our beginning, too dangerous for Ali to attempt, nor a disaster too deep for him to face with his high yell of a laugh. He was physically splendid, not tall nor heavy, but so strong that he would kneel down, resting his forearms palm up on the ground, and rise to his feet with a man on each hand. In addition, Ali could outstrip a trotting camel on his bare feet, keep his speed over half a mile, and then leap into the saddle. He was impertinent, headstrong, conceited, as reckless in word as in deed, impressive, if he pleased, on public occasions, and fairly educated for a person whose native ambition was to excel the nomads of the desert in war and sport. My detailed plan was to rush from Azraq under guidance of Rafa, that most gallant sheikh who had conveyed me in June, to Um Kais, in one or two huge marches with a handful of perhaps fifty men. Um Kais was Gadara, very precious with its memories of Menippus and of Maliager, the immortal Greek Syrian whose self-expression marked the highest point of Syrian letters. It stood just over the westernmost of the Yarmouk bridges, a steel masterpiece whose destruction would fairly enroll me in the Gadarene school. Only half a dozen sentries were stationed actually on the girders and abutments. Reliefs for them were supplied from a garrison of sixty, in the station buildings of Hemi, where the hot springs of Gadara yet gushed out to the advantage of local sick. My hope was to persuade some of the Abu Tayi and Erzal to come with me. These men-wolves would make certain the actual storming of the bridge. 
To prevent enemy reinforcements coming up, we would sweep the approaches with machine guns, handled by Captain Bray's Indian volunteers from the Cavalry Division in France under Jemadar Hassan Shah. The demolition of great underslung girders with limited weights of explosive was a precise operation, difficult to do under fire. Wood, the base engineer at Aqaba, was invited to come along and double me. He immediately agreed, though condemned medically for active service as a result of a bullet through the head in France. George Lloyd, who was spending a last few days in Aqaba before going to Versailles on a regretted inter-allied commission, said that he would ride up with us to Jaffer. We were making our last preparations when an unexpected ally arrived, in Emir Abed al Kader al Jazari, grandson of the chivalrous defender of Algiers against the French. To Faisal, he offered the bodies and souls of his villagers, sturdy, hard-smiting Algerian exiles living compactly along the north bank of the Yarmouk, we seized at the chance this would give us to control for a little time the middle section of the valley railway, including two or three main bridges, without the disability of raising the countryside, since the Algerians were hated strangers and the Arab peasantry would not join them. Accordingly, we put off calling Rafa to meet us at Azraq and said not a word to Zal, concentrating our thoughts instead on Wadi Khalid and its bridges. While we were in this train of mind arrived a telegram from Colonel Bremond, warning us that Abd al Kader was a spy in pay of the Turks. It was disconcerting. Faisal said to me, I know he is mad. I think he is honest. Guard your heads and use him. We carried on, showing him our complete confidence, on the principle that a crook would not credit our honesty, and that an honest man was made a crook soonest by suspicion. As a matter of fact, he was an Islamic fanatic, half insane with religious enthusiasm and a most violent belief in himself. His Muslim susceptibilities were outraged by my undisguised Christianity. His pride was hurt by our companionship, for the tribes greeted Ali as greater and treated me as better than himself. His bullet-headed stupidity broke down Ali's self-control twice or thrice into painful scenes while his final effort was to leave us in the lurch at a desperate moment, after hindering our march and upsetting ourselves and our plans as far as he could. End of chapter 17「もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、もし、A first march was always slow, and both camels and men hated the setting out on a new hazard. Loads slipped, saddles had to be regirthed, and riders changed. In addition to my own camels, Gazala, the old grandmother, now far gone in foal, and Rima, a full pointed Sharari camel which the Sukhar had stolen from the Ruala, and those of the bodyguard, I had mounted the Indians and lent one to wood. Who was delicate in the saddle and rode a fresh animal nearly every day, and one to Thorn, Lloyd's yeomanry trooper, who sat his saddle like an Arab and looked workmanlike in a headcloth, with a striped cloak over his khaki. Lloyd himself was on a thoroughbred, Dereya, which Faisal had lent him, a fine, fast looking animal, but clipped after mange and thin. Our party straggled, Wood fell behind, and my men, Being fresh and having much work to keep the Indians together, lost touch with him. So he found himself alone with Thorn and missed our turn to the east, in the blackness which always filled the depths of the Itam Gorge by night, except when the moon was directly overhead. They went on up the main track toward Guerra, riding for hours, but at last decided to wait for day in a side valley. Both were new to the country 
and not sure of the Arabs, so they took turns to keep watch. We guessed what had happened when they failed to appear at our midnight halt. And before dawn, Ahmed, Aziz, and Abd al-Rahman went back, with orders to scatter up the three or four practicable roads and bring the missing pair to rum. I stayed with Lloyd and the main body as their guide, across the curved slopes of pink sandstone and tamarisk green valleys to rum, which we entered at last, while the crimson sunset burned on its stupendous cliffs and slanted ladders of hazy fire down the walled avenue. Wood and thorn were there already, in the sandstone amphitheater of the springs. Wood was ill and lying on the platform of my old camp. He had begun to believe that he would never see us again, and was ungrateful when we proved too overcome with the awe that Rum compelled on her visitors to sympathize deeply with his sufferings. In fact, we stared and said yes, and left him lying there while we wandered whispering about the wonder of the place. Fortunately, Ahmed and Thorne thought more of food, and with supper, friendly relations were restored. Next day, while we were saddling, Ali and Abed al Qader appeared. Lloyd and I had a second lunch with them, for they were quarreling, and to have guests held them in check. Lloyd was the rare sort of traveler who could eat anything, with anybody, anyhow, and at any time. Then, making pace, we pushed across the flat, matching our camels in a burst over its velvet surface, until we overtook the main body and scattered them with the excitement of our gallop. The Indian soberly laden camels danced like ironmongery till they had shed their burdens. Then we calmed ourselves and plodded together gently up Wadi Hafira, a gash like a sword cut into the plateau. At its head lay a stiff pass to the height of Batra, but today we fell short of this, and out of laziness and craving for comfort, stopped in the sheltered bottom of the valley. We lit great fires which were cheerful in the cool evening. Faraj prepared rice, in his manner for me, as usual. Lloyd and Wood and Thorne had brought with them bully beef in tins and British army biscuits, so we joined ranks and feasted. Next day, we climbed the zigzag broken pass, the grassy streets of Fafira below us, framing a cone hill in its center, with, as background, the fantastic gray domes and glowing pyramids of the mountains of Rum, prolonged today into wider fantasies by the cloud masses brooding over them. We watched our long train wind upwards, till before noon the camels, Arabs, Indians, and baggage had reached the top without accident. Contentedly, we plumped ourselves down in the first green valley over the crest, sheltered from the wind and warmed by the faint sunshine which tempered the autumn chill of this high tableland. Someone began to talk again about food. I went away north, scouting with Awad, a Sharari camel boy, engaged in rum without investigation. There were so many baggage camels in our party, and the Indians proved such novices at loading and leading them, that my bodyguard were being diverted from their proper duty of riding with me. So when Showak introduced his cousin, a Kayal Sharari who would serve with me on any conditions, I accepted him at the glance and now set out to measure his worth in a predicament. We circled round Abba al Lisan to make sure that the Turks were in seemly idleness, for they had a habit of rushing a mounted patrol over the Batra sites at sudden notice, and I had no mind to put our party into unnecessary action yet. Awad was a ragged, brown-skinned lad of perhaps eighteen, splendidly built, with the muscles and sinews of an athlete, active as a cat, alive in the saddle, he rode magnificently, and not ill-looking, though with an air of constant and rather suspicious expectancy, as though he looked any moment for something new from life, and that something not of his seeking or ordering, nor wholly grateful. Awad, before me, showed himself confused and self-conscious, though with his fellows he could be merry and full of japes. His engagement was a sudden fortune beyond dreams, and he was pitifully determined to suit my mind. For the moment, this was to wander across the Mon High Road in order to draw the Turks' notice. When we had succeeded, and they trotted out in chase, we returned back, doubled again, and so tricked their mule riders away northward out of the direction of danger. Awad took gleeful concern in the game, 
and handled his new rifle well. Afterwards, I climbed with him to the top of a hill overlooking Batra and the valleys which sloped to Abba el Lisan, And we lay there lazily till we saw Ali's cavalcade beginning to lip over the head of the pass. Then we ran down the slopes to meet them and heard how he had lost four camels on the pass. Also, he had fallen out again with Abd al Kader, from whose deafness and conceit and boorish manners he prayed God to deliver him. We left them to follow us after dark, and as they had no guide, I loaned them a wad. We would meet again in Outis tents. Then we moved forward over shallow valleys and cross ridges till the sun set behind the last high bank, from whose top we saw the square box of the station at Gadir el Hajj breaking artificially out of the level, miles and miles away. Lloyd and I marked the bearing of the railway, where we purposed to cross just below Shadia. As the stars rose, we agreed that we must march upon Orion. So we started and marched on Orion for hour after hour, with the fact that Orion seemed no nearer and there were no signs of anything between us and him. We had debouched from the ridges upon the plain, and the plain was never ending, and monotonously striped by shallow wadi beds with low, flat, straight banks, which in the milky starlight looked always like the earthwork of the expected railway. The going underfoot was firm, and the cool air of the desert in our faces made the camels swing out freely. Lloyd and I went in front to spy out the line, that the main body might not be involved if chance put us against a Turkish blockhouse or night patrol. Our fine camels, lightly ridden, set too long a stride, so that without knowing, we drew more and more ahead of the laden Indians. Hassan Shah, the Jemadar, threw out a man to keep us in sight, and then another, and after that a third, till his party was a hurrying string of connecting files. Then... He sent up an urgent whisper to go slowly, but the message which reached us, after its passage through three languages, was unintelligible. We halted, and so knew that the quiet night was full of sounds, while the scents of withering grass ebbed and flowed about us with the dying wind. Afterwards, we marched again more slowly, as it seemed for hours, and the plain was still barred with deceitful dikes which kept our attention at unprofitable stretch. We felt the stars were shifting and that we were steering wrong. Lloyd had a compass somewhere. We halted and groped in his deep saddlebags. Thorn rode up and found it. We stood around calculating on its luminous arrowhead and deserted Orion for a more auspicious northern star. Then, again interminably forward till, as we climbed a larger bank, Lloyd reined up with a gasp and pointed. Fair in our track on the horizon were two cubes blacker than the sky, and by them a pointed roof. We were bearing straight for Shadia Station, nearly into it. We swung to the right and jogged hastily across an open space, a little nervous lest some of the caravan strung out behind us should miss the abrupt change of course. But all was well, and a few minutes later in the next hollow, we exchanged our thrill in English and Turkish, Arabic and Urdu, Behind us broke out a faint, pulse-quickening clamor of dogs in the Turkish camp. We now knew our place and took a fresh bearing to avoid the first blockhouse below Shadia. We led off confidently, expecting in a little to cross the line. Yet again, time dragged and nothing showed itself. It was midnight. We had marched for six hours, and Lloyd began to speak bitterly of reaching Baghdad in the morning. There could be no railway here. Thorn saw a row of trees and saw them move. The bolts of our rifles clicked, but they were only trees. We gave up hope and rode carelessly, nodding in our saddles, letting our tired eyes lid themselves. Again, the Indians lagged far behind our hasty selves. But after an hour, the last bank of tonight loomed differently in front of us. It took straight shape and over its length grew darker patches, which might be the shadowed mouths of culverts. When we were nearer, the bank put up a fencing of sharp spikes along its edge. These were the telegraph poles. Quickly, we halted our party and rode to one side and then straight in, to challenge what lay behind the quiet of the place, 
expecting the darkness to spout fire at us suddenly and the silence to volley out in rifle shots. But there was no alarm. We reached the bank and found it deserted. We dismounted and ran up and down each way two hundred yards. Nobody. There was room for our passage. We ordered the others immediately over into the empty, friendly desert on the east and sat ourselves on the metals under the singing wires while the long line of shadowy bulks wavered up out of the dark, shuffled a little on the bank and its ballast, and passed down behind us into the dark in that strained noiselessness, which was a night march of camels. The last one crossed. Another hour, and we ordered a rest till dawn. Next day, we found Auda camped unobtrusively in the broken, bushy expanse southwest of the wells. He received us with constraint. His large tents, with the women, had been sent away beyond reach of the Turkish aeroplanes. There were few Toweha present, and those in violent dispute over the distribution of tribal wages. The old man was sad we should find him in such weakness. I did my best tactfully to smooth the troubles by giving their minds a new direction and countervailing interests. Successfully, too, for they smiled, which with Arabs was often half the battle. Enough advantage for the time. We adjourned to eat with Mohammed al Dilan. He was a better diplomat, because less open than Auda. So we were made very welcome to his platter of rice and meat and dried tomatoes. Mohammed, a villager at heart, fed too well. After the meal, as we were wandering back over the gray dry ditches, like mammoth wallows, which floods attack deeply into the fibrous mud, I broached to Zal my plans for an expedition to the Yarmouk bridges. He disliked the idea very much. Zal in October was not the Zal of August. Success was changing the hard-riding gallant of spring into a prudent man, whose new wealth made life precious to him. In the spring, he would have led me anywhere, but the last raid had tried his nerve, and now he said he would mount only if I made a personal point of it. I asked what party we could make up, and he named three of the men in the camp as good fellows for so desperate a hope. The rest of the tribe were away, dissatisfied. To take three to Weha would be worse than useless, for their just conceit would inflame the other men, while they themselves were too few to suffice alone. So I said I would try elsewhere. Za'al showed his relief. Lloyd was to go back from here to Versailles. It was a sorry thing. He was understanding, helped wisely, and wished our cause well. Also, he was the one fully taught man with us in Arabia, and in these few days together our minds had ranged abroad, discussing any book or thing in heaven or earth which crossed our fancy. When he left, we were given over again to war and tribes and camels without end. The night began with the surfeit of such work. The matter of the Howitat must be put right. After dark, we gathered round Auda's hearth, and for hours I was reaching out to this circle of firelit faces, playing on them with all the torturous arts I knew, now catching one, now another. It was easy to see the flash in their eyes when a word got home. Or again, taking a false line and wasting minutes of precious time without response. The Abu Taye were as hard-minded as they were hard-bodied, and the heat of conviction had burned out of them long since in stress of work. Gradually, I won my points, but the argument was yet marching near midnight, when Auda held up his stick and called silence. We listened, wondering what the danger was, and after a while we felt a creeping reverberation, a cadence of blows too dull, too wide, too slow easily to find response in our ears. It was like the mutter of a distant, very lowly thunderstorm. Outer raised his haggard eyes toward the west and said, The English guns. Allenby was leading off in preparation, and his helpful sounds closed my case for me beyond dispute. End of chapter 18